Talmud, Masyum A C H A P T E R I Mishnah seven days before the Day of Atonement the high priest was removed from his house to the cell of the counselors and another priest was prepared to take his place in case anything happened to him the high priest that would unfit him for the service are Judah said also another wife was prepared for him in case his wife should die for it is written and he shall make atonement for himself and for his house his house that means his wife they said to him. If so there would be no end to the matter Himar we learned elsewhere seven days before the burning of the red heifer the priest who was to burn the heifer was removed from his house to the cell in the northeastern corner before the byre it was called the cell of the stone chamber and why was it called the cell of the stone chamber because all its functions in connection with the red heifer had to be performed only in vessels made of either cobblestone stone or earthenware what was it? Reason for that restriction since a Tibullion was permitted to perform the ceremony of the heifer as we have learned they deliberately rendered the priest ritually impure to remove a false notion from the minds of the Sadducees who used to say only by those on whom the sun has set could it be performed the rabbis ordained that only vessels made of cobblestone stone or earthenware which are immune to impurity should be used in connection with the heifer lest the ceremony thereof be treated slightly why was the ceremony performed in the northeastern corner since the heifer was a sin offering and a sin offering had to be sacrificed in the northern corner whereas on the other hand it is written about the heifer towards the front of the tent of meeting the rabbis ordained for the heifer a cell in the northeastern corner so that the special importance of the ceremony be clearly recognized what is by Rabbi Barhana in the name of Aryohan and said there was a place on the temple mount called Bira Rush said the whole sanctuary is called Bira as it is written and to build the Bira for which I have made provision once is it proved that it is necessary to remove the priest from his house Arminium be Hilkiah in the name of Armasia Bed in the name of Aryohan and said the text reads as hath been done this day so the Lord hath commanded to do to make atonement for you the work law asset to do refers to the matter of the red heifer the words Lekaper Alkum to make atonement for you refer to the work of the day of atonement it is obvious that the whole of this text could not be taken as referring to the heifer because of the words to atone and the heifer has nothing to do with atonement but let us assume that the whole text refers to the day of atonement they said in answer to the suggestion one may infer from the fact that the identical expressions Iwa he commanded is used here it is written the Lord's Iwa commanded to do and there it is written this is the statute of the law which the Lord's Iwa has commanded just as in the latter passage Iwa refers to the heifer so does it in the former refer to the heifer and just as the removal of the priest is enjoined in the one so must the removal of the priest apply to the other Talmud, Mas Yumabi but perhaps say that the words Iwa he commanded has reference to the words Iwa which occurs in connection with the day of atonement since the verse Reads and he did as the Lord's Iwa commanded Moses one may infer from the words Iwa used before conformity for another case in which Iwa is used also before conformity but one may not infer Iwa is used before conformity for Iwa used after conformity perhaps Iwa has reference to sacrifices for it is written on the day when the Lord's Iwa commanded the children of Israel one may fitly infer Iwa from Iwa but one may not infer Iwa from Iwa but what does it matter did not the school of Arishmael teach that in the verse the priest shall return or the priest shall come in returning and coming in mean one and the same thing these words of the school of Arishmael apply only when there is no identical word but where such a similar word is used the inference may be made only on the basis of absolute identity of expression we stated above that the word like to atone has reference to the day of atonement may it not refer also to the Atonement resulting from a sacrifice how could we know which priest would happen to perform the sacrifice so that he would have to be removed from his house but why should we not really have to postulate such separation for the whole priestly division it is proper to make inference from something for which a definite time is appointed for something which similarly is fixed for a definite time that excludes any inference from the consecration of the priest an annual event to sacrifices which are offered up every day perhaps the references to the three festivals one may infer something which takes place but once a year from something else which took place but once a year but inference for these festivals is excluded since they do not take place but once a year perhaps the reference is to one festival and if you would answer by saying we would not know to which it has reference it would be either the festival of Passover which scripture always mentions as the First of the three or the feast of Sukkot, because a great number of commandments apply to it. The point is, however, that you may infer the law of the priest's removal from his house for seven days before the service which he is to perform on one day from another case in which the priest is removed also for seven days for the service of one day. But one may not fitly infer that a priest must be removed for seven days for the service of seven days from the fact that a law exists obliging the priest's removal for seven days for the service of one day. Yet perhaps the reference is to the eighth day because there would be a service of only one day. One may infer laws concerning a day which is not immediately preceded by another festival sanctity from another day which similarly is not preceded by other festival sanctity. But one may not infer for a day preceded by festival sanctity from a day unprecedented by such. But even if the inference by analogy be unjustified is. There no legitimate conclusion of an oriad majus is if a day unprecedented by another festival sanctity requires for the officiating priest a seven day removal from his family how much more should a day preceded by another festival sanctity require it or measure she answered scripture expressly states the day that means on a day like this or as she said could there be any festival the major part of which would require no removal of the priest while its attachment would require it and even according to the one who holds that the eighth day is not a mere attachment to Sukkot but an independent festival day that applies only to Talmud, Masyum of P-E-Z-R-K-S-H-B but in matters of complementing the sacrifice of the festival the eighth day is but a continuation of the first day as we have learned he who failed to offer up the festival sacrifice on the first day of the feast of Sukkot may do so during the entire festive season including the last day of the feast perhaps say. That the reference is to Pentecost because that would also mean removal of the priest for seven days preceding a one-day service. Our Abba said one may fitly infer a case in which one ox and one ram are offered from another case in which one ox and one ram are offered. This excludes however Pentecost on which two rams are to be sacrificed. This would be right according to the opinion that on the day of atonement only one ram is being offered up. But what could be said according to the view that on the day of atonement two two rams were to be offered up for it has been taught. Rabbi said the ram mentioned here in Leviticus is the same as the one mentioned in the book of Numbers. Our Elizer son of our Simeon said two rams are here involved. The one mentioned here and the other mentioned in the book of Numbers. It may be in accord even with the opinion of our Elizer son of our Simeon because there one of the rams is offered up in fulfillment of the regular sacrifices for that day and the other. As one of the additional sacrifices whereas in the case of Pentecost both are the regular sacrifices of that day perhaps say that the reference is to New Year which should also imply the removal of the priest for seven days preceding a one-day service Arabab said one may infer a case in which the priest offers up an ox and a ram from his own means from another case in which he offers up an ox and a ram from his own means that excludes Pentecost and Rosh Hashanah on which both are offered. Up from public congregational funds this would be right according to the opinion which holds that the words Kali take the mean take from thy own means and Talmud, Masyum of Eselika make the mean make from thy own means but what could be said in the argument above according to the opinion that Kali means take for thyself from the community funds for we have been taught the expression Kali means Mishalika from thy own and Eselika means Mishalika taken from thy own funds, but we Yakuilika means they shall take for them from community funds. These are the words of our Josiah. Our Jonathan said both Kalika and we Yakuilika mean from community funds. And what is intimated by saying Kalika take the as it were, I prefer your own private means expended on this work to the community's expenditure. Abba said in the name of our Eliezer, one verse reads, Make the an ark of wood and another, and they shall make an ark of acacia wood. How is that here? It refers to a time when Israel act in accordance with his will. There it deals with a time when they do not act in accordance with his will. They are disputing only as to the general meaning of the word Lika in connection with the command to take or to do as e.g. take thou also unto thee the chief spices or make thee two trumpets of silver. But in the above cases it is clearly indicated in the text that it is from thy own for considering the portion of the Bible dealing with the consecration. Of the priesthood is written and unto the children of Israel thou shal
Only Rabbana said one may infer a service performed by the high priest from another service performed by the high priest that excludes the occasions mentioned in all the questions raised because the services mentioned therein are not performed by the high priest. Others have this version of Rabbana's reply. One may infer certain rules for a service held for the first time from a service held for the first time. This excludes all the other cases referred to above because none of them took place for the first time. What does this first time mean? Does it mean that the high priest had first performed service there? That would be the argument of Rabbana's in the first version. No, it means the first service of its kind held in its place, which may fitly be inferred from another service held for the first time in its place. When Ardimi came from Palestine, he said, Are Yohanan taught one thing, Ar Joshua be Levi two, Ar Yohanan taught one thing, the words Law Asif like refer to the service. Of the Day of Atonement, our Joshua Belevi taught two things. La means the ceremony of the Red Heifer, like refers to the service of the Day of Atonement. How could you say that our Yohanan taught only one thing? Have we not learned in our mission seven days before the Day of Atonement and in another seven days before the burning of the Heifer that is only a special provision, but did not our Minyumi be in the name of our Masia Bed and the latter in the name of our Yohanan report? The interpretation of the text as hath been done this day, so hath the Lord commanded La to do like a to make atonement for you. La refers to the ceremony of the Heifer and like to the service of the Day of Atonement. This interpretation was that of his teacher, for when Rabbana came from Palestine, he said, Our Yohanan reported in the name of our Ishmael that La referred to the ceremony of the Heifer and like to the work of the Day of Atonement, said Reshlakish. To our Yohanan, whence do you infer this interpretation from the consecration service? Hence, just as with the consecration service, the omission of any prescribed form would render the service invalid, would you say that here too the omission of anything prescribed by inference from congruity of text for that service would render it invalid? And if you said yes, indeed, surely we learned another priest is prepared to take his place, not another priest is removed from his house. And if you would say, Mathkinen one prepares and Mafrishin one removes, mean the same thing, then the mission ought to use in both passages either Mathkinen or Mafrishin. Our Yohanan said to him, And whence do you, sir, infer it? He answered from the account concerning Sinai, for the scriptural text reads, And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered him six days, and he called unto Moses on the seventh day. Now consider, since it is written, and he called unto Moses on the seventh day, what do? The six days mean they establish a rule for anyone who enters the camp of the Shechinah that he must remove himself from his house for six days. But we have learned seven. Our mission conforms to the opinion of our Judah B. Bathera, who considers the possibility of the high priest's Talmud, Masyuma, becoming ritually impure through family contact. Our Yohanan said to Resh Lakish, it is right according to me who infer from the consecration for this agrees with what we are taught on both of them. It. Priests, we sprinkle throughout the seven days water from all the sin offerings that were there. But according to you who infer from Sinai, was there any sprinkling done on Sinai? But according to your own reasoning, it would not be right either. For in the consecration ceremony, the sprinkling was done with blood, whereas here with water, that is no difficulty for our high taught the water takes the place of blood. But according to you, was there any sprinkling on Sinai? He answered, it was a mere. Additional provision we have a teaching in accord with our Yohanan and we have a teaching in accord with Resh Lakish in accord with our Yohanan we have a teaching scripture reads here with Bazoth shall Aaron come into the holy place i.e. with that mentioned in that section the section of the consecration and what is mentioned in the section about the consecration Aaron was removed for seven days and then officiated for one day and Moses handed over to him throughout the seven days to train him in. This service also for the future the high priest is to be removed for seven days and to officiate for one day and two scholars of the disciples of Moses this excludes Sadducees transmitted to him throughout the seven days to train him in the service hence the rabbis ruled that seven days before the day of atonement the high priest was removed from his house to the cell of the counselors and just as the high priest was removed so was the priest burning the heifer removed to the cell lying. In the northeastern corner before the temple and each of them was throughout the seven days sprinkled with water from all the sin offerings that were there and if you should ask but during the consecration the sprinkling was done with blood and your water remember that the water takes the place of the blood and it further says as hath been done this day so the Lord hath commanded Laasith to do Lechaber to make atonement for you Laasith refers to the ceremony of the heifer Lechaber. Means the service of the day of atonement but the word Bezot is required for the verse itself i.e. with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering answer if Bezot were meant to refer only to the sacrifices the text should have said Beza with this or Beale with these why was Bezot chosen so that you may learn both things from it why was it necessary to cite the other verse you might have said only the first day of atonement requires that the high priest be removed at the consecration but on all future days of atonement no such removal is necessary or you might say only the first high priest needed such removal but all future high priests do not require it come and here as hath been done this day etc we have a teaching in accord with Resh Lakish Moses went up in a cloud was covered by the cloud and was sanctified by the cloud in order that he might receive the Torah for Israel in sanctity as it is written and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai this took place after the ten commandments which were at the beginning of the forty days this is the view of our Hosea the Galilean our Akiva said with reference to and the glory of the Lord abode from the beginning of the third month and the cloud W A K C who covered it i.e. the mountain Talmud Masyum then he called unto Moses on the seventh day Moses and all Israel were standing there but the purpose of scripture was to honor Moses our Nathan says the purpose of scripture was that he Moses might be purged of all food and drink in his bowels so as to make him equal to the ministering angels our Madiya Biharis says the purpose of scripture here was to inspire him with also that the Torah be given with all with dread with trembling as it is said serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling what is the meaning of and rejoice with trembling our Adabi Matina says in the name of Rab where there will be joy there shall be trembling in what do our Hosea the Galilean and our Akiva differ in the controversy of these ten names for we have been taught on the sixth day of the month was the Torah given to Israel our Hosea says on the seventh he who says that the Torah was given on the sixth day holds that on the sixth it was given and on the seventh Moses ascended the mountain he who holds that the Torah was given on the seventh assumes that on the seventh both the Torah was given and Moses ascended as it is written and he called unto Moses on the seventh day now our Jose the Galilean is of the same opinion as the first Tana who held that the Torah was given on the sixth of the month therefore this happened after the giving of the Ten Commandments the glory of the Lord abode on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered him six days and meaning Moses and he called unto Moses on the seventh day to receive the remainder of the Torah for if the thought should come to you that and the glory of the Lord abode from the new moon of seven so that and the cloud covered him referred to the mountain and the Lord called unto Moses on the seventh day to receive the Ten Commandments surely they had received the Torah on the sixth day already and also the cloud had departed on the sixth day our Akiva however held with our Jose that the Torah was given to Israel on the seventh quite in accord with our Akiva's teaching is the statement that the tablets were broken on the seventeenth of Tammuz for the twenty-four days of seven and the sixteen of Tammuz make up the forty Days he was on the mountain and on the seventeenth of Tammuz he went down and came to break the tablets but according to our Jose the Galilean who holds that there were six days of the separation in addition to forty days spent on the mountain the tablets could not have been broken before the twenty-third of Tammuz our Jose the Galilean will answer you the six days of the separation are included in the forty days on the mountain the master said and he called Moses whilst Moses and all Israel were standing there this interpretation supports the view of our Eliezer for our Eliezer said and he called unto Moses whilst Moses and all Israel were standing there the only purpose of scripture is to do honor to Moses they raised the following objection he heard the voice speaking law unto him not low to him hence we know that Moses heard but all Israel did not hear this is no difficulty the one passage speaks of Sinai the other of the tent of meeting or you might say the one statement refers to the call the other to the speech Arzerica asked a question concerning the contradiction of scriptural passages in the presence of our Eliezer or according to another version he asked the question in the name of our Eliezer one passage reads and Moses was
Any detail mentioned in connection with the priest's consecration renders the ceremony invalid for it was said with regard to the ceremony of consecration are Yohanan and Arhanan are disputing one says the omission of any form prescribed in connection with the ceremony renders it invalid whilst the other holds only such matter as is indispensable on any future occasion is indispensable now whereas such detail as is dispensable in future generations is dispensable even the first time one may conclude that it is our Yohanan who holds that the omission of any detail whatsoever that is mentioned in connection with the consecration ceremony renders such ceremony invalid because our Simeon Bilakish said to our Yohanan in the course of the argument and just as with the ceremony of consecration the omission of any prescribed detail renders the ceremony invalid and our Yohanan did not retort at all that proof is conclusive what is the practical difference between the opinions Talmud, Masuma. A.R. Joseph says the putting of the hands upon the head of the sacrifice is the difference according to the one who holds that the omission of any detail renders the ceremony invalid failure to lay the hand upon the head of the sacrifice would render the ceremony invalid according to him who holds that only the omission of what is indispensable in the future renders the ceremony invalid omission of the putting of the hand on the animal's head did not render the ceremony invalid once too. We know that in the future the omission of the putting of the hands on the animal's head is not indispensable for it has been taught and he shall lay his hand and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him does the laying on of the hand make atonement for one does not atonement come through the blood as it is said for it is the blood that make atonement by reason of the life why then is it written and he shall lay his hand on and it shall be accepted for him to make. Atonement for him to say that if he performed the laying on of the hands as an unimportant part of the commandment scripture would account it to him as if he had not obtained proper atonement. Arnam and B. Isaac said the waving is the difference according to him who holds whatever detail is prescribed for the ceremony is indispensable. The waving is indispensable according to him who holds that only what is indispensable for all the future is indispensable. Now the waving is not indispensable whence. Do we know that for all time to come the waving is not indispensable for we have been taught to be waved to make atonement for him? Does the waving make atonement? Is it not the blood which makes atonement as it is written for it is the blood that make atonement by reason of the life? Then why does scripture say to be waved to make atonement for him to say that if he treats the waving as an unimportant part of the ceremony scripture accounts it to him as if he had not obtained proper atonement? Our Papa said the separation for seven days is the practical difference between the two opinions according to the opinion that whatsoever is prescribed for the ceremony is indispensable the separation is indispensable according to him who holds that only what is indispensable for all time to come is indispensable now the separation is not indispensable once do we know that the separation is not indispensable for all time to come because the mission reads another priest is made ready for him instead of is separated for him Robin said the difference lies in the increase in the number of garments and of the anointments necessary during the seven days according to the opinion that whatever is prescribed in connection therewith is indispensable the increase in the number of garments and anointments during the seven days too is indispensable according to him who holds that only what is indispensable for all time to come is indispensable now these things too are not Indispensable whence do we know that they are not indispensable for all time to come for it was taught and the priest who shall be anointed and who shall be consecrated to be priest in his father's stead shall make the atonement what does the passage come to teach from the text seven days shall the son that is priest in his stead put them on etc I would know that a priest who had put on the required larger number of garments and who had been anointed on each of the seven days was permitted to minister in the holy place at the consecration whence would I know that if he had put on the larger number of garments for but one day and had been anointed on each of the seven days or if he had been anointed but one day but has put on the larger number of garments for seven days he would also be permitted to convey that teaching scripture says who shall be anointed and who shall be consecrated that means anointed and consecrated in whatever way we have now found evidence that the Larger number of garments is necessary in the first instance for the seven days whence do we know that anointment on each of the seven days is in the first instance required you may infer that either from the fact that a special statement of the Torah was necessary to exclude it or if you wish from the scriptural text itself and the holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them in this passage the anointing and the donning of it. Larger number of garments are put on the same level hence just as the donning of the larger number of garments is required for the seven days so is the anointing obligatory for the seven days what is the reason of the man who holds that the forms prescribed for the ceremonies are indispensable are Isaac Bebus said scripture reads and cock thus shalt thou do to Aaron and his sons thus means indispensable as you may be right with regard to any Talmud, Masyum be form prescribed in this. Context whence do we know that forms not prescribed here in this context are also indispensable Arnam and B. Isaac said we infer that from the fact that in both contexts the same word petah is used our measure said and keep the charge of the Lord indicates the indispensableness of the prescribed forms are as she said for so am I commanded indicates indispensableness our rabbis taught for so am I commanded as I commanded as the Lord commanded of these passages for so am I commanded that they eat it whilst in mourning as I commanded this he said to them at the time of the occurrence as the Lord commanded and not on my own authority our Jose B. Hanan said bridges are not mentioned in the section but when it says and this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them to minister it includes the bridges and the tenth part of an ephah it may rightly be said that bridges are included in the general term garments but whence do we know about the tenth of an ephah this we know by inferring the meaning of the words a used here from Zay in the verse say this is the offering of Aaron and his sons which they shall offer unto the Lord the tenth part of an ephah Yohanan in the name of our Simeon Bio he said whence do we know that also the reading of the portion was indispensable to teach us that it is said this is the dabar thing which the Lord has commanded to be done i.e. the speaking thereof is indispensable in what order did he put the garments on them what is past is past rather the question is in what order will he put the garments on them in the future in the future too when Aaron and his sons will come Moses will come with them but the question is how did he put the clothes on them if we are to understand the scriptural account the sons of our high and our Yohanan held different opinions about it one said Aaron was first clothed and afterwards his sons whilst the other said Aaron and his sons were clothed simultaneously said Abbe with regard to the tunic and the mitre none disputes the fact that Aaron came first and his sons afterwards for both in the text containing the command and the account of the actual performance Aaron is mentioned first what they are disputing is the order of the girdle he who says Aaron came first and then his sons is of this opinion because it is written and he girded him with the girdle and only after this is it written and he girded them with the girdle whereas he who holds that the girding took place without any interruption is of this opinion because it is written and thou shalt gird them with girdles Aaron and his sons according to the opinion that Aaron and his sons were girded at the same time does not scripture first say and he girded him with the girdle and then only later is it written and he girded them with the girdle Talmud Masuma he will tell you this is to teach you that the girdle of the high priest was not the same material as that of it. Average priest according to the opinion that Aaron was girded and afterwards his sons does not scripture say and thou shalt gird them with a girdle he will tell you this informs us that the girdle of the high priest was of the same material as the average priest was it then necessary to state and he girded him with a girdle and then and he girded them from that we infer that Aaron came first and then his sons but how could it have been possible simultaneously this only means to indicate that Aaron came first the high priest was removed why was he removed you ask why was he removed is it not as you have said either according to the derivation of our Yohanan or to that of Rush Lakish no this is the question why was he separated from his house it was taught our Jew to be but there is said let his wife be found under doubt of being a menstruant and he have congress with her do we speak of wicked people rather perhaps he will have congress with his wife and she will then be found to be doubtfully immense truant the rabbis were discussing the decision before our histah according to whom was it made obviously according to our akiba who said immense truant makes him who had congress with her impure retrospectively for according to the rabbis behold they say immense truant does not render impure him who had congress with her retrospectively our histah said to them it may be in accord even with the rabbis for they conflict with our akiba only in the case in which the blood stains are found much later than the congress but if they be found very soon afterwards they agree with him our said hence it is evident that to one who had congress with a menstruant
Raise all those who are obliged to take the ritual bath must take the bath at night a menstruant and a woman after confinement immersed during the day a menstruant then only but not one who had intercourse with her know it means a menstruant and all whom one may include in that term another objection was raised one to whom pollution has happened is like one who touched an unclean dead reptile one who had intercourse with a menstruating woman is like one who was made unclean through a corpse. Is it not concerning the bath? No, it is concerning the conditions of their uncleanness, but surely concerning their uncleanness there are direct statements in scripture. In the first case it is written that it lasts for seven days, and in the second case also the seven days duration is prescribed. Talmud, Masyuma B must one not hence assume that the comparison concerns their bath. No, indeed it refers only to the conditions of their uncleanness, and it was necessary to mention that only. Because of the latter clause of that mission of is that one who had intercourse with a menstruant is afflicted with a graver form of impurity than he who has become unclean through a corpse and that he causes uncleanness of couch and seat such uncleanness being of a lighter nature so as to affect only foods and liquids come and here for our high taught a man or a woman afflicted with gonorrhea or with leprosy one who had intercourse with a menstruant and one made unclean through a corpse may. Take the bath during the day a menstruant and a woman after confinement take their bath at night this is indeed a refutation now whilst removing him from the possible impurity due to his house remove him from the possibility of uncleanness through a corpse our talifa father of our said in the name of Rabbah this teaches that in the case of a community the law of corpse uncleanness is inoperative Rabbah said you might also say that the law of corpse uncleanness is only suspended in case of a community yet uncleanness due to contact with a corpse is infrequent whereas uncleanness due to marital life happens often it has been said as to the law of corpse uncleanness are and said it is inoperative in case of a community Arshis hate said it is only suspended in case of an entire community whenever there are in the same priestly family division men both clean and unclean ones nobody disputes the fact that the clean ones do the service and the unclean ones forego with it. Dispute concerns only the question as to whether one is obliged to make an endeavor to obtain clean ones from another family division. Arnam and said the law of corpse uncleanness is inoperative in case of a community, hence we need make no such effort. Arshis hate says that law is only suspended in case of a community, and hence we must endeavor to find clean priests for the service. Some hold that even in a case in which there are both clean and unclean priests in the same family division, are. Nam insists that even the unclean ones may officiate Talmud, Masyuma, because the Torah has rendered all of it equal impurity caused through a corpse inoperative in case of a community. Arshis hate said once do I know that because it has been taught if the priest was standing and offering up the sheaf of the Omer and it became unclean in his hands, let him tell and another one is brought in its place, and if there be none but this one would say to him, be clever and keep quiet at all events he. Teaches he should tell about it and another one is brought in its place Arnam and said I admit that where there is a remnant to be eaten one would have to make an effort to procure a substitute sacrifice another objection was raised if he was offering up the meal offering of the bullocks or rams or sheep and it became unclean in his hand he should say so and one brings another one in its place but if there be none available but the first one tells him be wise and keep quiet does this not refer to the bullocks rams and sheep offered up on the feast of Sukkot Arnam and when answer you know the word bullock refers to the bullock offered up in expiation of idolatry and although it is a community sacrifice since there is no definite time fixed for it one endeavors to find a substitute offering the word rams refers to the ram of Aaron and although it is appointed to be sacrificed at a definite time yet since it is the offering of an individual one endeavors to procure a Substitute the word lambs refers to the lamb offered up together with the omer sheaf of which there are remnants to be eaten. Another objection was raised if sacrificial blood became unclean and one sprinkled it if by mistake it is accepted if willfully it is not accepted. This teaching refers to the sacrifice of an individual come and here for what mistake at sacrifice does the priest's plate effect pardon concerning blood flesh fat which become unclean whether by mistake or willfully. Whether by accident or voluntarily whether the sacrifice was offered up by an individual or by the entire community now if it enter your mind that the law of uncleanness is an operative in case of a community what need is there for the priest's plate to effect pardon Arnaman will answer you what has been taught about the plate's affecting pardon refers only to the sacrifice of an individual or if you like one might say it refers also to such community sacrifices for which no definite time. Has been said another objection was raised touching on an Aaron shall bear the iniquity committed in the holy things does he bear any kind of iniquity if you mean the iniquity of pickle a sacrifice rejectable because of the intended disposal beyond the legal limits of space concerning the scripture has said already it will not be accepted if you mean the iniquity of nuthar concerning that scripture has said already it shall not be imputed Talmud, Masyuma B is it not hence that there is no iniquity which he bears except that concerning love eichel uncleanness which has been declared inoperative in its general rule whenever a community sacrifice is involved and the difficulty remains for Arshis hate concerning this matter the ten aim differ for it has been taught the front plate affects pardon whether it be on the high priest's forehead or not these are the words of our Simeon Arjuna said as long as it is on his forehead it affects pardon if it is not on his forehead it does not. Effect pardon our Simeon said to him the case of the high priest on the day of atonement proves your contention wrong for the plate is then not on his forehead and yet it affects pardon our Judah answered him leave the case of the high priest on the day of atonement alone for to him because the community is concerned the law of uncleanness has been rendered inoperative hence it is to be inferred that according to our Simeon the law of uncleanness is only suspended in case of a community of a said if the front plate was broken there is no conflicting opinion all agreeing that it affects no pardon the dispute concerns only the case when it is hung up on a peg our Judah holding and it shall be upon the forehead of Aaron and he shall bear whilst our Simeon bases his opinion on and it shall be continually upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord now what does continually mean shall I say that it shall indeed be continually on his forehead how is that possible must he not enter the privy occasionally must he not sleep at times rather must it all imply that the front plate continually affects pardon according to our Judah does not scripture say continually that word implies that he should never dismiss it from his mind this is in agreement with Rabbi son of Hunaf for Rabbi son of Hunaf said a man is obliged to touch his tefillin every hour this may be learned by inference ad mages from the front plate Talmud, Masyuma if touching the front plate on which the mention of God is but inscribed once the Torah prescribes and it shall be continually upon his forehead i.e. he shall not dismiss it from his mind how much more does this apply to the tefillin which contain the mention of God many a time but according to our Simeon who says the front plate affects pardon always does not scripture intimate in the passage on the forehead of Aaron and he shall bear that the affecting of pardon depends on his bearing the plate know that passage merely Serves to indicate the place of the plate. Once does Arjuna know that there is a definite place prescribed for the front plate? He infers that from on his forehead. Why should not Arsimian infer it from the passage? To indeed he does. Then how does he interpret on the forehead of Aaron? And he shall bear. He will tell you it means to say that whatsoever is fit to rest on the forehead can affect pardon. Whatsoever is not fit to rest on the forehead cannot affect it. This excludes a broken plate, which indeed cannot affect the pardon. Once now does Arjuna infer the law concerning a broken plate? He derives it from the fact that instead of the forehead, the text has his forehead. Arsimian, however, does not attach any significance to the words of forehead and his forehead are the above tanaim disputing the principle of the following tanaim. For it has been taught on both of them throughout the seven days they would sprinkle from all the sin offerings that were there. These are the Words of Armelier Arhose said they sprinkled him only on the third and seventh days. Arhana the deputy high priest said the priest that was to burn the red heifer they sprinkled on each of the seven days, but the high priest that was to officiate on the day of atonement was sprinkled only on the third and seventh days. Is it not that their difference rests on this principle? Armelier holds a law concerning ritual uncleanness to be only suspended in the case of community, whilst Arhose considers it inoperative in that case. But how can you understand the case of a community if Arhose holds that the law concerning ritual uncleanness is inoperative in case of a community? Why is any sprinkling necessary? Rather, you must assume that all agree that these ten aim hold that law to be only suspended in case of a community. And the
for a ritual immersion to be taken in its proper time and their dispute above concerns the following principle our mayor is of the opinion that we compare the law concerning sprinkling to that concerning the immersion and our Jose holds we do not compare sprinkling to immersion what about our hand of the deputy high priest if he compares sprinkling to immersion the high priest on the day of atonement too should be sprinkled on every day and if he does not compare sprinkling to immersion it Priest who burns the heifer should neither be sprinkled on every day. In truth, he does not make that comparison. The enactment touching the priest who burns the heifer being a mere special stringency, according to whose opinion is the following teaching: there is no difference between the priest who burns the heifer and the high priest on the day of atonement, except Talmud, Masyuma, be that the latter is removed for the purpose of sanctity, and his fellow priests were permitted to touch him, whilst the former is removed for purposes of ritual, and his colleagues forbidden to touch him. According to whom is this teaching? According to the opinion either of our Mayor or of our Jose. For if it were in accord with the opinion of our Hanan, deputy high priest, there would be one more point of difference. Our Jose, the son of our Hanan, demurred to this: it is quite right that we sprinkle him on the first day because that may be the third of his impurity. Similarly, on the second because that may be the Third day of his impurity on the third because that may be the third day of his impurity on the fifth because that may be the seventh day of his impurity on the sixth because that may be the seventh day of his impurity on the seventh because that may be the seventh day of his impurity but on the fourth day why should there be any sprinkling at all that day could not be in doubt as being either the third day or the seventh day of his impurity but according to your own point of view how can there be sprinkling throughout the seven days for have we not an established rule that the sprinkling is forbidden as Shabbat and as such cannot override the Sabbath but you must and need say seven days with the exception of the Sabbath similarly here seven with the exception of the fourth day were beset for that reason since the matter of the high priest on the day of atonement does not depend on us but on the fixing of the calendar he ought to be separated on the third of Tishri and on Whatever day the third of Tishri falls, we would remove him. But as to the priest who burns the heifer, since the matter depends on us, we should remove him on the fourth of the week, so that his fourth day would fall on the Sabbath to the cell of the counselors, etc. Our Judah said, Was it the cell of the Parhedron counselors? Was it not rather the cell of the Bulut senators? Originally, indeed, it was called the cell of the Bulut, but because money was being paid for the purpose of obtaining the position of high priest, and the high priests were changed every twelve months, like those counselors who are changed every twelve months, therefore it came to be called the cell of the counselors. We learned elsewhere upon the bakers, the sages imposed only the duty of setting apart enough for the heave offering of tithe and halal. Now it is quite right that they did not impose the great heave offering because it has been taught Talmud, Masyuma, because he sent into all the districts of Israel and he found that they were separating only the great heave offering it is also right that the sages did not impose upon these bakers the first tithe and the poor man's tithe because of the principle that the claimant must produce evidence but the second tithe let then the baker separate take it up to Jerusalem and eat it there said because these parhedron were beating them all the twelve months and telling them sell sheep sell sheep the sages did not burden them to set apart the second tithe and take it up to Jerusalem what does parhedron mean praise managers Rabbi Barhana said what is the meaning of the passage the fear of the Lord prolongeth days but the years of the wicked shall be shortened the fear of the Lord prolongeth days refers to the first sanctuary which remained standing for four hundred and ten years and in which there served only eighteen high priests but the years of the wicked shall be shortened refers to the second sanctuary which abided for four hundred and twenty years and at which more than three hundred high priests served take off there from the forty years which Simeon the righteous served eighty years which Yohanan the high priest served ten which Ishmael Bifabi served or as some say the eleven years of our Eliezer Bihar some count the number of high priests from then on and you will find that none of them completed his year in office or Yohanan B. Torda said why was Shiloh destroyed because of two evil things that prevailed their immorality and contemptuous treatment of sanctified objects proof that immorality prevailed because it is written now Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons did unto Israel and how that they lay with the women that did service at the door of the tent of meeting notwithstanding our Samuel B. Namani who said in the name of our Yohanan whosoever says the sons of Eli sinned is but mistaken it is Talmud, Masyuma be because they delayed offering up their sacrificial birds. Scripture accounts it to them as if they had lain with them. The sacred offerings were treated contemptuously as it is written. Yet before the fat was made to smoke, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if the man said unto him, Let the fat be made to smoke first of all, and then take as much as thy soul desired, then he would say, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. And the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men dealt contemptuously with the offering of the Lord. Why was the first sanctuary destroyed? Because of three evil things which prevailed there idolatry, immorality, bloodshed, idolatry, as it is written, For the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself, and the covering too narrow when he gathereth himself up. What is the meaning of for the bed is too short for a man to stretch himself? Or Jonathan said it is. This bed is too short for two neighbors to stretch themselves, and what is the meaning of the covering too narrow when he gathereth himself up? Our Samuel B. Namani said when our Jonathan in his reading came to this passage, he would cry and say to him, Concerning whom it is written, he gathereth the waters of the sea together like a heap, the cover became too narrow, immorality prevailed, as it is written, moreover the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched. Forth next and wanton eyes walking and mincing as they go and make a tinkling with their feet, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, i.e., they used to walk with proud carriage and wanton eyes, i.e., they filled their eyes with coal walking and mincing as they go, i.e., they used to walk with the heel touching the toe and make a tinkling with their feet, our Isaac said they would take myrrh and balsam and place it in their shoes, and when they came near the young men of Israel, they would kick causing it. Balsam to squirt at them and would thus cause the evil desire to enter them like an adder's poison bloodshed prevailed as it is written moreover Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another they were wicked but they placed their trust in the Holy One blessed be he for it is written the heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money yet will they lean upon the Lord and say is not it. Lord in the midst of us no evil shall come upon us therefore the Holy One blessed be he brought them three evil decrees as against the three evils which were their own therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest but why was the second sanctuary destroyed seeing that in its time they were occupying themselves with Torah observance of precepts and the practice of charity because therein Prevailed hatred without cause that teaches you that groundless hatred is considered as of even gravity with the three sins of idolatry, immorality, and bloodshed together, and during the time of the first sanctuary did no groundless hatred prevail. Surely it is written they are thrust down to the sword with my people smite therefore upon my thigh, and our Eliezer said this refers to people who eat and drink together and then thrust each other through with the daggers of their tongue. That passage speaks of the princes in Israel, for it is written, Cry and wail, son of man, for it is upon my people, etc. The text reads, Cry and wail, son of man, one might have assumed it is upon all Israel, therefore it goes on upon all the princes of Israel, our Yohanan and our Eliezer both say the former ones whose iniquity was revealed had their end revealed, the latter ones whose iniquity was not revealed had their end still unrevealed, our Yohanan said the fingernail of the earlier generations is better than. The whole body of the later generation said Rush Lakish to him on the contrary the latter generations are better although they are oppressed by the governments they are occupying themselves with the Torah. Here Yohanan replied the sanctuary will prove my point for it came back to the former generations but not to the latter ones the question was put to our Eliezer were the earlier generations better or the later ones he answered look upon the sanctuary some say he answered the sanctuary is your witness in this matter Rush Lakish was swimming in the Jordan thereupon Rabbi Barhana came and gave him the hand said Rush Lakish to him by God I hate you for it is written if she be a wall we will build upon her a turret of silver if she be a door we will enclose her with boards of cedar had you
Shem that means Talmud, Masyuma, although God has enlarged Japheth, the divine presence rests only in the tents of Shem. Whence do we know that the Persians are derived from Japheth because it is written the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Jabin and Tubal and Meshech and Tiras, Gomer, i.e. Germania, Magog, i.e. Kandia, Madai, i.e. Macedonia, Jabin in its literal sense, Tubal, i.e. Bethlehem, i.e. Meshech, i.e. Mizia, Its identification is a matter of dispute between Arsimai and the rabbis or According to another report between our Simon and the rabbis, one holding that it is to be identified with Beth Tiriaka and the other authorities declaring it is Persia, our Joseph learned Tiras is Persia, Sapta and Rama and Sapta are Joseph learned, i.e. the inner Saki stand and the outer Saki stand between the two. There is a distance of 100 parsangs and its circumference 1000 parsangs, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kelna in the land of Shinar. Babel in its usual sense, Erech, i.e. Yurikath, Akkad, i.e. Baskar, Kelna, i.e. Nuparnin, the out of bed land went Ashur, our Joseph learned Ashur, i.e. Silo can build in Nineveh and Rehoboth, i.e. and Kala Nineveh in its usual sense, Rehoboth, i.e. Barath of Meshan, Kala, i.e. Barath, divorce of and reason between Nineveh and Kala, the same is the great city, reason, i.e. Decipher, the same is the great city from here, I do not know yet whether by the great city Nineveh or reason is meant, but as scripture says now Nineveh. Was an exceeding great city unto God of three days journey say that by the great city Nineveh is meant and Agam and Sheshai and Talmud the children of Anak were there attended taught Agam and i.e. the most skillful of the brethren Sheshai i.e. he made the ground he stepped on like pits Talmud i.e. made the ground full of ridges another comment Agam and built in at Sheshai built Alish Talmud built all bush they were called the children of Anak because they lorded over the sun by reason of their height. Our Joshua be Levi in the name of Rabbi said Rome is designed to fall into the hand of Persia as it was said therefore hear ye the counsel of the Lord that he hath taken against Edom and his purposes that he hath purposed against the inhabitants of Taman surely the least of the flock shall drag them away surely their habitation shall be appalled to them Rabbi be to this what intimation is there that the last of the flock refers to Persia presumably because scripture reads the ram. Which thou sawest having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia, but say perhaps it is Greece, for it is written, and the rough he goat is the king of Greece. When our Habibi Sir Maki came up, he reported this interpretation before a certain scholar. The latter said, One who does not understand the meaning of the passage asks a question against Rabbi, what does indeed the least of the flock mean, the youngest of his brethren? For our Joseph learned that Tiras is Persia, Rabbi Barhana, in the name of Aryohanan, on the authority of our Judah, Bila, I said, Rome is designed to fall into the hands of Persia, that may be concluded by inference of Minori Ad Majus. If in the case of the first sanctuary which the sons of Shem Solomon built and the Chaldeans destroyed, the Chaldeans fell into the hands of the Persians, then how much more should this be so with the second sanctuary which the Persians built and the Romans destroyed, that the Romans should fall into the hands of the Persians, Rab said. Persia will fall into the hands of Rome thereupon Arkahana and R.C. asked of Rab shall the builders fall into the hands of the destroyers he said to them yes it is a decree of the king others say he replied to them they too are guilty for they destroyed the synagogues it has also been taught in accord with the above Persia will fall into the hands of Rome first because they destroyed the synagogues and then because it is the king's decree that the builders fall into the hands of it. Destroyers Rab also said the son of David will not come until the wicked kingdom of Rome will have spread its sway over the whole world for nine months as it is said therefore will he give them up until the time that she who traveleth hath brought forth and the residue of his brethren shall return with the children of Israel our rabbis taught all the cells in the sanctuary were without a mezuzah with the exception of the cell of the counselors for therein there was a residence for the high. Priest Arjuna said were there not a number of cells in the sanctuary which had a compartment for a dwelling yet had no mezuzah rather the reason for the mezuzah on the cell of the counselors was due to a preventive measure what was the reason for Arjuna's statement Rabbi said Arjuna is of the opinion any house which is not made to serve both as a summer home and a winter home is not a house Abbe raised an objection but it is written and I will smite the winter house with the summer house he answered they are called summer house or winter house but not by the general name house Abbe raised the following objection the sukkah used at the feast of tabernacles according to Arjuna renders the fruit brought during the feast liable to tithe whereas the sage is exempted from such duty and it has been learned in connection with it Arjuna considers a sukkah liable to Arab a mezuzah to tithe and if you should say he considers it liable to these duties only on rabbinic Enactment that could apply to Arab and Mezuzah, but as regards tithe, can one say that it is but a rabbinic enactment? Should we not fear Talmud, Masyuma, be that he may come to set aside tithe from where it is obligatory, for where it is exempt, and from where it is exempt, for where it is obligatory? Rather, said Abbe, there is no dispute concerning the seven days of the separation, all agreeing that the cell is liable to have a Mezuzah. What the dispute is concerned with is the other days of the year. The rabbis would institute it as a precautionary measure on account of the seven days, whilst Arjuna does not see the need for such a measure. Rabbi said to him, but the teaching of the Mishnah reads the Sukkah of the feast during the feast. Therefore, says Rabbi, on all other days of the year, they all agree that there is no obligation for a Mezuzah at the Sukkah and cell. The dispute touches only the seven days, and there is a special ground in the case of the Sukkah, and there is a special. Reason in the case of the cell, there is a special reason in the case of the Sukkah Arjuna holding in accordance with his own principle that the Sukkah must have the character of a permanent residence, hence considers the Sukkah is liable to a mezuzah, whilst the rabbis following their own principle hold that the Sukkah must have the character of an incidental residence and hence requires no mezuzah. There is also a special reason for the dispute in the case of the cell of the counselors. The rabbis hold that a dwelling not freely chosen is called a dwelling, whilst Arjuna is of the opinion that such dwelling is not included in the term dwelling only rabbinically. It was arranged that a mezuzah be affixed at the cell, lest the people say the high priest is being kept in prison who has taught the following which our rabbis have taught Talmud, Masyuma, all the gates that were there had no mezuzah with the exception of the gate of Nikonor within which the cell of the counselors was. Situated apparently this teaching is in agreement with the rabbis and not with Arjuna for if it were to be Arjuna's opinion surely he holds that the mezuzah at the cell itself is only a rabbinical enactment shall we enact a preventive measure to guard another preventive measure you might even say it is in accord with Arjuna they are not two separate enactments rather the whole is but one measure our rabbis taught and upon the gates alike upon the gates of houses upon the gates of courts upon the gates of provinces upon the gates of cities rests the dutiful obligation to the omnipresent as it is said upon the doorposts of thy house and upon the gates said Abbe to our Safra why did the rabbis not affix a mezuzah on the city gateways of Mahosa he answered they serve only as supports for the fort of turrets of that city but the fort of turrets itself should have a mezuzah for it contains a residence compartment for the keeper of the prison for it has been taught a Synagogue which contains a dwelling place for the synagogue attendant must have a mezuzah rather said Abbe it is due to a fear of danger for it has been taught the mezuzah of an individual's house should be examined twice every seven years and a public buildings twice every fifty years it happened to an artaban who was examining mezuzah in the upper market of Sephoris that Aquatista found him and took from him a thousand zoos but our Eliezer said messengers engaged in a mezuzah do not come. To harm where danger is to be expected it is different for it is written and Samuel said how can I go if Saul hear it he will kill me and the Lord said take a heifer with thee and say I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord Arkahana resided before Rab Judah the straw magazine the stable the witchet and the storehouse are exempt from the mezuzah because the women make use of them what does they make use of them mean they bathe therein Rab Judah said to him the reason for the exemption is that they bathe therein, but had they been restricted to their ordinary use, these places are liable to a mezuzah. But has it not been taught that an ox stable is exempt from a mezuzah? Rather, we must say that they make use of them, means they adorn themselves therein, and this is what it teaches. Although the women adorn themselves therein, they are exempt from
Therefore he lets us know that even private bathhouses are exempt. Rab Judah explains it in accord with his view. This is how it is taught. Thy house means a house appointed for thee that excludes the straw magazine, ox stable, woodshed, and storehouse as exempt from mezuzah. Even though women adorn themselves therein, some consider houses wherein the women adorn themselves obliged to have a mezuzah, but when restricted to their ordinary use, all agree that they are exempt. In truth, they said that. Privy the tannery, the private or public bathhouse, even though the women adorn themselves therein, are exempt from mezuzah because they contain a great deal of uncleanness. But would according to Rab Judah, all agree that these places, when restricted to their ordinary use, are exempt. Surely it has been taught in your gates that implies alike the gates of houses of courts of provinces of cities, cattle shed, ten roosts shed for straw storehouse for wine storehouse for oil. They all are liable to it. Mazuza one might assume this includes also Talmud, Mas Yuma be the porters, Laja Branda and the balcony therefore the text reads house meaning just as house means a building appointed for a dwelling it thus excludes all other buildings not appointed for a dwelling one might have wanted to include also the privy the tannery the bathhouse and the house for ritual immersion therefore the text says house just as a house is made for dignity so only all such are implied which also are made. For dignity to the exclusion of these which are not made for dignity one might have wanted to include the mountain of the sanctuary the cells and the courts therefore the text says house just as a house is for common use so are only such houses as are for common use liable to a mezuzah to the exclusion of these which are sacred this is a refutation our Samuel son of Rab Judah resided before Rabbah six gates are exempt from the mezuzah the gates of the straw shed the stable the wood house. The storehouse, the median gate, a gate without beams, and a gate that is not ten hand breadth high. He Rabbah said to him, You started by saying six, and you ended up with seven. He replied, There is tenetic division of opinion concerning the median gate, for it has been taught an arched doorway. Our mayor declares it liable to the mezuzah, while the sages exempted all agree. However, that if the posts are ten hand breadth high, it is liable to the mezuzah. Said Abbe, all agree that if the whole doorway is ten hand breadths in height, but the post is not even three, it is considered nothing. Again, if the post is three hand breadths in height, but the whole doorway not even ten, it is also considered nothing. They are disputing only concerning doorways, the whole height of which is ten, with the post three in height, but with a width less than four hand breadth space. However, being left to extend it to four hand breadths, our mayor holds one may extend it by digging to the required minimum of four. And breadths, whilst the sages hold that we do not extend it by digging it, our rabbis taught the synagogue, the women's apartment, and the house belonging to partners are liable to mezuzah. Is that not self evident? You might have said the scriptural thy house means her, but not the woman's house, thy house, but not their partner's house. Hence, we are taught that they are included in the law of mezuzah. But would you expound similarly that your days may be multiplied and the days of your sons do only their sons need life, not the others, women and their daughters? What then is the significance of thy house? It is as Rabbah said, for Rabbah said, the way thou enterest thy house, and when a man moves, he moves with the right foot first. Another buried the taught the synagogue, the house belonging to partners, and the women's compartment are subject to uncleanness from house places. Is that not self evident? You might have said, then shall come he who has the house to him, to him implies. But not to her woman to him, but not to them partners. Therefore, we are told that this is not so. Perhaps it is really so. Scripture says in the house of the land of your possession, which includes both wife and to him, that means to say that if one devotes his house to himself, exclusively refusing to lend his belongings by pretending he did not own them, the holy one blessed be he exposes him as he removes his belongings, thus to him excludes from the infliction of the house plague him who lends his belongings to others, but is a synagogue subject to uncleanness from house plagues. Has it not been taught? One might assume that synagogues and houses of learning are subject to uncleanness from house plagues. Therefore, Scripture says he who has the house to him, i.e., he to whom alone the house belongs, that excludes those houses which do not belong to him alone. This is no difficulty. The first teaching is in accord with our mayor, the second with rabbi, for it has been taught a synagogue which Contains a dwelling for the synagogue attendant is liable to a mezuzah, but one which has no dwelling apartment, our mayor declares it liable, but the sage is exempted, or if you wish you might say both teachings are in accord with the rabbis. In the one case the synagogue referred to has a dwelling apartment, in the other it has no dwelling apartment, or if you wish you might say in accounting for the discrepancy that in both cases the synagogue has no dwelling apartment, Talmud, Masyum of it. First teaching referring to big cities, the second to villages, but are synagogues in big cities really not subject to uncleanness from house plagues? Has it not been taught in the house of the land of your possession? I.e., the house of the land of your possession could become defiled through leprosy, but Jerusalem could not become defiled through leprosy. Our Judah said, I have heard that only the place of the sanctuary is unaffected by the law of leprosy. Now does not that imply that synagogues and Houses of learning are subject to the law of leprosy even though they be in large cities. Read our Judah said I have heard that only sacred places are not subject to the law of leprosy. What principle are they disputing? The first Tana holds Jerusalem was not divided amongst the tribes and our Judah holds Jerusalem was divided among the tribes. The basis of their difference being the principle on which these Tanaim differ for it has been taught what lay in the lot of Judah the temple mounted. Sells the courts and what lay in the lot of Benjamin the hall the temple and the holy of holies and a strip of land went forth from Judah's lot and went into Benjamin's territory and on this the temple was built. Benjamin the righteous was longing to swallow it every day as it is written he coveted him all day therefore he obtained the privilege of becoming the host of the omnipotent as it is said and he dwelt between his shoulders the following Tana holds that Jerusalem was not divided. Amongst the tribes for it has been taught one does not rent houses in Jerusalem because if the city does not belong to them the inhabitants are Eliezer son of Arzadok said nor any beds therefore the innkeepers take the skin of the sacrificial animals by force Abbe said we may learn from this that it is usual for a man to leave to his host the empty wine pitcher and the hide but are the synagogues of the villages subject to the laws of leprosy has it not been taught as a possession i.e. until they conquer it if they have conquered but not yet divided it among the tribes or even divided it among the tribes but not divided it among the families or even divided it among the families but before each man knows where his lot is whence do we know that the laws of leprosy do not apply yet to teach us that scripture says then he who has the house to him i.e. to whom alone the house is belonging excluding these houses which do not belong to him the owner alone it is more correct as we have answered at first and another priest is prepared for him it is obvious that if any disqualifying mishap occurred to the high priest before the morning daily offering that one initiates the other priest with the morning burnt offering but if the mishap should have occurred after the morning sacrifice how could he be initiated our Abbe Ahabah said with the girdle that will be in accord with him who holds that the girdle of the high priest is identical with that of the common priest but according to the opinion that the girdle of the high priest was not the same as that of the common priest what can be said Abbe said he would put on the eight garments and turn with the hook in accordance with what Arhuna said for Arhuna said if a non-priest turns with the hook he incurs penalty of death our Papa said Talmud Masyuma be his service initiates him has it not been taught all the vessels which Moses made became sanctified through being anointed from then on they become sanctified through being used at a service similarly here his service initiates and when Ardimi came from Palestine he reported concerning the girdle of the common priest there is a dispute between Rabbi and our Eliezer B. Simeon one said it was of Kilaim wool and linen in the same web the other said it was of fine linen it may be ascertained that it was Rabbi who said the girdle was made of Kilaim for it has been taught there is no difference between the high priest and the common priest except in the girdle this is the opinion of Rabbi our Eliezer B. R. Simeon said not even in the girdle is there any distinction of what time does this teaching speak if during the rest of the year there are many points of difference as e.g. the high priest officiates in eight garments the common priest in four you must say then that the time discussed is the day of atonement we can tell you in fact the discussion deals with the other days of the year and it refers to such garments which both wear alike. The only difference being the girdle when Rabin came from Palestine he reported everybody agrees that the girdle of the high priest on the day of atonement was made of fine linen and during the rest of the year of Kilaim the discussion concerned only the common priest's girdle both on the day of
Be either common priest or high priest, he cannot be high priest for the sake of preventing ill feeling, nor can he any more be a common priest, for we may promote in a matter of sanctity, but not the great rabbi B. Barhana said in the name of our Yohan and Talmud. Mas Yuma the Halachah is in accord with our Jose, but our Jose admits that if the substitute high priest transgressed that injunction and officiated his service, his valid Rabbi Judah said in the name of Rabbi the Halachah is in accord with our Jose, but our Jose admits that if the first high priest dies, the second the substitute returns to his service, is that not self evident? You might have said this would involve for him a rivalry in his lifetime, hence he informs us that this is not so. Our Judah says one provides for him also another wife, but the rabbis too are considering a possibility. The rabbis will tell you Levitical impurity is frequent, death is infrequent, they said to him, if so, there is no end to the matter, they gave a good. Answer to Arjuna what then about Arjuna he will tell you one may consider the possibility of one death but one would not go so far as to consider the possibility of two successive wives deaths and the rabbis they hold that if enactment on the basis of consideration of the possibility of death is justified such possibility should be considered to include also two but the rabbis ought to apply that consideration to themselves the rabbis will answer you the high priest is careful if he be careful why was another priest prepared to take his place in case of accidental impurity since he make the latter his rival he will be all the more careful but is this arrangement sufficient the divine law said his house and that substitute wife is not his house he betrothed her unto himself but still as long as he does not marry her she is not his house he marries her but then he has two houses and the divine law said and make atonement for himself and for his house but not for two houses he divorces her again if he divorces her our question reverts to its place no the provision applies to the case that he divorces her on condition namely he says to her behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid in case thou east but perhaps she dies and he will have two houses rather the case is that he says to her behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid if thou east if she does not die then she is divorced and if she does die there is still the other one alive but perhaps she will not die so that her letter of divorce is valid and the other the first one die and he will stay without a house say rather he says to her behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid if one of you die so that if the one dies there is still the other one alive and if the other one dies there is still this one alive but perhaps neither of them will die and he will have two houses furthermore on such a condition if the divorce is really not valid has not robbed Said if he said behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid if thou drinkest no wine all the days of my life and thy life it is not valid but if he said all the days of the life of so and so then it is valid rather say that he said to her behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid if thy fellow wife does not die if her fellow does not die she the second wife is divorced and if she does die then there is still the other the second wife alive to be his house but perhaps her fellow wife will die in the middle of the service and it will become Talmud. Mas Yuma be retrospectively revealed that the letter of divorce of the other one was not valid and he would then have been officiating at the service with two houses rather assume then that he says to her behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid if thy fellow dies but perhaps the fellow wife will die and the letter of divorce of the first wife will be valid and he will stand there without a house rather say. That we speak of the case that he divorced them both to the one he said behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid in case thy fellow wife does not die and to the other one he said behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid if thou dost not enter the synagogue but perhaps her fellow will not die and she will not enter the synagogue and the letter of divorce of both will be valid and he will stand without a house rather to the one he says behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid in case thy fellow does not die and to the other one behold this thy letter of divorce to be valid if I enter the synagogue so that if the one die the second be available and if the second die the first be available what will you say in the case that her fellow wife dies in the midst of the service and retrospectively he will have officiated at the service with two houses if he saw that she was about to die he would at once enter the synagogue and would render the divorce retroactively. Valid R.C. or as some say are already demurred to this consequently if this be so two widows of one brother should not be married by the brother-in-law scripture repeats his sister-in-law twice to intimate that even in the case of two sisters-in-law the law of Levi rate marriage applies but then a woman betrothed should not be married to her lover by emphasizing abroad the betrothed woman is meant to be included or rabbis taught the high priest may offer up a sacrifice as a mourner but may not eat thereof Arjuna said throughout the day what does throughout the day signify said rabbi it means to indicate that he should be brought from his house Abbe said to him but now according to Arjuna we even remove him from the sanctuary for it has been taught if he was standing and offering up a sacrifice on the altar and he hears that one of his close relatives died he should leave the service and go out this is the opinion of Arjuna Ar Jose says he should complete his service how can you then say that we bring him from his house rather says Rabba throughout the day Talmud, Mas Yuma means to say that he does not officiate all that day as a preventive measure lest he eat said our Adabi Ahab to Rabba but did Arjuna enact a preventive measure lest he eat have we not learned Arjuna said we also provide another wife for him lest his wife die now when his wife dies he may perform the service on the same day without Arjuna becoming apprehensive lest he eat he replied now. Is this so there because it is a day of atonement on which all the world does not eat he too would not be likely to eat but here on any day when all the world is eating he would also be ready to eat but under such conditions what morning would be coming upon him because of her since she is divorced from him granted that no morning would be obligatory but he would surely be distracted Mishnah throughout the seven days he sprinkles the blood and burns the incense and trims the lamps and Offers the head and the hind leg on all other days he offers only if he so desires for the high priest is first in offering a portion and has first place in taking a portion Gemara who is the authority for our mission Arhista said it is not in accord with our Akiva for if it were our Akiva surely holds that if some of the sprinkling fell upon the clean person it rendered him unclean how could he then officiate at the service for it has been taught and the clean person shall sprinkle upon it. Unclean i.e. if sprinkled upon the unclean he becomes clean if sprinkled upon the clean he becomes unclean this is the opinion of our Akiva but the sages hold that these matters concerning sprinkling apply only to such things as are susceptible to uncleanness I what is it about as we have learned if he intended sprinkling an animal and happened to sprinkle a man then if there be sufficient water on the hyssop he may repeat the sprinkling if he intended sprinkling a man and he Happen to sprinkle an animal beneath there be enough water on the hyssop he may not repeat the sprinkling what is the reason for our Akiva's view let the divine law right and the clean person shall sprinkle upon him what is the meaning of upon the unclean infer from this that if sprinkled the unclean becomes clean and if sprinkled the clean becomes unclean and what is the reason for the view of the rabbis these words emphasize that sprinkling is right only upon matters susceptible to uncleanness but this case can be deduced to minoriad mages if sprinkling upon an unclean makes clean how much more shall sprinkling upon a clean keep or make more clean and our Akiva it is with reference to this that Solomon said I said I will get wisdom but it is far from me and the sages they explain this passage to refer to the fact that he who sprinkles and he who is sprinkled are clean whereas he who touches them the waters of purification is rendered unclean but is he who Sprinkles clean surely it is written and he that sprinkled the water of sprinkling shall wash his clothes sprinkled here means touch it but the text reads sprinkled and also mentions touch it furthermore he who sprinkled must wash his clothes whereas he who touch it need not wash his clothes rather sprinkled here means carry then let the divine law write carry why is sprinkled written that is meant to let us know that there must be a quantity sufficient for the sprinkling that will be right according to him who holds that a definite minimum is necessary in the sprinkling but according to him who holds there is no required minimum in the sprinkling what is there to be said even according to him who holds there is no required minimum it will be right for that refers only to the back of the man but in the vessels there must be a definite quantity as we have learned how much water is necessary to be sufficient for the sprinkling enough for dipping Talmud, Masuma. Be the buds therein and for the water to be sprinkled. Have they said the mission may be in accord even with our Akiva. He the high priest officiates all day and in the evening is he sprinkled and he takes the immersion and awaits the sunset and burns the incense and trims the lamps. Hence you may infer that the incense came first and the lamps afterwards. A contradiction is raised against this. He to whom it
The trimming of the lamps interrupted by the blood of the regular daily offering I will tell you this is no difficulty the one refers to the order of the daily temple service in accord with Abbas all the other in accord with the sages for it has been taught he should not trim the lamps and after that burn the incense but he should offer the incense first and then trim the lamps Abbas all says he should first trim and then offer the incense what is the reason for Abbas all's view for it? Is written every morning when he draws the lamps and afterwards it says he shall burn it and the sages what the divine law intends here is Talmud, Masyuma that at the time the lamps are being trimmed there shall still be a burning of the incense for if you would not interpret thus how will you account for at dusk as it is written and when Aaron lighteth the lamps at dusk he shall burn it would you say here too that he shall first light the lamps and afterwards offer up it? Incense do at dusk and if you will say indeed so it is but has it not been taught from evening to morning i.e. provide a sufficient quantity of oil that it may burn all night from evening to morning or according to another interpretation from evening to morning i.e. there is no service which is proper to be performed from evening to morning except this what then the divine law intends is that at the time of the lighting there shall still be a burning of the incense here also at the time of the trimming there shall still be a burning of the incense and Abbas all it is different there because scripture says although it our Papa said this is no difficulty the one account agrees with the sages the other with Abbas all how do you place the matter now our mission in accord with the sages and the mission of the count in accord with Abbas all then consider the second part they brought to him the daily sacrifice he made the incision and another finished the slaughtering for him he entered to burn the incense and to trim the lamps that is in accord with the sages the beginning and the end is then in accord with the sages and the middle in accord with Abbas all our Papa will tell you yes the beginning and end are in accord with the sages and the middle with Abbas all it is clear why Abbas does not agree with the interpretation of our Papa because he will not explain the first and last part of the mission as being in accord with the sages whilst the middle with Abbas all but why does not our Papa take Abbe's point of view he will tell you what he the Tana teach first of the trimming of two lamps and only afterwards of the trimming of five lamps and Abbe he will tell you first he teaches in a general fashion of the obligation of the high priest to be occupied during the seven days and afterwards he describes the order of the service the text above states he came to the northeastern corner and sprinkled the east and the north and as he came to the south western corner he sprinkled the west and south and in connection with that it was taught that our Simeon of Mizpah had this change in Tamed as he came to the northeastern corner he sprinkled the east and north and as he came to the southwestern corner he sprinkled the west and afterwards the south what is the reason of our Simeon of Mizpah are Yohanan in the name of one of the school of Arjana said scripture said and one he go for a sin offering unto the Lord it shall be offered beside it. Continual burnt offering and the drink offering thereof it is a burnt offering and the divine law says deal with it as with a sin offering how is that to be done he sprinkles one in such a manner as to constitute two sprinklings as is prescribed for a burnt offering and he sprinkles two separate ones as is prescribed for the sin offering but let him make two sprinklings in such a manner as to constitute four as is prescribed for a burnt offering and four full sprinklings as is prescribed for a sin offering we do not find anywhere that blood brings atonement and then brings atonement again but we do find blood half of which is sprinkled after the manner of a sin offering and the other half after the manner of a burnt offering what you must of need say is that scripture has brought them under the same category here too one might say of need scripture has brought them under one category here it is a case of merely splitting the sprinkling but let him sprinkle one so as to Constitute two below as is prescribed for a burnt offering and two separate sprinklings above as is prescribed for sin offerings we do not find that any blood is sprinkled half above and half below not indeed have we not learned he sprinkled thereof once upwards and seven times downwards that was done came ajlet like the movement of swinging a whip what does came ajlet mean Rav Judah showed it by imitating the movements of a lasher but do we not find any blood sprinkled half above and half below surely we have learned he sprinkled thereof upon the tohar of the altar seven times don't you think it means upon the middle of the front of the altar as people say the noon light shines meaning by Jahara the middle of the day Rabbi Bishila said no it refers Talmud Masyuma be to the top of the altar itself for it is written and the like of the very heaven for clearness why does he just sprinkle first as do with the burnt offering and afterwards as do with the sin offering let him First sprinkle as do in case of a sin offering and after that as do with a burnt offering because it is a burnt offering it comes first and why does he just sprinkle northeast and southwest let him sprinkle southeast and then northwest I will tell you the burnt offering requires the projecting base of the altar and the southeastern corner has no projecting base why does he sprinkle first northeast and then southwest let him sprinkle southwest and then northeast since a master said all the turns you make in the temple must be to the right the east he comes first to that northeast whence do you know that it is with the burnt offering that the divine law states that it should be offered up in the manner due to a sin offering may it not be that it is with regard to the sin offering that the Torah says offer it up after the manner of the burnt offerings let not that thought arise in you for it is written beside the continual burnt offering and the drink Offering thereof what does the divine law mean by this apply the measures forms of the sin offering to the burnt offering we have learned there the memuna said to them go and bring a lamb from the cell of the lambs now the cell of the lambs was in the northwestern corner four cells were there one was the cell of the lambs one the cell of the seals one the cell of the fireplace and one cell in which the shoe bread was made they raised an objection there were four rooms in the cell of it fireplace like small rooms opening into a reception room two on holy ground two outside of holy ground and the ends of the flagstones in the pavement indicated the mark between the sacred and the secular grounds what was there used the southwestern was the cell of the lambs for offerings Talmud Masyum of the southeastern was the cell wherein they made shoe bread in the northeastern the Hasmoneans hid the stones of the altar which the Greek kings had defiled through the northwestern day. Went down to the chamber of immersion Arhuna said who is the authority for the anonymous mission as in mid or Eliezer B. Jacob for we have learned the court of the women was 135 cubits long and 135 cubits wide at its four corners there were four cells what was there used the southeastern was the cell of the Nazi rites where the Nazi rites cooked their peace offerings and cut off their hair and cast it under the pot the northeastern was the cell of the woodshed wherein priests afflicted with a blemish were standing to examine the wood for worms for any wood wherein a worm was found is unfit for the altar the northwestern was the cell of the lepers as to the southwestern our Eliezer B. Jacob said I forget what its use was whilst Abbas all said there they put wine and oil and it used to be called the cell of the house of oils it may also be proved by reasoning that the authority for the anonymous mission as in is our Eliezer B. Jacob for we have learned all the walls that were there in the temple were high with the exception of the eastern wall because the priest who burns the heifer stands on the Mount of Olives and looks towards the entrance of the temple at the time the blood of the heifer is sprinkled and we have learned all the entrances that were there were twenty cubits high and ten cubits wide and we have learned inside this was the sorry railing of lattice work and we have learned inside this was the hell. Rampart ten cubits broad there were twelve steps there the height of each step was half a cubit and the depth of each step was half a cubit furthermore fifteen steps which led from the court of the Israelites to the court of the women the height and depth of each step being half a cubit furthermore we learned between the hall and the altar there were twenty two cubits there were twelve steps the height and depth of each half a cubit and we have learned our Eliza B. Jacob said there was a step. One cubit high and the platform was set thereon and on it were three steps half a cubit high each now if you can say that the authority for the anonymous mission as in Tamed is our Eliza B. Jacob then it will be quite right because according to him the door is concealed but if you should say that it is in accord with the other rabbis there would be left half a cubit through which the door would be visible our Adabi Ahabah said it is our Judah for it has been taught our Judah said the altar was placed exactly in the center of the temple court measuring 32 cubits Talmud, Masyum would be 10 cubits opposite the door of the temple 11 cubits toward the north and 11 cubits toward the south with the result that the altar was exactly opposite the temple and its walls but if you should consider that the authority for Middoth is in accord with our Judah how could the altar possibly have stood in the center of the temple surely we have learned the temple court in all had a length of a 187 cubits and a width of 
Shu bread to another statement about the cell of the shu bread and the answer given by Arhuna, the son of Arjashua. One teacher considers it as lying to the right and the other as lying to the left. Talmud, Masyuma B. Now, if you say that it lay in the southwestern corner, it will be right that he answers the objection raised from one statement about shu bread to another statement about shu bread. But if you say it lay in the northwestern corner, what sense is there in the answer about it? Shu bread must one not hence infer that it lay in the southwestern corner. That is the right inference. But the master has said all the turns you make must be to the right, i.e., towards the east. That rule applies to the temple service. But here it is merely on account of measurement. For the high priest is first in offering a portion and first in taking a portion of the sacrifices. Our rabbis taught how is he first in offering a portion? He can say this burnt offering. I shall offer up this meal. Offering I shall offer up how has he first right in taking a portion he can say the sin offering I am eating this guilt offering I am eating he can take one of the two loaves four or five of the shoe bread loaves rabbi says always five for it is written and it shall be for Aaron and his sons i.e. half for Aaron and half for his sons this statement in itself is difficult you have said he takes one of the two loaves that is in accord with rabbi who says he can take one half now say the middle portion four or five of the shoe bread loaves that is in accord with the sages who say that he does not take one half now say the last portion rabbi says always he takes five does then the first and last part agree with rabbi in the middle with the sages abbe said the first and the second parts agree with the sages and the sages admit that it is not a proper thing to give the high priest a piece of bread Talmud Masyuma how is four or five to be taken according to the sages who say that Incoming Mishmar took six and the outgoing group took six and there is no fee for the locking of the temple gates. The division is in respect of the twelve loaves deduct one from a half that makes five whereas according to our Judah who says the incoming Mishmar takes seven of which two are the fee for locking the temple gates and the outgoing division takes five. The division is in respect of ten loaves take one off the half thus he takes four. Rabbi said the whole teaching is in accord with Rabbi. But he is of the opinion of our Judah how then does four come in he should take five that is no difficulty in the one case there is a Mishmar which delayed in the sanctuary and the other there is no such Mishmar if there be a Mishmar which delayed so that he would take four of them the division is in respect of eight loaves if there is no Mishmar which had delayed one ought to divide ten so that the division is in respect of ten loaves he would take five loaves if so then can Rabbi say always five. That is indeed a difficulty mission they delivered to him elders from the elders of the court and they read before him throughout the seven days out of the order of the day they said to him sir high priest read you yourself with your own mouth perchance you have forgotten or perchance you have never learned on the eve of the day of atonement in the morning they place him at the eastern gate and pass before him oxen rams and sheep that he may learn to know and become familiar with the service. Throughout the seven days they did not withhold food or drink from him but on the eve of the day of atonement near nightfall they would not let him eat much because food brings about sleep tomorrow it is quite right that they assume perchance he has forgotten but that he never learned do we ever appoint men of that type surely it has been taught in the priest that is highest among his brethren that means he should be highest among his brethren in strength and beauty and wisdom and in riches. Others say once do we know that if he does not possess any wealth his brethren the priests endow him to teach us that it says and the priest who is great by reason of his brethren i.e. make him great from what his brethren have our Joseph said that is no difficulty one refers to the first temple the other to the second for R.C. said a tarka full of dinars did Martha the daughter of Boethus give to King Janet to nominate Joshua Van Gamel as one of the high priests on the eve of the day of atonement in the morning Atana taught also that he goats why as Artana not taught he goats since they are meant for sin offerings he might feel discouraged if it be so does not a bullet to come for a sin offering since that comes for himself and his brethren the priests there is this advantage that if there be one among his brethren the priests with whom there is something the matter he would know it and bring him back to repentance but would he know that with all Israel Rabbana? Said this is what the popular proverb means if your sister's son has been appointed a constable look out that you pass not before him in the street throughout the seven days they did not withhold etc. It has been taught our Judah Binakusa said one fed him cakes of fine flour and eggs in order to produce speedy elimination they answered him thus you will induce the more excitement it has been taught Simica said in the name of our mayor one does not feed him either ABY and some say neither. ABBY and some say neither white wine neither ABY i.e. neither Ethric citron nor bazim eggs nor yin old wine and according to others no ABBY i.e. neither Ethric nor bazim nor basarchim and fat meat nor yin and some say neither white wine because white wine induces levitical impurity in man our rabbis taught to one afflicted with gonorrhea one assigns food or too many kinds of food as the cause of an attack of gonorrhea Eliezer Bifineha says in the name of our Judah but there one does not feed him either HGBY or GBM or any other thing that induces impurity neither HGBY i.e. neither halab milk nor divine cheese nor vezin nor yin nor GBM i.e. neither meat shell pool soup of pounded beans nor base arshim nor nor any other matters foods that induce impurity what is that meant to include it is meant to include what our rabbis taught five things induce impurity in man they are as follows garlic talmud, masyuma be talmud, masyuma be. Pepper word purslin eggs and garden rocket and one went out into the field to gather oroth herbs a tana taught in the name of our mayor that refers to garden rocket are you said why are they called oroth because they enlighten the eyes Arhuna said if one finds a garden rocket he should eat it if he can and if not he should pass it over his eyes our papa said that refers to rocket growing on the bakar said in the name of rabbi guests should not eat eggs nor sleep in the garment of his. Host, whenever Rab came to Darshis, he would announce who would be mine for a day. Whenever Arnaman would come to Shekinsab, he would have it announced who will be mine for a day. But has it not been taught no man should marry a woman in one country and then go and marry a woman in another country, lest they their children might marry one another, with the result that a brother would marry a sister or a father his daughter, and one fill all the world with bastardy to which the scriptural passage refers, and the land become full of lewdness. I will tell you the affairs of the rabbis are well known, but did not Rabbi say if one has proposed marriage to a woman and she has consented, then she must await seven clean days. The rabbis informed them before by sending their messenger earlier, or if you like, say they only arranged for private meetings with them, because you cannot compare one who has bread in his basket with one who has no bread in his basket. Mission of the elders of the court handed. Him over to the elders of the priesthood, and they took him up to the upper chamber to the house of Athens. They drew him, took their leave as they said to him, Sir High Priest, we are messengers of the Bethdin, and you are our messenger and the messenger of the court. We adjure you by him that made his name to dwell in this house, that you do not change anything of what we said to you. He turned aside and wept, and they turned aside and wept. If he was a sage, he would expound, and if not, the disciples of the sages would expound before him. If he was familiar with reading the scriptures, he would read. If not, they would read before him. From what would they read before him? From Job Ezra and Chronicles, Zechariah Ben Kubitel said, Often have I read before him from Daniel Talmud, Masyuma Gemara, Atana taught to teach him the manipulation of Hophen. Our Papa said the high priest had two cells: one the cell of the counselors, the other the cell of the house of Athens, one to the north. Other to the south, one to the north, as we have learned, six cells were in the temple court, three to the north, three to the south, those to the north were the cell of the salt, the cell upper with a rinsing cell into the cell of the salt, the salt for the sacrifice was put, the cell upper where the hides of the animal offerings were salted, and on its roof was the place of immersion for the high priest on the day of atonement, the rinsing cell there, the inwards of the animal offerings were rinsed. And an incline led from it to the roof of the purpose cell, the three to the north were the wood cell, the exile cell, and the cell of hewn stone concerning the wood cell, our Eliezer B. Jacob said, I have forgotten what it was used for, but Abbasal said it was the cell of the high priest, and it lay behind the two, and the roof of all the three was of the same height, the exile cell there was the exile cistern, and a will was placed above it, and from there they drew water for the whole temple court. It Cell of hewn stone there the Sanhedrin of Israel was sitting and judging the priests and whosoever was found unfit would put on a black dress and wrap himself in black go out and go his way and one in whom no blemish was found would put on a white garment wrap himself in
Relieve nature, turn to the south, immerse himself, and learn the Hafana. Enter the sanctuary, perform the service all day, be sprinkled towards evening, return to the south, and immerse himself, and then he would have to turn and go to the north. The rest would we trouble him so much? Why should we not put him to much trouble so that if he be a Sadducee, he will give up, or in order that he become not too overbearing? For if you do not say so, let us place the two cells next to each other, or let one be. Enough for him, they said to him, Sir High Priest, etc. Shall we say that this will be a refutation of Arhuna the son of Ar Joshua? For Arhuna the son of Ar Joshua said, These priests are messengers of the All Merciful God. For if you were to say they are our own messengers, Talmud, Masyuma B, is there anything that we ourselves are unable to perform and our messengers can perform? Rather, this is what they said to him, We adjure you according to our mind, and in the mind of the Beth Din he turned aside. And what and they turned aside, and what he turned aside, and what because they suspected him of being a Sadducee, and they turned aside, and what for Ar Joshua B. Levi said, Whosoever suspects good folks will suffer for it on his own body. Why was all this solemn adjuration necessary, lest he arrange the incense outside and thus bring it in in the manner of the Sadducees? Our rabbis taught there was a Sadducee who had arranged the incense without and then brought it inside as he left, he was. Exceedingly glad on his coming out, his father met him and said to him, My son, although we are Sadducees, we are afraid of the Pharisees. He replied, All my life was I grieved because of this scriptural verse, for I appear in the cloud upon the ark cover. I would say, When shall the opportunity come to my hand so that I might fulfill it? Now that such opportunity has come to my hand, should I not have fulfilled it? It is reported that it took only a few days until he died and was thrown on the dung heap. And worms came forth from his nose. Some say he was smitten as he came out of the Holy of Holies, for our high taught some sort of a noise was heard in the temple court, for an angel had come and struck him down on his face to the ground, and his brethren the priests came in and they found the traces of a calf's foot on his shoulder as it is written, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Our Zechariah, the son of Kabutl, said, etc. The son of Rab repeated to Hai, the son of Rab in the presence of Rab, Zechariah, the son of Kutal, whereupon Rab indicated to him with a gesture of the hand that it should be Kabutl. Why did he not speak to him? He was reading the Shema, but is such interruption permitted? Has not our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha said he who reads the Shema may neither blink with his eyes nor gesticulate with his lips nor point with his fingers, and it has also been taught our Eliezer Hisma said concerning him. Who whilst reading the Shema blinks with his eyes, gesticulates with his lips, or points with his fingers, Scripture has said, Thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. There is no difficulty. One view refers to the first portion of the Shema, the other to the second portion. Our rabbis have taught, and thou shalt speak of them of them, but not during prayer of them. Thou mayest speak, but not of other things. Our said, and thou shalt speak of them. I.e., make them a regular program and not a casual topic. Rabbah said, One who engages in profane talk transgresses a positive command, for it is written, and thou shalt speak of them of them, but not of other matters. Our Ahabi Jacob said, He transgresses against the prohibition, for it is said, All things toil to weariness. Man cannot utter admission if he sought to slumber. Young priests would snap their middle finger before him and say, Sir High Priest, arise and drive the sleep away. This once on the pavement, they would keep him amused until the time for the Slaughtering of the daily morning offering would approach tomorrow. What is here to Rab Judah said the rival of this one which is at the Thumar who not demonstrated it and its sound could be heard in the whole academy and they would say Sir High Priest arise and drive the sleep away. This once our Isaac said show us something new what was that they said to him show us the Kita and they would keep him amused until the time for the slaughtering would approach a tanatot they kept him amused. Neither with the harp nor with the lyre but with the mouth what were they singing except the Lord build a house they labor in vain that built it some of the worthiest of Jerusalem did not go to sleep all the night in order that the high priest might hear the reverberating noise so that sleep should not overcome him suddenly it has been taught Abbas all said also in the country they used to do so in memory of the temple but they used to commit sin Abay, or as some say Arnam and B. Isaac. Interpreted that to refer to Nehardia for Elijah said to Rab Judah the brother of Arsila the pious you have said why has not Messiah come now today is the day of atonement and yet how many virgins were embraced in Nehardia he answered what did the Holy One bless be he say he answered Talmud, Masyuma is in couch at the door what about Satan he answered Satan has no permission to act as accuser on the day of atonement once is that derived Rambu Bihama said has happened in numerical value is 364 that means on 364 days he has permission to act as accuser but on the day of atonement he has no permission to act as accuser mission every day one would remove the ashes from the altar at Kariyadi Hashibur or about that time either before or after but on the day of atonement at midnight and on the feast at the first watch and before the cock crow approached the temple court was full of Israelites tomorrow we have learned elsewhere if limbs of animal offerings burst off from upon the altar before midnight, they must be put back in the law of Mi'ila applies to them. If they sprang off the altar after midnight, they need not be put back in the law of Mi'ila does not apply to them. Once do we know that Rab said one scriptural verse says all night and he shall make smoke, and another passage says all night and he shall take up the ashes. How is that divide the night half of it for smoking and the other half for taking up of the ashes? Our Kahana raised an objection every day one would remove the ashes from the altar at Kakro or about that time either before or after, but on the day of atonement at midnight and on the feast at the first watch. Now Talmud, Masyuma B, if the thought should arise in you that midnight is a time fixed by the Torah, how could it be anticipated or postponed? Rather said, are you Hanan by mere logical conclusion from the text all the night would I not know that it means until the morning why then the teaching until the morning add another morning to the morning of the night hence every day one would remove the ashes at cockcrow either before or after being ample time on the day of atonement when the high priest is weak we do it about midnight and on the feast when many Israelites are present and many sacrifices are offered we do it from the first watch as indeed the reason therefore is indicated before the cockcrow approached the temple court was full of Israelites what does carry the Hajib Rab said the call of a man Arshila the call of the cockrab came to the place of Arshila when there happened to be no interpreter to stand next to Arshila so Rab took the stand next to him and interpreted Kiriath Hagibar as the call of the man Arshila said to him would you sir interpret it as cockcrow Rab replied a flute is musical to nobles but give it to weavers they will not accept it when I stood before our high and interpreted Kiriath Hajib as the call of the man he did not object to it and you say to me say perhaps the cock's crow he said sir you are rab would you sit down sir he replied people say if you have hired yourself away to someone pull his will some say thus did he reply to him one may promote a man in holy things but not demote him there is a teaching in accordance with rab and there is also a teaching in accord with Arshila. there is a teaching in accord with rab what does Gabbanai the temple crier call out arise yet priest for your service love it's for your platform israel for your post and his voice was audible for three parts and it happened that king agrippa who came along traveling heard his voice from three parts and as he came home he sent gifts to him nevertheless the high priest is more excellent than even he for the master said it has happened already that when he prayed O lord that his voice was heard in jericho and rabbi barhanna said in the name of our yohanan from jerusalem to jericho is a distance of ten parsangs, and although here there is weakness and there none, and here it is day and there night for our Levi said, Why is the voice of man not heard by day as it is heard by night because of the revolution of the sun which saws in the sky like a carpenter sawing cedars? Those sunboats are called law, and with reference to them, Nebuchadnezzar said, And all the inhabitants of the world are considered as law. Our rabbis taught, Were it not for the revolution of the sun, the sound of it. Tumult of Rome would be heard, and were it not for the sound of the tumult of Rome, the sound of the revolution of the sun would be heard. Our rabbis taught, There are three voices going from one end of the world to the other, the sound of the revolution of the sun, the sound of the tumult of Rome, and the sound of the soul as it leaves the body. Some say also the sound of childbirth, Talmud, Masyuma, and some say also the sound of Ridya, the sages prayed for the soul as it leaves the body and Achieve the stopping of that cry we have learned in accord with Arshila if one starts out
Did any man ever say to his fellow the place is too narrow for me to stay overnight in Jerusalem? He started with miracles in the temple and concludes with those wrought in Jerusalem. There are two more miracles wrought in the temple for it has been taught never did rains quench the fire of the pile of wood on the altar and as for the smoke arising from the pile of wood even if all the winds of the world came blowing they could not divert it from its wanted place but are there no more has. Not Arshima of Kalnabo taught that the fragments of earthenware were swallowed up in the very place where they were broken and Abbe said to crop the feathers the ashes removed from the inner altar and from the candlestick were swallowed up in the very place where they were taken off the three referring to disqualifications were included under one head hence take off two and add two but then all cases of things swallowed up ought also to be included under one head so that the count would be one short there are also other miracles for our Joshua believe I said a great miracle was wrought with the shoe bread is when it was removed it was as fresh as when it was put on as it was said to put hot bread in the day it was taken away but are there no more has not our Levi said this matter has been handed down as a tradition to us from our forefathers the place on which the ark stands is not included in the measurement and has not Rabbi in the name of Samuel said the cherubs were Standing by sheer miracle the count refers to miracles wrought outside the temple miracles wrought inside are not mentioned if that be so what of the shoe bread which is also a miracle that happened inside the temple know that miracle happened outside for Reshlakish said what is the meaning of the passage upon the pure table before the Lord the statement that it is pure implies that it was susceptible to uncleanness Talmud, Mas Yumabi but surely it was a wooden vessel intended for resting. And every wooden vessel intended for resting is not susceptible to uncleanness and sets up a barrier against uncleanness rather does this teach us that the table would be lifted up for the gaze of those who came up to the festivals with the mark behold how beloved you are of God for it is as fresh when it is taken off as it was when put on as it was said to put hot bread in the day it was taken away but were there no more miracles did not our Ashai say when King Solomon built the sanctuary he Planted therein all kinds of trees of golden delights which were bringing forth their fruits in their season, and as the winds blew at them, they would fall off as it is written, May his fruits rustle like Lebanon. And when the foreigners entered the temple, they withered as it is written, and the flower of Lebanon languishes, and the Holy One blessed be he will in the future restore them as it is said, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy, and singing the glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it permanent miracles. He does not include in his count, and now that we have come to this conclusion, the ark and the cherubim are also permanent miracles, the master said, and the smoke arising from the pile of wood on the altar. But was there smoke arising from the pile of wood? Has it not been taught? Five things were reported about the fire of the pile of wood. It was lying like a lion, it was as clear as sunlight, its flame was of solid substance, it devoured wood like dry wood. And it caused no smoke to arise from it. What we said about the smoke referred to the wood from outside of the sanctuary, for it has been taught, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar. Although the fire comes down from heaven, it is a proper thing to bring fire from outside to lying like a lion. But has it not been taught? Our hand, a deputy high priest said, I myself have seen it, and it was lying like a dog. This is no contradiction. The first statement refers to the first temple, the second to the second temple. But was the fire present at the second temple? Surely our Samuel being said, What is the meaning of the scriptural verse? And I will take pleasure in it. We and I will be glorified. The traditional reading is we Then why is the letter he omitted in the text to indicate that in five things the first sanctuary differed from the second in the ark? The ark covered the cherubim, the fire, the Sheshanah, the Holy Spirit of prophecy, and the Urim we. Thumb the oracle plate I will tell you they were present but they were not as helpful as before our rabbis taught there are six different kinds of fire fire which eats but does not drink fire which drinks but does not eat fire which eats and drinks fire which consumes dry matter as well as moist matter and fire which pushes fire away fire which eats fire fire which eats but does not drink that is our fire water quenches it which drinks but does not eat the fever of the sick eats and drinks that of Elijah for it is written and licked up the water that was in the trench eats both dry and moist matter the fire of the pile of wood fire which pushes other fire away that of Gabriel and fire which eats fire that of the Sheshan offer a master said he put forth his finger among them and burned them it is stated above but the smoke arising from the pile of wood even all the winds of the world could not move it from its place but did not our Isaac be of Dimi say on the night Following the last day of the Sukkot festival, all were gazing upon the smoke arising from the pile of wood. If it inclined northward, the poor rejoiced, and the people of Means were sad because the rains of the coming year would be abundant and their fruits would rot. If it inclined southward, the poor were depressed, and the men of Means rejoiced, for there would be little rain that year, and the fruit could be preserved. If it inclined eastwards, all rejoiced. If westwards, all were depressed. It merely means that it swayed hither and thither like a tree, but it was not scattered. The master said, If it inclined eastward, all rejoiced. Westward, all were depressed. There is a contradiction against it. The east wind is always good. The west wind always bad. The north wind benefits wheat when it has grown to one third of its usual height and is bad for olives when they are budding. The south wind is bad for wheat which has grown one third of its normal size and good for olives when they are. Budding and our Joseph or Marzitra said in connection therewith as a sign the table was in the north and the candlestick in the south i.e. the one north wind grows what is good for the table and the other south wind what is good for the candlestick this is no contradiction the former statement refers to us the latter to them Talmud, Mas Yuma A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I mission originally whosoever desired to remove the ashes from the altar did so if they were many they would run and mount it. Ramp of the altar and he that came first within four cubits obtained the privilege if two were even the officer would say to them all raise the finger and how many did they put forth one or two but one did not put forth the thumb in the temple it once happened that two were even as they ran to mount the ramp one of them pushed his fellow who fell and broke his leg when the court saw that they incurred danger they ordained that the altar be cleared only by count there were four counts this is the first count Gemara but why did our rabbis not establish the count for the service from the beginning they thought since it was a night service it would not be considered so precious and they many priests would not come but when they saw that many were coming and incurred danger they arranged the count but the burning on the altar of the limbs and fat pieces is also a night service and yet our rabbis arranged the count for it it is rather the end of the service of the day but the other two is the beginning of the service of the day for our Yohan and said if he sanctified his hands by washing for clearing the ashes off the altar he need not in the morning sanctify them again because he has sanctified them already from the beginning of the service say because he has from the beginning sanctified his hands for the service some say firstly the rabbis believed that since many of them are overcome by sleep they would not come to this night service but when they saw they were coming and incurring danger our rabbis arranged for the count but with the burning of the limbs and fat pieces taking also place at a time when they are also overcome by sleep and yet our rabbis arranged for a count there is a difference between going to sleep and rising from sleep but was the arrangement due to that consideration was it not rather due to another consideration for it has been taught he who obtained the task of clearing the altar of the ashes thereby also obtained the ordering of the pile of wood on the altar and of the two pieces of wood are ashes said there were two arrangements first they the rabbis opined that they would not come at night but when they saw that the priests did come and incurred danger they arranged for the count when the count had been arranged they did not come for they said who can tell whether the lot will fall on me therefore they the rabbis arranged that he who had obtained the task of clearing the ashes off the altar should thereby also obtain the task of arranging the piles of wood and the two pieces of wood in order that they might come and submit to the count if they were many etc. Our Papa said it is obvious to me that within four cubits does not refer to the four cubits on the floor because we learned they would run and mount the ramp neither does it mean the first four cubits because we learned they would run and mount the ramp and after that he that came first within four cubits neither does it mean four cubits in the middle because this is not clearly indicated hence it is self-evident that it means four cubits off the altar but our Papa asked do these four cubits of which we have spoken include the one cubit of the projecting base and the one cubit of the gallery Talmud, Mas Yuma B or does it mean exclusive of the one cubit base and one cubit gallery the question stands if two were even the officer would say to them raise the finger etc. Attended taught put
a pebble's head in the end and he counted them by means of sheep but perhaps these sheep were of their own and what is remarkable about it and he strove in the valley Armani said because of what happens in the valley when the Holy One blessed be he said to Saul now go and smite Amalek he said if on account of one person the Torah said perform the ceremony of the heifer whose neck is to be broken how much more a consideration to be given to all these persons and if human beings sinned. What has the cattle committed and if the adults have sinned what have the little ones done a divine voice came forth and said be not righteous over much and when Saul said to Doug turn thou and fall upon the priest a heavenly voice came forth to say be not over much wicked Arunah said how little does he whom the Lord supports need to grieve or trouble himself Saul sinned once and it brought calamity upon him David sinned twice and it did not bring evil upon him what was the one sin of Saul. The affair with the gag but there was also the matter with Nob the city of the priests still it was because of what happened with the gag that scripture says it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king what were the two sins of David the sin against Uriah and that of counting the people to which he was enticed but there was also the matter of Bathsheba for that he was punished as it is written and he shall restore the lamb fourfold the child Amnon Tamar and Absalom but for the other sin. He was also punished as it is written so the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed there his own body was not punished but in the former case too his own body was not punished either not indeed he was punished on his own body for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab for six months David was smitten with leprosy the Sanhedrin removed from him and the Shechina departed from him as it is written let those that fear thee return unto me and they that know thy testimonies and it is also written restore unto me the joy of thy salvation but Rab said that David also listened to evil talk we hold like Samuel who says that David did not do so and even according to Rab who says that David listened to calumny was he not punished for it for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab at the time when David said to Mephibosheth I say thou and Zeba divide the land a heavenly voice came forth to say to him Rehoboam and Jeroboam will divide the kingdom Saul was a year. Old when he began to reign Arunah said like an infant of one year who had not tasted the taste of sin Arnaman B. Isaac demurred to the say perhaps like an infant of one year old that is filthy with mud and excrement Arnaman thereupon was shown a frightening vision in his dream whereupon he said I beg your pardon bones of Saul son of Kish but he saw again a frightening vision in his dream whereupon he said I beg your pardon bones of Saul son of Kish king in Israel Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel why did the kingdom of Saul not endure because no reproach rested on him for Arjohanan had said in the name of Arsimian B. Jehoshadak one should not appoint anyone administrator of a community unless he carries a basket of reptiles on his back so that if he became arrogant one could tell him turn around Rab Judah said in the name of Rab why was Saul punished because he forewent the honor due to himself as it is said but certain base fellows said how shall this man save us and they despised him and brought him no present but he was as one that held his peace and it is written immediately following that then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jebeshiliad Arjohanan further said in the name of Arsimian B. Jehoshadak any scholar Talmud, Masyuma who does not avenge himself and retain anger like a serpent is no real scholar but is it not written thou shalt not take vengeance nor bear any grudge that refers to monetary affairs for it has been taught what is revenge and what is bearing a grudge if one said to his fellow lend me your sickle and he replied no and tomorrow the second comes to the first and says lend me your axe and he replies I will not lend it to you just as you would not lend me your sickle that is revenge and what is bearing a grudge if one says to his fellow lend me your axe he replies no and on the morrow the second asks lend me your garment and he answers here it is I am not like you who would not lend me what I asked. For that is bearing a grudge but does not this prohibition apply to personal affliction has it not been taught concerning those who are insulted but do not insult others in revenge who hear themselves reproached without replying who perform good work out of love of the Lord and rejoice in their suffering scripture says but they that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might that means indeed that he keeps it in his heart though without taking action Rod Rabbah said. He who passes over his retaliations has all his transgressions passed over that speaks of the case that an endeavor was made to obtain his reconciliation and his consent is obtained and how many did they put forth one or two if they may put forth two why is it necessary to mention that they may put forth one Arhista said this is no difficulty the one speaks of healthy persons the other of sick ones thus has it been taught one finger is put forth but not two to whom does this rule apply to. A healthy person but a sick one may put forth even two but the Yehidim put forward two and one counts only one thereof but has it not been taught one does not put forth either the third finger or the thumb because of tricksters and if one had put forth the third finger it would be counted but if one had put forth the thumb it would not be counted and not alone that but the officer strikes him with the piki what does it would be counted mean only one what is piki rap said a madra chastising. With what is madra our papa said the whip of the Arabs the head sting of which is taken off Abbe said originally I believe that which we have learned Ben Bibi was in charge of piki meant in charge of the wicks as we have learned from the outworn bridges and belts of the priests they used to make piki and like them now that I hear that it was taught not that alone but the officer would strike him with the piki I understand that piki means lash it once happened that two were even. As they ran to mount the ramp, our rabbis taught it once happened that two priests were equal as they ran to mount the ramp, and when one of them came first within four cubits of the altar, the other took a knife and thrust it into his heart. Arzadok stood on the steps of the hall and said, Our brethren of the house of Israel, here ye behold, it says, If one be found slain in the land, and thy elders and judges shall come forth, on whose behalf shall we offer the heifer whose neck is to be broken on behalf of the city or on behalf of the temple courts? All the people burst out weeping. The father of the young man came and found him still in convulsions. He said, May he be an atonement for you, my son is still in convulsions, and the knife has not become unclean. His remark comes to teach you that the cleanness of their vessels was of greater concern to them even than the shedding of blood. Thus is it also said, Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one. And to the other which event took place first would you say that of the bloodshed took place first now if in spite of the bloodshed they did not establish the count would they have arranged it because of the incident of the broken leg rather the incident of the broken leg came first but since they had already arranged the count how was the affair of the bloodshed within the four cubits possible rather the incident of the bloodshed came first but at first the rabbis thought it was a mere accident but when however they saw that even without such unfortunate accidents they incurred danger they enacted the count Arzadok stood upon the steps of the hall and called out our brethren of the house of Israel here ye behold it says if one be found slain in the land on whose behalf shall we bring the heifer whose neck is to be broken on behalf of the city or of the temple courts but does the community of Jerusalem bring a heifer whose neck is to be broken surely it has been taught ten. Things were said concerning Jerusalem and this is one of them Talmud, Masyuma B. It does not have to bring a heifer whose neck is to be broken furthermore and it be not known who has smitten him but here it is known who has smitten him rather he put his question rhetorically to increase the weeping the father of the young man came and found the boy in convulsions he said may he be an atonement for you my son is still in convulsions etc. to teach you that they looked upon the purity of their vessels as a graver matter than bloodshed the scholars in the academy asked this question was it that bloodshed became a minor matter to them whereas the purity of their vessels remained in its original importance or did bloodshed concern them as before but the purity of the vessels became for them of a still graver concern come and here because the Talmud deduces and also innocent blood did Manasseh shed that indicates that bloodshed had become a matter of smaller concern to them. Whilst the purity of the vessels retained its original importance our rabbis taught and he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes from this I might learn even as on the day of atonement so that he put off his holy garments and put on profane garments to teach us the true law it says and he shall put off his garments and put on other garments thus comparing the garments he put on with the garments he put off just as the former are holy garments so are the latter holy garments if so what does the word other teach they shall be inferior to the former our Eliezer said the words other and he shall carry forth indicate that priests afflicted with the blemish are permitted to carry forth the ashes the master said other garments i.e. inferior to the former as the school of our Ishmael taught for the school of
The opinion of Arjuna Ardosa says that means to include the rule that the four white garments worn by the high priest on the day of atonement may be worn by the common priest during the remainder of the year. Rabbi said there are two refutations to this matter. One, the girdle of the high priest is different from that of the common priest. Two shall garments used at a service of solemn holiness be worn at a service of lesser holiness, but what rather is the significance of Yilbash Talmud? Masuma, it includes worn out garments and he shall leave them there that teaches that they must be hidden away. Ardosa says they are fit for use by a common priest. What does and he shall leave them there intimate that he the high priest must not use them on another day of atonement. Now would you not say that this is a subject of their dispute that one holds it the removal of the ashes to be a service and the other does not consider it such no everybody agrees it is a service the point. Of dispute here is this one says another scriptural passage is necessary to include also for the service the four garments the other no such passage is necessary are asked how much of the ashes of the altar is to be removed shall we infer the quantity from the taking off of the tithe or from what was taken off from the spoil of Midian come and here for our high taught here the word harem he shall take up is used and there the expression we harem and he shall take up is used just as in the latter case it means taking a handful so in the former case it means taking a handful rap said there are four services for the performance of which a non-priest stranger incurs penalty of death sprinkling smoking the fat the water libation and the libation of one levi says also the removal of the ashes thus did levi also teach us in his buried also the removal of the ashes what is the reason for rap's view it is written and thou and thy sons with thee shall keep the priesthood in everything that pertaineth to the altar and to that within the veil, and ye shall serve, I give you the priesthood as a service of gift, and the common man that draweth nigh shall be put to death a service of gift, but not a service of removal, and you shall serve, I a complete service, not a service followed by another, and Levi the divine law included it in saying, in everything that pertaineth to the altar and rab that is meant to include the seven sprinklings within and those concerning the leper and Levi, he infers these from the fact that instead of the thing is written everything that pertaineth and rab, he does not infer aught from everything, but say this in everything that pertaineth to the altar is a general proposition, service of gift is a specification. Now, if a general proposition is followed by a specification, the scope of the proposition is limited by the specification, hence the service of gift would be included, but a service of removal would be excluded. The Scriptural text reads Talmud, Mas be and to that within the veil and you shall survive only within the veil is the service of gift included but not the service of removal away but outside the temple even a service of removal is included but one could similarly argue with regard to the exposition of you shall serve only within the veil is a complete service included but not one service which is followed by another service but outside even a service followed by another is also included scripture by saying and ye shall serve has reconnected them Rabbah asked what is the law regarding a service of removal within the temple do we compare it with a service of removal within the veil or with one outside the temple then he answered the question himself it is to be compared to a removal service within the veil for scripture instead of within says and to that within the veil but then should the common man who arranged the shoe bread table be Guilty there is the arrangement of the censor of frankincense then if he arranges the censors let him incur the penalty there is the removal of the censors and the smoking of the incense let the common man who put the candlestick in order incur the penalty that is to be followed by the putting in of the wick then if he put the wick in let him incur the penalty there is the adding of the oil then if he puts the oil in let him incur the penalty there is the lighting then if he lights it let him incur the penalty lighting is not considered a service is it indeed not considered a service but it has been taught and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay wood in order upon the fire this teaches that the kindling of the wood of the fig tree must be performed by a priest who is fit for service and with garments of ministration the kindling of the fig wood is considered service but not the lighting of the candlestick then let the common man who puts the pile of wood on the altar in order incur the penalty there is the arrangement of the two logs of wood then if you arrange the two logs of wood let him incur the penalty it is followed by the arranging of the limbs but R.C. had said in the name of Aryohan and a common man who arranged the two logs of wood incurred the penalty of death in this indeed there is division of opinion one holding the arrangement of the two logs of wood is a complete service the other holding that it is not a complete service there is a teaching in accord with Rab and there is a teaching in accord with Levi there is a teaching in accord with Rab these are the services for the performance of which a common man incurs penalty of death the sprinkling of the blood both within the temple and within the holy of holies and he who sprinkles the blood of the bird offered as a sin offering and he who wrings out the blood and who smokes the bird offered up as a burnt offering and he who makes it Libation of three logs of water or of wine there is a teaching in accord with Levi the services for the performance of which a common man incurs penalty of death are the removal of the ashes the seven sprinklings within the holy of holies and he who offers up on the altar a sacrifice whether fit or unfit there were four counts etc why do they decide by count you ask why as we have explained rather why did they decide by count once and again are Yohanan said to stir up the whole temple court as it is said we took sweet counsel together in the house of God we walked beraged with tumult what garments do they wear when taking account our said common garments are she's hate said sacred garments are nomin said common garments for if you were to say these garments were sacred there would be violent men who would serve by force are she's hate said sacred garments for if you were to say common garments it would happen that out of sheer love of the service they would perform it in Common clothes are nomin said on what ground do I hold my view because we have learned they delivered them to the temple sextons who stripped them of their garments and left them with their bridges only Talmud, Masyuma don't you agree that this refers to those who had obtained part in the day services by the count Arshis hate said no it refers to those who had not obtained part in the day service by the count thus also does it appear provable by logic for if it were to refer to those who were allotted part in the service by count how could it be stated that they left them the bridges only surely it has been taught once do we know that nothing may be put on before the bridges to teach us that it says and bridges of linen shall be on his flesh and the other this is no difficulty this is what it teaches whilst they still wore the common clothes they put on the holy bridges after that they removed the common clothes and left them with the holy bridges said Arshis hate. Whence do I hold my view from what has been taught the cell of the hewn stone was built in the style of a large basilica the count took place in the eastern side with the elder sitting in the west and the priest in the form of a spiral figure the officer came and took the mitre from the head of one of them one would know then that the count would start from him now if the thought should arise that the priest came to the count in common garment is there a mitre in common dress yes there is as Rab Judah or as some say our Samuel B. Judah reported a priest for whom his mother made a tunic could officiate therein at an individual not community service Abbe said we can infer from this the cell of hewn stone was situated half on holy ground half on non-holy ground that the cell had two doors one opening on holy ground the other opening on non-holy ground for if the thought should arise in you that the whole of it was on holy ground how could the elder sit to the west as not a Master said nobody could sit in the temple court except the kings of the house of David. Furthermore, if you could think that the whole cell was outside holy ground, how could the count take place on its eastern side? Is it not required in the house of God? We walked with the throng, and this would not be the house of God. Hence, the inference is valid. It is half on holy ground, half on non-holy ground. And if the thought should arise in you that the cell has but one door opening on holy ground, how could the elder sit to the west? And we have learned if the cells are built on non-holy ground and open on holy ground, the space within them is holy. And if the thought should arise in you that it opened into on holy ground, how could the count take place in the eastern part of the cell? Have we not learned if they are built on holy ground and open out on non-holy ground? Their space within is not holy. Hence, you must need say the cell had two doors, one opening on holy ground, the other on non-holy. Ground mission of the second count who should slaughter the daily regular offering who should sprinkle the blood who should remove the ashes from the inner altar who should remove the ashes from the candlestick who should take up to the ramp the limbs of the offering the head and the right hind leg the two four legs the tail and the left hind leg the breast and the throat the two flanks the inwards fine flour the cakes and the wine altogether thirteen priests obtained a task Ben Aze said before our Akiva in the name of Joshua the daily offering was offered up in the way it walks Amara the question was asked when they take the count do they do so for one service or for each individual task come and here four counts
receives the blood do we say that he who killed for if you were to say that the one who sprinkles the blood receives it perhaps in his enthusiasm he may not receive the whole blood or does the sprinkler receive it for if you were to say that he who kills the animal receives the blood occasionally a non-priest kills the animal come and hear Ben Cat and made twelve spigots for the labor so that his twelve brethren the priests who are occupied with the daily regular sacrifice may simultaneously wash their hands and feet now if you were to think that he who kills the animal also receives its blood there would be thirteen must we not therefore infer therefrom that he who sprinkles receives the blood this proves it or aha the son of Rabbah said to our ashi we have also learned thus he whose lot it was to slaughter it slaughtered it he whose lot it was to receive the blood received it and then he came to sprinkle it this proves it Ben Aze said before our Akiba etc our rabbis taught what is the way of its walking the head right hind leg breast and neck the two forelegs the two flanks the tail and the left hind leg our Jose says it was offered up in the order in which it is flayed which is the order of its being flayed the head the right hind leg the tail the left hind leg the two flanks the two forelegs the breast and the neck our Akiba says it was offered up in the order in which it was dissected which is the order of the dissection the head the right hind leg the two forelegs the Breast and the neck, the two flanks, the tail, and the left hind leg. Our Jose the Galilean says it was offered up in the order of its best parts, which is the order of its best parts. The head, the right hind leg, the breast and neck, the two flanks, the tail, and the left hind leg, and the two forelegs. But is it not written even every good piece of thigh and the shoulder that refers to a lean animal? Rabbi said both our Tana and our Jose the Galilean follow the order of quality of the meat, but one takes into consideration the size of the limbs, the other the fatness. Why does the head go together with the right hind leg? Because the head has many bones. One attaches the meaty hind leg to it. All agree at any rate that the head is offered up first. Whence do we derive this rule? Because it has been taught. Whence do we know that the head and the suet come before all other parts of the animal to teach us that it says he shall lay it in order with its head and its suet and as to the other. Suet Talmud, Masyuma, what does it signify? It has its meaning in accordance with what has been taught. How did he do it? He placed the suet upon the open throat and offered it up, thus that being done as a sign of respect for heaven, mission the third count novices come up and submit to the count for the incense. The fourth count novices and old priests who will take up the limbs from the ramp to the altar. Gemara and taught never did a man repeat that what is the reason because it enriches. Our Papa said to Abbe, why does the incense enrich? Would one say because scripture says they shall put incense before thee and soon after bless Lord his substance. If so, then a burnt offering should also enrich for there it is written also and whole burnt offering upon thine altar. He answered the second is frequent. The first not Rabbi said you will not find any rabbinical scholar giving decision who is not a descendant from the tribe of Levi or Isachar of Levi as it is written they shall teach. Jacob thy ordinances of Issachar as it is written and of the children of Issachar men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do but mention Judah too for it is written Judah is my lawgiver I am speaking only of those who make conclusions in accordance with the adopted practice are Yohanan said no count is arranged for the daily continual evening sacrifice but the priest who secured the task of offering the continual morning sacrifice also obtains the task of it. Evening sacrifice an objection was raised just as one arranges account for it in the morning so is account arranged for it in the evening that was taught in application to the incense but it has been taught just as one arranges account for it mask in the morning so does one arrange for it account in the evening read for it fem but it has been taught just as one arranges account for it mask in the morning so is account arranged for it mask in the evening and just as one arranges a Count for it fem in the morning so is account arranged for it fem in the evening our Samuel B. Isaac said here we refer to the Sabbath on which the divisions of the priests are relieved but on the original assumption there was a larger number of counts all came in the morning for the count to some it was allotted for the morning to others for the evening the fourth count novices and older priests etc our mission does not agree with the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob for we have learned he who brings the limbs up to the ramp also brings them up to the altar what principle are they disputing one holds in the multitude of the people is the king's glory whereas the other is of the opinion that the distribution of duties among too many is not good form in the abode of the Shechen Arabah said our Eliezer B. Jacob does not agree with the view of our Juden nor does the latter agree with the view of the former for if that were the case there would be too few counts and if you find a teacher who Teaches five counts Talmud, Masyuma B. Talmud, Masyuma B. He is in accord with neither our Eliezer B. Jacob nor with our Judah Mishnah. The continual offering was offered up by nine, ten, eleven, or twelve priests, neither by more than twelve nor by less than nine. How that the offering itself was brought up by nine at the feast of Sukkot when one carried a bottle of water, there were ten at dusk by eleven. The offering itself by nine, and two men who carried two logs of wood on it. Sabbath by eleven, the offering itself by nine, with two men holding in their hand the two censers of frankincense for the shoe bread, and on the Sabbath which fell during the feast of Sukkot, one man carried in his hand a bottle of water. Gemara Araba, or as some say, Rami B. or again as some say, are Yohanan said, the water libation on the feast of Sukkot is offered up only at the continual sacrifice of the morning. Whence is this to be inferred? Because the Mishnah teaches, and on the Sabbath. Which fell during the feast of Sukkot, one man carried in his hand a bottle of water. Now, if the thought could arise in you that also at the continual offering at dusk is the water of libation offered up, then it would also happen during the weekday. Or as she said, we also have learned thus. One said to the priest offering the libation, "Hold your hands up." For it happened once that he poured it upon his feet, and all the people stoned him with their citrons. This proves that it was taught. Our Simeon Bile said, "Whence do we know that at the continual offering of dusk two logs of wood were to be brought up by two priests? Because it is said, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall lay wood in order upon the fire if it has no bearing on the morning sacrifice. Because it is written, and the priest shall kindle wood on it every morning, and he shall lay the burnt offering in order upon it, make it bear on the dusk sacrifice. But perhaps they both refer to the morning sacrifice, the divine long joining do." It and do it again if that were intended the divine law should have said and he shall kindle wood and he shall kindle wood but if the divine law had stated and he shall kindle wood I would have assumed it may be done by one only not by two therefore we are taught that both one and two shall do so if that were intended the divine law should have stated he shall kindle wood and they shall kindle wood or he shall lay wood in order and they shall lay wood in order why the words he shall kindle and they shall lay in order that we infer from it as we have said above our high taught the second count at times affects thirteen priests at times fourteen fifteen or sixteen but has it not been taught at times seventeen that teaching is in accord not with our Eliezer B. Jacob but with our Judah M I S H N A H A Ram was offered by eleven the flesh by five the inwards the fine flower and the one by two each a bullock was offered by twenty four the head and right hind leg Head by one and the right hind leg by two priests the tail and left hind leg the tail by two and the left hind leg by two the breast and neck the breast by one and the neck by three the two forelegs by two the two flanks by two the inwards the fine flower and the one by three each this applies only to offerings of the community and private offerings however if a single priest wants to offer all he may do so but as to the flaying and dismembering of both communal and private offerings the same regulations apply Gemara Tana taught the law regarding the flaying and the dismembering is alike in both communal and private sacrifices in that they may be done by a non-priest Hezekiah said once do we know that the law regarding flaying and dismembering is alike with all sacrifices in that they may be done by a non-priest because it is written and the sons of Aaron the high priest shall put fire upon the altar i.e. priesthood is required for the putting of the fire Upon the altar, but not for the flaying and dismembering Talmud, Masyuma, but that passage is required for its own information. Our Shimai B. Ashi said, I found Abbe explaining it to his son, it was taught one shall kill, hence we infer that even a non priest may kill the sacrificial animal. But whence are you coming? Because scripture says, And thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priesthood in everything that pertaineth to the altar. I might have learned that even the killing must be done by priest alone, therefore it is written, And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and Aaron's sons. The priest shall present the blood, i.e., the work of the priesthood is commanded only from the receiving, presenting of the blood, and so on, and he shall
In order to exclude flaying and dismembering but say perhaps that this text is necessary for its own meaning dash in reality so what then is the purpose of the passage and the priest shall make the whole smoke upon the altar to exclude flaying and dismembering so that and the priest shall offer the whole refers to the bringing up of the limbs to the ramp only the bringing up of the limbs to the ramp requires a priest but not the bringing of the two logs of wood to the ramp implying that the putting in order of the two logs of wood that does require the services of a priest and the words and they shall put have immediate text meaning the words and they shall lay in order the pieces indicated must be two the words of sons of Aaron also indicate two the words of priests also indicate two together we learn from them that the offering up of the lamb requires the services of six priests are Hamna said to our Eliezer it seems difficult for this passage refers to the young bullock the service in connection with which required 24 priests but he found it right again for scripture says upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar now what thing is it in connection with which wood fire and altar are mentioned Talmud, Masyuma B say it is the lamb R.C. said in the name of our Yohanan and non-priest who laid the pile of wood in order on the altar incurs the penalty of death what should he do post facto let him break it up and then put it in order. Again what is the good of that rather let the non-priest break it up again and let a priest put it in order afterwards R.Z.E.I.R.A. demurred to this but is there not a service which may be performed also at night and which a non-priest would render invalid surely there is the smoking of the limbs and the fat pieces that is but the conclusion of the service of the day but there is the removing of the ashes that is the beginning of the work of the day as R.C. has reported in the name of our Yohanan. If he has sanctified his hands by washing in the morning for the removal of the ashes, he need not sanctify them on the morrow, for he has already sanctified them from the beginning of the service. But the difficulty remains if the statement was made, it was stated thus R.C. said in the name of our Yohanan, a non priest who laid the two logs of wood in order incurs the penalty of death because this is a day service. Rabba demurred to this if so, account should be required for it and escaped him. What had been taught he who secured the task of clearing the ashes off the altar thereby also secured the task of putting in order the pile of wood and the two logs of wood. Shall we then say that only service performed during the day requires the count, but service performed during the night does not require the count? Surely there is the smoking of the members and the fat pieces that is the end of the service of the day, but there is the removal of the ashes that is due to a certain event. Shall we say that only for service performed during the day and for participation in which a non-priest incurs the penalty of death a count is required but that wherever a non-priest does not incur penalty of death for performance of a service no count is required but then what of the killing of the animal it is different with the killing because that is the beginning of the service Marzitra or Arashi said but we have learned otherwise the officer said to them go forth and see if the time for the killing of the continual morning sacrifice has arrived but he is not teaching about the laying in order of the two logs of wood it speaks only of such things as cannot be remedied again but not such for which there is a remedy some say this is what Rzeira asked is there any service followed by another service which would be invalidated if performed by a non-priest Talmud, Masyuma surely there is the smoking of the limbs and fat pieces that is the end of the service of the day. But what of the removal of the ashes it is the beginning of the service of the day for our Yohanan said if he sanctified his hands by washing for the removal of the ashes in the morning he need not sanctify his hands since he had already sanctified them at the beginning of the service if so the difficulty remains rather if the statement was made it was made thus R.C. said in the name of our Yohanan if a non-priest arranged in order two logs of wood on the altar he incurs the penalty of death because it is a complete service to this Rabba demurred if this is so let it require a count but it requires no count surely it was taught he who secures the privilege in respect of the removal of the ashes secures also the privilege in respect of the arranging of the two logs of wood this is what he means it should have a separate count for itself the reason is as we have already stated are we to say that for a service which is complete and for the performance of which a non-priest Incurs the penalty of death, a count is required, but for one for performance of which a non priest does not incur such penalty, no count is required, but there is the killing of the sacrificial animal, it is different with that killing because it is the beginning of the service of the day. Shall we say that only a complete service requires a count, but a service followed by another does not require it, but there is the smoking of the members and the fat pieces that is the end of the service of the day, but there is the removal of the ashes here, the count is due because of what happened. Marzitra or Arashi said, We too have learned, thus the officer said to them, Go forth and said whether the time for the killing of the morning sacrifice has arrived, but he does not teach anything about the time for the laying in order of the two logs of wood, he teaches only concerning such things as cannot be remedied again, but not concerning such for which there is a remedy. The officer said to them, Go forth and see whether the time for killing of the morning sacrifice has arrived. If it had arrived, then he who saw it said, It is daylight. Matthew B. Samuel said, The whole east is a light, even unto Hebron. And he answered, Yes. And why was that considered necessary? Because once when the light of the moon rose, they thought that the east was a light and slaughtered the continual offering, which afterwards they had to take away into the place of burning. The high priest was led down to the place of immersion. This was the rule in the temple. Whosoever crossed his feet required an immersion, and whosoever made water required sanctification by washing his hands and feet. Gemara Talmud. Masyuma B. It was taught. Ar Ishmael said, The morning star shines. Ar Akiva said, The morning star rose. Naomi B. Akashin said, The morning star is already in Hebron. Matthew B. Samuel, the officer in charge of the count, said, The whole east, even unto Hebron, is a light. Ar Judah B. Bithera. Said the whole east even unto Hebron is a light, and all the people have gone forth each to his work. If that were the case, it would be too much of the day too late. Rather, each to hire working men. Our Safra said the afternoon prayer of Abraham is due when the walls begin to grow dark. Our Joseph said, Shall we indeed learn our laws from Abraham? Rob answered, Atana learned it from Abraham, and we should not learn from him, for it has been taught, and in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. This passage teaches that the whole of the eighth day is proper for the circumcision, but the zealots perform their religious duty as early as possible, as it is said, and Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his ass. Rather, said Rob, Is it this that appeared difficult to our Joseph? For we have learned if the eve of Passover falls on the eve of Sabbath, the Paschal lamb is to be slaughtered at one half after the sixth hour and offered up at one half after the seventh hour. But let it be slaughtered when the walls begin to grow dark. What is the difficulty? Perhaps the walls of the sanctuary begin to grow dark half an hour after the sixth hour because they were not exactly straight, or one might say it was different with Abraham, whose heart mind knew great astronomical speculation, or because he was an elder Zakan who had a seat at the scholars' council for Arham of Behanna said our ancestors were never left without the scholars' council in Egypt. They had the scholars' council as it is said, go and gather the elders of Israel together in the wilderness. They had the scholars' council as it is said, gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel. Our father Abraham was an elder and a member of the scholars' council as it is said, and Abraham was Zakan, an elder well stricken in age. Our father Isaac was an elder and a member of the scholars' council as it is said, and it came to pass when Isaac was an elder Zakan, our father Jacob was an elder and a Member of the scholars' council, as it is said, now the eyes of Israel were dim with age. So can even Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, was an elder and a member of the scholars' council, as it is said. And Abraham said unto his servant, the elder of his house, that ruled over all he had, which our Eliezer explained to mean that he ruled over new controlled the Torah of his master Eliezer of Damascus. Our Eliezer said he was so called because he drew and gave drink to others of his master's teachings. Rab said our father Abraham kept the whole Torah, as it is said, because that Abraham here came to my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Our Shimei Bihai said to Rab, say perhaps that this refers to the seven laws. Surely there was also that of circumcision, and say that it refers to the seven laws and circumcision, and not to the whole Torah. If that were so, why does Scripture say my commandments and my laws? Rab or Arashi said Abraham, our father kept even the law. Concerning the Arab of the dishes, as it is said, my Torah is one being the written Torah, the other the oral Torah, Matthew B. Samuel said, etc. And he answered, Yes, who was it that said, Yes, the man standing on the roof is he the dreamer, and the interpreter should it then
Dazzling sunlight is worse than the uncovered sun urine algae being drippings from the roof Talmud. Moss Yuma unchanged asked imagination is more injurious than the sin itself urine algae being the odor of meat the end of the summer is more trying than the summer itself urine algae being a hot oven a fever in winter is severer than in summer urine algae being a cold oven it is harder to remember well something old than to commit to memory a fresh thing urine algae being a cement made out of Old cement are about said what is the reason of Rabbi's opinion it is written for the leader upon Ijlat Hashahar just as the antlers of the hind branch off this way and that way so the light of the dawn is scattered in all directions are Zara said why was Esther compared to a hind to tell you that just as a hind has a narrow womb and is desirable to her mate at all times as at the first time so was Esther precious to King Ahasuerus at all times as at the first time R.C. said why was Esther compared to the dawn to tell you that just as the dawn is the end of the whole night so is the story of Esther the end of all the miracles but there is Hanukkah we refer to those included in scripture that will be right according to the opinion that Esther was meant to be written but what can be said according to him who held that it was not meant to be written he could bring it in accord with what our Benjamin B. Japheth said for our Eliezer said in the name of our Benjamin B. Japheth why is the prayer of the righteous compared to a hind to tell you that just as with the hind as long as it grows its antlers form additional branches every year so with the righteous the longer they abide in prayer the more will their prayer be heard they slaughtered the continual offering when would you say on one of the remaining days of the year had it then to be offered up hence you will say that it happened on the day of atonement but is there any moonlight visible then this is what it means on the day of atonement when the observer said it is daylight they would take the high priest down to the place of the merchant the father of our learned not only concerning this was it said but also concerning the pinching of a bird's head and the taking of a fistful of the meal offering was it said that if it was done during the night it had to be burnt that is quite right with regard to the bird designated for a burnt offering since the fact can no more be undone but touching the fistful of the meal offering Talmud, Mas Yuma B let him put it back and take it again when it is day he learned and explained that the vessels of ministration render what is in them sacred even outside of the proper time an objection was raised this is the rule whatsoever is offered up during the day becomes sanctified by day and whatsoever is offered up during the night becomes sanctified both by day and by night at any rate it is taught that whatsoever is offered up during the day becomes sanctified by day only and not by night it may not become sanctified enough to be offered up but it may become sanctified enough to be invalidated our zero raised an objection if he put in order the shoe bread and the frankincense clip after the sabbath and smokes the contents of the cups on the following sabbath it is invalid what should he do he should leave it for the coming sabbath for even if it stayed for many days on the table that does not matter but why it should be sanctified and invalidated Rabbi said he who raised the objection raised a valid one and the father of Arabin is also quoting a very but it is of the opinion that the night is not considered a wanting time the day however is so considered but when the night of Sabbath approaches let it then become at once sanctified and invalidated Rabbin said we assume that he removed it before then Marzitra or as some say Arashi said you may set the case even if he had not removed it before Sabbath Eve since however he had put it in order at variance with the regulation it is as if a monkey had laid it there this was the rule in the temple etc it is quite right that the feet must be washed because of squirtings but why must the hands be washed Arabi said this teaches us that it is Talmud Masyum the right thing to wipe off squirtings this supports the view of RMI who says a man must not go out with squirtings on his feet because he may appear as one that has his privy member cut off and he may thus cause he will talk against his children that they are bastards or papa said if there be excrement in its place he must not read the Shema how shall we imagine this case if to say that it is invisible that is self-evident if to say that it is not seen surely the Torah was not given to the ministering angels this has but reference to a situation in which it is obvious when he sits and invisible when he stands but what is the difference between this and one who has filth on his body for it has been stated where one who has filth on his body or whose hands are in a privy are who not permits the reading of the Shema and are his forbids it in its place filth is most execrable away from it it is less so our rabbis taught this is the halacha with regard to mealtime if a man goes forth to make water he washes his one hand and re-enters if he converse with his neighbor and waited diverting himself he washes both his hands again and re-enters when he washes his hands he should not wash them outside and enter because of the suspicion but he should enter sit at his accustomed place and wash his two hands there then pass the pitcher around the guests are his da said what we said refers to drinking but as to eating he may wash his hands outside and re-enter people know that he is fastidious of taste arnam and b isaac said i would do the same before drinking as people know me to be fastidious mission and no man even if he were clean could enter the temple court without having immersed himself five immersions and ten sanctifications did the high priest undergo on that day and all on holy ground in the purpose with the exception of this one alone a linen sheet was spread between him and the people Gamara ben Zoma was asked what is the purpose of this immersion he answered if one who moves from one holy place to another and from one place the entering of which an uncleanness involves Kareth to another place the entering of which an uncleanness involves Kareth requires immersion how much more shall he require a merchant who moves from profane ground into holy ground and from a place the entering of which an uncleanness does not involve Kareth to a place the entering of which an uncleanness involves Kareth our Judah said it is only an immersion required for the sake of uniformity so that he may remember if there is any uncleanness on him and abstain in what principle do they differ Talmud, Mas Yuma B as to whether the service is profaned according to Ben Zoma he profanes the service according to our Judah he does not but does he in accordance with Ben Zoma's view profane the service has it not been taught if a high priest did not immerse or sanctify himself between garment and garment or between service and service his service remains valid but if either a high priest or a common priest has not washed his hands and feet in the morning and then had officiated at a service that service is invalidated rather does the dispute concern the question is to whether he transgresses a positive command or not, Benzoma holding he transgresses a positive command, Arjuna that he does not, but does Arjuna hold this view? Has it not been taught a leper immerses himself and stands in the Nikonar gate? Arjuna said he does not need to immerse himself, for he has done so already on the evening before. This has its own reason as it was taught because he had immersed himself on the eve before. What does he ask? Who asks this because he wants to raise another? Objection is why was it called the cell of the lepers? Because lepers immerse themselves therein. Arjuna says not only of the lepers did they say this, but of every man who enters the temple court that is no difficulty. One statement refers to the case that he immersed himself, the other to the case that he did not, but if he did not immerse himself, he must await the setting of the sun. Rather, in both cases he is presumed to have immersed himself, but in the one case he is presumed to have. Cease to have his mind on the necessity of preventing defilement in the other he is presumed to have had his mind thereon all the time but if he ceased to have his mind on it he would need to be sprinkled on the third and the seventh day for our dust high be met unset in the name of our Yohanan wherever attention from the need to prevent uncleanness is diverted sprinkling on the third and the seventh day is required rather in both cases he is presumed not to have diverted the attention yet. There is no contradiction for in the one case he is presumed to have immersed himself for the purpose of entering the sanctuary in the other he is assumed to have done so without that purpose in mind or if you like say read not of lepers did they say this but of every man Rabbin has said Arjuna makes his statement only on behalf of the view of the rabbis as far as my view is concerned no leper needs another immersion but according to your opinion admit at least that this was said not of Lepers alone, but of all people and the rabbis, the leper is accustomed to his impurity. All others are unaccustomed to it. Shall we say that the rabbis who dispute with Arjuna are of the opinion of Benzoma, notwithstanding which they make reference to the leper to inform you of the far-reaching consequences of Arjuna's opinion? Or perhaps the difference in the case of the leper lies in the fact that he is accustomed to the uncleanness. He answered, "It is different with the leper because he is accustomed to his uncleanness." Said Abay to Arjuna, "With an intervening object, Talmud, Masyuma, render this immersion invalid or not?" He replied, "Whatever the rabbis ordained, they endowed with the authority of the law of the Torah." Said Abay to Arjuna, "Is a partial entrance of the sanctuary considered an entrance or not?" He answered, "The thumb and toe will prove that for there
The side of his private cell Abbe said we infer therefrom that the Antam well was at least 23 cubits above the ground of the temple court for we have learned all the doorways there were 20 cubits in high 10 cubits in breadth with the exception of that of the hall and it was taught and he shall bathe all his flesh in water i.e. in the waters of Amiqua in water which covers his whole body what is its quantity 1 cubit square 3 cubits high and the sages have calculated that the required quantity for the contents of Amiqua is 40 se Talmud, Mas Yumabi, but there is also 1 cubit of the ceiling and 1 cubit of the flooring since the gates of the sanctuary are made of marble these were made of a small thickness but there is some additional thickness however small since it is not even as much as a cubit he does not count it the linen sheet was spread between him and the people while linen as Arkahana said elsewhere so that he may perceive that the service of the day is to be performed in garments of linen thus here too it is that he might perceive that the service of the day is to be performed in garments of linen Mishnah he stripped off his garments went down and immersed himself came up and dried himself they brought him the golden garments he put them on and sanctified his hands and feet they brought him the continual offering he made the required cut and someone else finished it for him he received the blood and sprinkled it he went inside to smoke the incense of the morning and to trim the lamps afterwards to offer up the head and the limbs and the pancakes and the wine offering the morning incense was offered up between the blood and the limbs the afternoon incense between the limbs and the drink offerings if the high priest was either old or of delicate health warm water would be prepared for him and poured into the cold to mitigate its coldness Kamara the scholar said in the presence of our Papathus. Mishnah is not in accord with our Meir for if it were in accord with him behold he said there must be two sanctifications for the putting on of the garments hence there ought to be here two two sanctifications for the putting on of the garments our Papa said unto them whether on the view of the sages or of our Meir one sanctification is for the stripping off of the holy garments and one for the putting on and the reason of their dispute is the interpretation of these words he shall put off he shall bathe and he shall put on our Meir holds that scripture compares the stripping to the putting on of the garments i.e. just as in the case of the putting on of the garments he first puts them on and only afterwards sanctifies himself so also with the stripping off of the garments he first strips off and then sanctifies himself whereas the rabbis hold that scripture compares the stripping off to the putting on i.e. just as with the putting on he sanctifies himself whilst dressed in the Garments so with the stripping off he sanctifies himself whilst the garments are yet on him said the scholars to our papa how can you say so has it not been taught a sheet of linen was spread between him and the people he stripped off his garments went down immersed himself came up and dried himself one brought the golden garments before him he put them on and sanctified his hands and his feet our mayor said he stripped off his garments and sanctified his hands and his feet went down and immersed himself came up and dried himself one brought the golden garments before him he put them on and sanctified his hands and feet he answered them if there is such teaching it is a teaching to be recognized according to our mayor it is right because we thus account for the Talmud Masyuma attend sanctifications but according to the rabbis there are only nine the rabbis will answer you the last sanctification is made when he strips off the holy garments and puts on the profane ones are Rabbis taught and Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting for what purpose does he enter for no other purpose than that of taking out the censer and the coal pan the whole portion being reported in right order with the exception of this passage for what reason Arhista said there is a tradition five immersions and ten sanctifications did the high priest undergo on that day if he had performed them in the order mentioned in the scriptures there could have been no more than three immersions and six sanctifications it was taught Arjuna said once do we know of the five immersions and ten sanctifications which the high priest had to undergo on that day to teach us that it is said and Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall put off the linen garments and he shall wash his flesh in water in a holy place and put on his other vestments and come forth and offer his burnt offering thus you infer that whenever one changes from one service to another an immersion is required. Rabbi said once do we know that the high priest had to undergo five immersions and ten sanctifications on that day because it is said he shall put on the holy linen tunic and he shall have the linen bridges upon his flesh and shall be girded with the linen girdle and with the linen mitre shall he be attired there are the holy garments and he shall bathe his flesh in water and put them on hence you learn that whosoever changes from service to service requires an immersion moreover it says they are the holy garments thus putting all the garments on the same level now there are five services the continual offering of done performed in the golden garments the service of the day the day of atonement in linen garments of his high priest and the people's ram in the golden garments the taking out of the censer and coal pan in white garments the continual evening offering in the golden garments whence do we know that every immersion required two sanctifications for it is Written and he shall put off and he shall wash and he shall wash and he shall put on our Eliezer B. Simeon said this can be inferred a minori ad majus if in a case where no immersion is required sanctification is yet required how much more in a place in which immersion is required is sanctification also required but perhaps let us also infer that as there only one sanctification is required here too one only would be necessary therefore scripture says and Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall put off the linen garments which he put on what is the meaning of which he put on does not a man put off but that which he did put on rather are these superfluous words written to put the putting off on the same level with the putting on of the garments just as the putting on of the garments requires sanctification so does the putting off of the garments require it the master said Arjuna said once do we know of the five immersions and ten sanctifications which the high priest had to undergo on that day to teach us that scripture says and Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall wash his flesh in water in the holy place thus you infer that whenever one changes from one service to another an immersion is required we found this rule for the change from the white garments to the golden ones once do we know that it also applies for the change from the golden to the linen ones Talmud Masyuma be the school of our Ishmael taught that can be inferred a minority of the golden garments in which the high priest does not enter the holy of holies require immersion how much more do the linen garments in which he enters the holy of holies require it but this argument can be demolished the case of the golden garments is different because much atonement is obtained in them rather he infers it from what rabbi said the master said rabbi said once do we know of the five immersions and the ten sanctifications which the high priest had to Undergo on that day to teach us that it is said he shall put on the holy linen tunic. Hence you learn that whosoever changes from service to service requires an immersion. We have found that required for a change from the golden to the white garments. Whence do we know that the same rule obtains for a change from the white to the golden garments? The school of our Ishmael taught that can be inferred a minority of the white garments in which but little atonement is obtained require an immersion. How much more will the golden garments in which much atonement is obtained require it? This argument can be demolished. The case of the white garments is different because the high priest dressed in them enters the holy of holies. It is for this reason that you rabbi in this statement teaches and it also says they are the holy garments and he shall bathe his flesh in water and put them on. Now there are five services that of the continual afternoon offering performed in the golden garments. Service of the day in white garments, the offering up of his and the people's ram in the golden garments, the taking out of the censer and coal pan in white garments, and the continual offering at dusk in the golden garments. And whence do we know that every immersion requires two sanctifications to teach us that scripture says, and he shall put off, and he shall wash, and he shall wash, and he shall put on. But this passage refers to the immersion since it has no reference to the immersion the requirement of which we infer from the air the holy garments apply it to the sanctifications. Then the divine law should have written the term of sanctification. Scripture chooses that term to let us know that immersion is even as sanctification, i.e., just as immersion must take place on holy ground, so must sanctification take place on holy ground. Whence does our Judah infer that the sanctification must take place on holy ground? He infers it from the teaching of our Eliezer son. Of our Simeon Arhista said Rabbi's view excludes that of our Meir and that of the Rabbis it excludes that of the Rabbis for according to them he sanctifies himself first while he is still dressed whereas Rabbi holds that he sanctifies himself after he is stripped and it also excludes the view of our Meir for our Meir holds that the second sanctification takes place when he is already dressed whereas according to Rabbi he sanctifies himself while still stripped of the garments our Ahabi Jacob said. All agree that at the second sanctification he first dons the garments and then sanctifies himself what is the reason because scripture said or when they come near to the
Someone else finished it for him, you received the blood and sprinkled it. One might assume if another one did not complete the killing for him, it would be invalid. You say that one could assume that if the other did not complete the killing for him, it would be invalid, then it would mean that the service is performed by someone else, and we have learned all the services of the Day of Atonement are valid only if performed by him, the high priest. Rather, this is what he says one might have assumed. That it shall be considered invalidated by rabbinic ordinance Talmud, Masyuma. Therefore, we have learned the bigger part of an organ with a fowl, the bigger part of two organs with an animal. But since even by rabbinic ordinance it would be considered not invalidated, why does he, the other one, have to finish it? It is the proper thing, a command to finish it. Abbe related the order of the daily priestly functions in the name of tradition and in accordance with Abbas all the large pile. Comes before the second pile for the incense. The second pile for the incense comes before the laying in order of the two logs of wood. The laying in order of the two logs of wood precedes the removing of the ashes from the inner altar. The removing of the ashes from the inner altar precedes the trimming of the five lamps. The trimming of the five lamps precedes the blood of the continual offering. The blood of the continual offering precedes the trimming of the two lamps. The trimming of the two. Lamps precedes the incense, the incense precedes the limbs, the limbs come before the meal offering, the meal offering precedes the pancakes, the pancakes come before the drink offerings, the drink offerings precede the additional offerings, the additional offerings come before the frankincense censers, and the frankincense censers precede the continual afternoon offering as it is said, and he shall make smoke thereon the fat of the peace offerings, i.e. here with all the offerings are completed. The master said the great pile precedes the second pile for the incense, whence do we know that because it has been taught this is the law of the burnt offering, it is that which goeth up on its firewood upon the altar all night. This passage refers to the great pile and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning thereby. This refers to the second pile for the incense, but perhaps I should reverse it. It seems more logical that the great pile have preference because it brings more atonement on it. Contrary, the second pile is of greater value for it is introduced within the sanctuary. Nevertheless, the one which causes more atonement is of greater value. And if you like, say, if there be no wood found for the second pile, would one not bring it into the sanctuary from the great pile? The second pile for the incense precedes the laying in order of the two logs of wood. Whence do we know that because it is written, and the priest shall kindle wood upon it every morning, i.e., upon it, but not upon the other pile? Hence, we can infer that the other pile is arranged already, but the word upon it has its own text, meaning upon it is written twice. The laying in order of the two logs of wood precedes the removing of the ashes from the inner altar. Although touching the one, it is written in the morning, in the morning, and touching the other, it is also written in the morning, in the morning. Nevertheless, that which is preparatory to the incense burning has preference. What would be preparatory? According to their reply are the two logs of wood, but surely you said that the two logs of wood belong to the great pile. Our Jeremiah said it is a laying in order of the wood. Rabbanah said since he started with the laying in order of the wood, he completes it. Also, our Ashi said if he found no wood in the second pile, would he not bring it in from the great pile? And the removal of the ashes from the inner altar precedes the trimming of the five lamps. Why Abay said I know it by tradition, but I do not know the reason. Rabbanah said it is in accord with Reshlakish. For Reshlakish said one must not forego the occasion of performing a religious command. Talmud, Masyuma B. And as he the priest enters the Hikal sanctuary, he comes first upon the altar. For it was taught the table was to the north two and one half cubits away from the wall. The candlestick was to the south two and one half cubits away from the wall. The altar stood in the exact middle, extending somewhat outward, but let it stand. With them, since it is written and the candlestick over against the table, it is required that they see each other. Said Rabbah, from what Reshlaish said, we infer that it is forbidden to forego the arm in favor of the forehead. How shall he do it from the arm? He shall proceed to the forehead, and the trimming of the five lamps is to precede the blood of the continual offering, and the blood of the continual offering is to come before the trimming of the two lamps. What is the reason? Abay said, the phrases in the morning, in the morning, written in connection with the two logs of wood, which are not necessary. There, one applies to the trimming of the five lamps, which shall precede the blood of the continual offering. The other applies to the blood of the continual offering, which is to come before the trimming of the two lamps. One applies to the trimming of the five lamps, which should precede the blood of the continual offering. For here are three words: there are only two, and the other. Applies to the blood of the continual offering which should come before the trimming of the two lamps for although in each case there are two yet that which obtains atonement has preference are Papa said to have a but say perhaps that one is to be applied to the removing of the ashes of the inner altar which is to precede the blood of the continual offering for here are three words there but two and one applies to the blood of the continual offering that should come before the trimming of the five lamps for although in both cases there are but two the one that obtains atonement is to have preference if so what shall he interrupt it with it would be quite right according to Reshlakish who said the lamps were trimmed and after interruption trimmed again in order to keep the whole temple court animated but according to our Yohanan who interprets in the morning in the morning i.e. divided into two mornings what could be said said Rabbanah to our Ashi are the words in the morning in the morning. In connection with the wood at all superfluous, surely they are really necessary for their text, meaning the divine law saying that they should precede the second pile for the incense. He replied, Have we not explained upon it, but not upon the other pile, which indicated that the other must have been there already? Why does he trim the five lamps first? Let him trim the two lamps first, having started already. Let him do the bigger part, then let him trim six. Scripture says, When he draiseth the lamps, he shall burn it, and lamps is no less than two, and the trimming of the lamps is to come before the incense. For Scripture says, When he draiseth the lamps, and afterwards it says, He shall burn it, the incense, and the incense shall precede the limbs, for it was taught, Let that in connection with which it is said in the morning, in the morning precede that in connection with which Scripture said, Only in the morning once, and the limbs come before the meal offering, for it was taught once too. We know that nothing may precede the continual offering of the Don Talmud, Masyumah to teach us that it said and he shall lay the burnt offering in order upon it and Rabbah said the burnt offering means this is the first burnt offering and the meal offering shall precede the pancakes for scripture reads burnt offering and meal offering and the pancakes precede the drink offerings they too are considered a species of a meal offering and the drink offerings come before the additional offerings as is written the sacrifice and drink offerings and the additional sacrifices come before the frankincense censers but has it not been taught the frankincense censers come before the additional sacrifices this is a matter concerning which Tanaim are disputing of they said the view that the additional offerings precede the frankincense censer seems more logical for did you not say that the words in the morning in the morning imply that it is to receive preference before all Thus do the words on the day on the day indicate that it is to be offered up last in the day what is the reason of him who holds that the frankincense censers come before the additional offerings he infers it from the identical expression statute which occurs with the pancakes if he infers it hence let him do so complete here the words on the day on the day come in to intimate that day the frankincense censers are offered up last in the day the incense of the morning was offered up between the limbs and the drink offerings according to whom is this teaching if according to the rabbis it should come between the blood and the lamps if according to Abbas all it should come between the lamps and the limbs in truth it is in accord with the rabbis but he does not treat of the order here the incense of the afternoon was offered up between the smoking of the limbs and the drink offerings whence do we know these things are Yohanan said because scripture said is it Meal offering of the morning and as the drink offering thereof thou shalt present it i.e. just as with the meal offering of the morning the incense precedes the drink offering so also here the incense shall come before the drink offerings but then just as there the incense precedes the smoking of the limbs here too the incense should come before the limbs is it written as the limbs of the morning it is written as the meal offering of the morning which means as the meal offering of the morning but not as the smoking of the limbs of the morning are rabbis taught and the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of a hymn let him infer the need of a drink offering for the morning sacrifice from the evening sacrifice Talmud Masyuma be rabbi said for the evening sacrifice from the morning sacrifice it is quite right according to the rabbis for that is written specifically in connection with the continual offering of the evening but what is the ground of rabbi's statement Rabbi Biola said scripture said for the one lamb now which is a lamb in connection with which the word Yihad one is used say it is a lamb of the
People he sanctified his hands and his feet and stripped our mayor said he stripped sanctified his hands and his feet he went down and immersed himself came up and dried himself afterwards they brought him white garments he put them on and sanctified his hands and his feet in the morning he put on Pelusium linen worth 12 minus in the afternoon Indian linen worth 800 zoos these are the words of our mayor the sages say in the morning he put on garments worth 18 minus and in the afternoon garments worth 12 minus altogether 30 minus all that at the charge of the community and if he wanted to spend more of his own he could do so Talmud Masyum Agamara what does Perwamin our Joseph said Perwa is the name of a Persian makes they spread a sheet of business linen between him and the people why was it a business linen our Kahana said that he may perceive that the service of the day was to be performed in garments of business linen in the morning he put on Pelusium linen worth 18 minus does the Tana wish to teach us summing up this is what he teaches us one should spend neither more nor less than the sum total but it does not matter whether one spends less for the one or more for the other now everybody at any rate agrees that the garments for the morning are more important once do we know that Arhuna the son of Arlai said scripture said linen 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 i.e. the choicest linen Talmud Masyum be an objection was raised and they shall put on other garments and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments would you not say that other implies better garments no other implies inferior ones Arhuna be Judah or as some say our Samuel be Judah learned after the community service is over a priest for whom his mother made a tunic may put it on and perform their in private service provided he hands it over to the community is that not self-evident you might have said let us fear he may not hand it over Properly therefore he teaches us that we have no such fear they told about our Ishmael Bifabai that his mother made him a tunic worth 100 minus which he put on to officiate at a private service and then handed it over to the community they told about our Eliezer Biharsim that his mother made him a tunic worth 20,000 minus and his brethren the priests would not suffer him to put it on because he looked like one naked but how could it be transparent did not a master say the thread of the priestly garments was six times twisted Abbe said it was visible even as one shines through a glass cup our rabbis taught the poor the rich the sensual come before the heavenly court they say to the poor why have you not occupied yourself with the Torah if he says I was poor and worried about my sustenance they would say to him were you poor then Hillel it was reported about Hillel the elder that every day he used to work and earn one tropic half of which he would give to the guard at the house of learning the other half being spent for his food and for that of his family one day he found nothing to earn and the guard at the house of learning would not permit him to enter he climbed up and sat upon the window to hear the words of the living God from the mouth of Shemaiah and Abtalion they say that day was the eve of Sabbath in the winter solstice and snow fell down upon him from heaven when the dawn rose Shemaiah said to Abtalion brother Abtalion on every day this house is light and today it is dark is it perhaps a cloudy day they looked up and saw the figure of a man in the window they went up and found him covered by three cubits of snow they removed him bathed and anointed him and placed him opposite the fire and they said this man deserves that the Sabbath be profaned on his behalf to the rich man they said why have you not occupied yourself with the Torah if he said I was rich and occupied with my possessions they would say to him were you Perchance richer than our Eliezer it was reported about our Eliezer Biharsim that his father left him a thousand cities on the continent and over against that one thousand boats on the sea every day he would take a sack of flour on his shoulder and go from city to city and from province to province to study the Torah one day his servants found him and seized him for public service he said to them I beg of you let me go to study the Torah they said by the life of our Eliezer Biharsim we shall not let you go he gave them much money so that they let him go he had never seen them for he was sitting all day and night occupying himself with the Torah to the sensual person they would say why have you not occupied yourself with the Torah if he said I was beautiful and upset by sensual passion they would say to him were you perchance more beautiful than Joseph it was told of Joseph the virtuous that the wife of Potiphar every day endeavored to entice him with words the garments she put on for him in the morning she did not wear in the evening those she had put on in the evening she did not wear in the morning she said to him yield to me he said no she said I shall have you imprisoned he said the Lord releases the bound she said I shall bend thy proud stature he replied the Lord raises those who are bowed down she said I shall blind your eyes he replied the Lord opens the eyes of the blind she offered him a thousand talents of silver to make him yield to her to lie with her to be near her but he would not listen to her not to lie with her in this world not to be with her in the world to come thus the example of Hillel condemns the poor the example of our Eliezer Biharsim condemns the rich and Joseph the virtuous condemns the sensual Mishnah he came to his bullock and his bullock was standing between the hall and the altar its head to the south and its face to the west and the priest stood in the east with his face to the west and he pressed both his hands upon it and made confession and thus he would say O Lord I have done wrong I have transgressed I have sinned before the eye in my house O Lord forgive the wrongdoings the transgressions the sins which I have committed and transgressed and sinned before the eye in my house as it is written in the Torah of Moses thy servant for on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you from all your sins shall ye be clean before the Lord and they answered after him blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever Talmud Masyum Agamara whom did you hear saying that the place between hall and altar was considered north our Eliezer son of Arsimian for it was taught what is considered north from the northern wall of the altar up to the northern wall of the temple court and opposite the whole altar on the north this is the opinion of our Jose son of Arjuna our Eliezer son of Arsimian adds also the space between the hall and the altar rabbi adds also the space for the treading of the priests and the place for the trading of the Israelites within and all agree that from the inside of the knife cell it was illegitimate shall we then say that the mission is in accord with our Eliezer son of Arsimian but not with Rabbi you can even say that it is in accord with Rabbi for if he adds even to what our Jose son of Arjuda says will he not add to the space defined by our Eliezer B. Arsimian this is what we mean if it were in accord with Rabbi it could be placed anywhere in the whole temple court what then would you maintain that the mission is in accord with our Eliezer B. Arsimian but then it ought to be placed anywhere between altar and wall you must consequently say that the reason is to avoid the high priest getting tired thus also on the view of Rabbi the reason is to avoid the high priest getting tired its head to the south and its face to the west how is that possible Rabbi answered the priest turns its head but let him place it straight Abbe said we are afraid it might drop excrements our rabbis taught how does one press the hands on the head of the sacrifice the sacrifice stands to the north with its face to the west and he who presses the hands stands to the east with his face to the west and lays his two hands between the two horns of the sacrifice that nothing may intervene between him and the sacrifice and he makes confession with the sin offering he makes confession of the sin committed with the guilt offering of the guilt incurred with the burnt offering of the transgressions in connection with cleanings the forgotten sheep the corner of the field and the poor tithe these are the words of our Jose the Galilean our Akiva said a burnt offering is offered up exclusively for transgression of a positive command or of a prohibition transformed into a command in what do they differ our Jeremiah said Talmud Masyuma be they differ concerning the prohibition of carrying our Akiva holding it to be a proper prohibition whilst our Jose the Galilean does not consider it a proper prohibition Abbe said everybody agrees that the prohibition of carrion is a proper prohibition what they differ in is the laws touching thou shalt leave our Akiva holding thou shalt leave means from the very beginning whilst our Jose the Galilean holds it means now our rabbis taught how does he make confession I have done wrong I have transgressed I have sinned similarly in connection with the ego to be sent away scripture says and he shall confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions even in their sin similarly with Moses it says forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin these are the words of our Mayor the sages however say wrongs are deliberate misdeeds thus also does scripture say that soul shall be utterly cut off his wrong shall be upon him transgressions are rebellious deeds as it is said the king of Moab hath transgressed against me furthermore than did Libna transgress at the same time sins are inadvertent omissions as it is said if anyone shall sin through error should he then after having confessed the deliberate misdeeds and the rebellious deeds turn back and confess inadvertent omissions rather thus did he make confession I have sinned I have done wrong I have transgressed before the eye in my house etc thus also does scripture say in
Make atonement scripture speaks of atonement through words. You say it refers to atonement through words, but perhaps it refers to atonement obtained through sacrificial blood. I infer it thus here atonement is mentioned and their atonement is mentioned just as the atonement mentioned in connection with the goat is one through words. So the atonement mentioned with the bullet is one obtained through words. And if you wish to argue against it, then learn from an error and shall present it. Bullock for the sin offering which is for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house yet the bullock has not been slaughtered what does and if you wish to argue against it imply this and if you would say let us infer from the ego prepared within the temple the atonement of which is obtained through blood behold against that argument scripture says and he shall make atonement and the bullock has not been slaughtered yet Talmud, Masyuma once do we know that the confession starts with O here the expression atonement is used and there in connection with Mount Horeb the expression atonement is used hence the inference that just as it started there with O so must it start here with O once do we know that the name is to be pronounced here here the word atonement is used and in connection with the heifer whose neck is to be broken the word atonement is used hence the inference that just as there the name is pronounced so is it to be pronounced here. Abbe said it is quite right that we cannot make inference for Horeb from the heifer whose neck is to be broken because that is a past affair but why should one not infer for the heifer whose neck is to be broken from what happened at Mount Horeb and if you will say indeed so but have we not learned the priests say forgive thy people Israel but they mention nothing about oh this is a difficulty and they answered after him and was taught Rabbi said commenting on for I will proclaim the name of the Lord ascribe ye greatness unto our God Moses said to Israel when I mentioned the name of the Holy One blessed be he ascribe greatness unto him Hanani the son of the brother of our Joshua said commenting on the memory of the righteous shall be for a blessing the prophet said to Israel when I make reference to the righteous one of all the world say a blessing Mishnah he then went back to the east of the temple court to the north of the altar the deputy high priest at his right and it Head of the family ministering that week at his left there were two he goats and an urn containing two lots they were of boxwood Ben Gamal made them of gold and therefore he was praised Ben Kadan made twelve spigots for the labor for there had been before but two he also made a machine for the labor in order that its water should not become unfit by remaining overnight King Monabez had all the handles of all the vessels used on the day of atonement made of gold his mother Helena had a golden candlestick made over the door of the hikal she also had a golden tablet made on which the portion touching the suspected adulteress was inscribed Nikonar experienced miracles with his gates and his money was praised Gamara since the mission reads to the north of the altar one infers that the altar was not standing in the north whose opinion represents our mission the opinion of our Eliezer B. Jacob for it was taught northward before the Lord i.e. the north must be fully unoccupied this is the opinion of our Eliezer B. Jacob, but the first part of the mission is in accord with our Eliezer son of our Simeon. The whole of the mission is in accord with our Eliezer B. Jacob, but read there in the space between hall and altar. The deputy high priest at his right and the head of the family at his left. Rab Judah said, One who walks at his master's right hand is a bore, but we have learned the deputy high priest at his right and the head of the ministering family at his left. And furthermore, it was taught of three walking along the teacher should walk in the middle, the greater of his disciples to his right, the smaller one at his left. And thus do we find that of the three angels who came to visit Abraham, Michael went in the middle, Gabriel at his right, Raphael at his left. Our Samuel B. Papa interpreted the first saying before our Ada, it is wrong only if he the teacher be hidden by him, but has it not been taught one who walks in front of his teacher is a bore, one who walks behind him is. Arrogant it is assumed here that he turned sideways and there was a casket wherein there were two lots our rabbis taught with reference to an Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats lots i.e. made of any material one might have assumed that he should cast two lots on the head of each therefore scripture repeats one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel i.e. there is but one lot for the Lord and there is but one lot for Azazel one might have assumed that he shall give upon the head of each lot each for the Lord and for Azazel therefore scripture says one lot for the Lord i.e. there is but one lot for the Lord and but one lot for Azazel why then does scripture say he shall cast lots that means to say that they must be alike he must not make one of gold and the other of silver one large the other small lots means they may be made of any material but that is self-evident no it is necessary to state that as it was taught since we find that the high priest's front Plate had the name of the Lord inscribed thereon and was made of gold. I might have assumed that this too must be made of gold. Hence it says twice lot lot to include permission to make it of olive wood, nut wood, or boxwood. Ben Kadan made twelve spigots for the labor. Atanah taught in order that his twelve brethren, the priests who were occupied with the continual offering, may be able to sanctify their hands and feet simultaneously. Atanah taught in the morning when the labor was full. He sanctified his hands and feet from the upper spigot in the evening when the water was low. He sanctified his hands and feet from the lower spigot. He also made a machine for the labor. What machine was that? Abbe said a will which let it go down to the pit. King Monabaz made all the handles for the vessels, etc. He should have made the vessels themselves of gold. Talmud, Masyum Abbe said reference here is made to the handles of the knives. The following objection was raised. He also. Made of gold the base of the vessels, the rims of the vessels, the handles of the vessels, and the handles of the knives used on the day of atonement. Abbe explained these are the helps of axes and axes. His mother Helena made a candlestick of gold, etc. Atanah taught when the sun was shining, sparkling rays proceeded from it, and all knew then that the time had arrived for the reading of the morning Shema. An objection was raised. One who reads the Shema in the morning together with the linen of the priestly Mishmars or the Lamed Mayamet has not fulfilled his duty because the men of the Mishmar read it early and the men of the Mayamet read it too late. Abbe said it was for the rest of the people of Jerusalem. She also made a tablet. Do you not conclude from this that one may write a scroll for a child for practicing purposes? Resh Lakish said in the name of Arjane alphabetically an objection was raised whilst writing he looks onto the tablet and copies what is written on it. Tablet say he looks and writes as it is written on the tablet he raised this objection when he writes he looks and copies what is written on the tablet and what is written thereon and if some man have lain with thee if no man have lain with thee if thou hast gone aside and if thou hast not gone aside there it was written Talmud, Masyuma by sections Nikonar experienced miracles with his doors our rabbis taught what miracles happened to his doors it was reported that when Nikonar had gone to fetch doors from Alexandria of Egypt on his return to Gale arose in the sea to drown him thereupon they took one of his doors and cast it into the sea and yet the sea would not stop its rage when thereupon they prepared to cast the other into the sea he rose and clung to it saying cast me in with it they did so and the sea stopped immediately its raging he was deeply grieved about the other door as he arrived at the harbor of Akko it broke through and came up from under the sides of the boat others say a monster of the sea swallowed it and spat it out on the dry land touching the Solomon said the beams of our houses are cedars and our panels are barothim cypresses do not read barothim cypresses but brithium i.e. covenant of the sea therefore all the gates in the sanctuary were changed for golden ones with the exception of the Nicanor gates because of the miracles wrought with them but some say because the bronze of which they were made had a golden hue are Elizabeth. Jacob said it was Corinthian bronze which shone like gold Mishnah and these were mentioned to their shame they of the house of Garmu would not teach anything about the preparation of the shoebread they of the house of Aphthanas would not teach anything about the preparation of the incense Hygro son of the tribe of Levi knew a cadence in song but would not teach it Ben Kamzar would not teach anyone his art of writing concerning the former it is said the memory of the righteous shall be free. Blessing concerning the others, it is said, but the name of the wicked shall rock. Amara, our rabbis taught the house of Garmu was expert in preparing the shoe bread, but would not teach it. The sages sent for specialists from Alexandria of Egypt who knew how to bake as well as they, but they did not know how to take the loaves down from the oven as well as the former, for they were heating the oven from without and baked from within, whereas the latter heated the oven from within and baked from within, with the result that the bread of the latter became moldy, whereas the bread of the former did not grow moldy. When the sages heard that they quoted everyone that is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, and said, Let the house of Garmu return to their office, the sages sent for them, but they would not come, and they doubled their hire, and they came
Day 24 the sages said to them what reason did you have for not teaching your art they said they knew in our father's house that this house is going to be destroyed and they said perhaps an unworthy man will learn this art and will serve an idol therewith and for the following reason was their memory kept in honor never did a bride of their house go forth perfumed and when they married a woman from elsewhere they expressly forbade her to do so lest people say from the preparation of the incense they are perfuming themselves they did so to fulfill the command ye shall be clear before the Lord and before Israel it was taught our Ishmael said once I was walking on the way and I came upon one of their children's children and I said to him your forefathers sought to increase their glory and to reduce the glory of the creator now the glory of the creator is at its wanted place and he has reduced their glory our Akiva said our Ishmael Belugu related to me one day I and one of their descendants went to the field to gather herbs and I saw him crying and laughing I said to him why did you cry he answered I recall the glory of my ancestors and why did you laugh happily he replied because the holy one blessed be he will restore it to us and what caused you to remember he said there is smoke razor before me show it to me he said to me we are bound by oath not to show it to any person are you and Binuri said once I came upon an old man who had a scroll containing prescriptions for frankincense in his hand I asked him whence are you derived he said I come from the house of Abdon is what have you in your hand he replied a scroll containing prescriptions for frankincense show it to me he said as long as my father's house was alive they would not surrender it to anyone but now here it is but be very careful about it when I came and told thereof to our Akiva he said henceforth it is forbidden to speak of them in D.I.S.P. raise referring to this Benizay. Said by your name you will be called to your place you will be restored Talmud, Mas Yuma be and from what belongs to you will you be given no man can touch what is prepared for his fellow and one kingdom does not interfere with the other even to the extent of one hair's breadth I grow of the tribe of Levi etc. It was taught when he tuned his voice to a trill he would put his thumb into his mouth and place his finger on the division line between the two parts of the mustache so that his brethren the priests staggered backward with a sudden movement our rabbis taught Ben Kamsar would not teach anything about his art of writing it was said about him that he would take four pens between his fingers and if there was a word of four letters he would write it at once they said to him what reason have you for refusing to teach it all found an answer for their matter attitude Ben Kamsar could not find one concerning all former ones it is said the memory of the righteous shall be. For a blessing with regard to Ben Kamsar and his like it is said but the name of the wicked shall rot what is the meaning of but the name of the wicked shall rot our Eliezer said rottenness enters their names none name their children after them Robin raised an objection the story of Dog be Joseph whom his father left to his mother when he was a young child every day his mother would measure him by handbreadths and would give his extra weight in gold to the sanctuary and when the enemy prevailed she slaughtered him and ate him and concerning her Jeremiah lamented shall the women eat their fruit their children that are handled in the hands whereupon the Holy Spirit replied shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord see what happened to him our Eliezer said the righteous man is remembered by his own good deeds the wicked also by those of his fellow proof that the righteous is remembered by his own good deeds for it is written the memory of the righteous shall be for a blessing the wicked is remembered also by his associate s wickedness for it is written but the name of the wicked pl shall rot robin is said to one of the rabbis who expounded again before him once is the statement which the rabbis mentioned the memory of the righteous shall be for a blessing he replied it is a scriptural verse the memory of the righteous shall be for a blessing once in the torah may the teaching be derived from what is written shall i hide from abraham that which i am doing and it is there also written seeing that abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation he asked further once do we know this matter which the rabbis mentioned but the name of the wicked shall rot he replied it is a scriptural verse but the name of the wicked shall rot once in the torah may this teaching be derived from what is written and he moved his tent as far as sodom and it is written now the men of sodom were wicked and sinners Against the Lord exceedingly our Eliezer said a righteous man once lived between two wicked men and did not learn from their deeds a wicked man lived between two righteous men and did not learn from their ways the righteous who lived between two wicked men and did not learn from their wicked ways was Obadiah the wicked man living between two righteous men and not learning from their ways was Esau our Eliezer also said from the blessing of the righteous you can infer the curse for the wicked and from the curse of the wicked you may infer the blessing for the righteous from the blessing of the righteous you can infer the curse for the wicked as it is written for I have known him to the end that he may command and soon after that it is written and the Lord said verily the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great from the curse of the wicked you can infer the blessing for the righteous for it is written now the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners against the Lord exceedingly and the Lord Said unto Abram after that Lot was separated from him all the land which thou seest to thee will I give our Eliezer further said even for the sake of a single righteous man would this world have been created for it is said and God saw the light that it was for one who is good and good means but the righteous as it is said say of the righteous that he is a good one our Eliezer said also whoever forgets through neglect any part of his study causes his children to go into exile as it is said seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God I also will forget thy children are about said such a one is deprived of his greatness as it is said because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me or high be Abba said in the name of our Yohan and no righteous man dies out of this world before another like himself is created as it is said the sun also arises and the sun goeth down before the son of Eli said the son of Samuel of Ramadhan. Rose our high be Abba also said in the name of our Yohan and the Holy One blessed be he saw that the righteous are but few therefore he planted them throughout all generations as it is said for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them our high be Abba said also in the name of our Yohan and even for the sake of a single righteous man does the world endure as it is said but the righteous is the foundation of the world our high himself infers this from here he will keep it feet of his holy ones holy ones means many are not be Isaac said it is written his holy one our high be Abba said further in the name of our Yohan and when the majority of a man's years have passed without sin he will no more sin as it is said he will keep the feet of his holy ones in the school of Sheila it was taught that if the opportunity for sin has come to a man the first and the second time and he resisted he will never sin as it is said he will keep the feet of his holy ones Rush Lakish said what is the meaning of if it concerneth the scorners he scorneth them but unto the humble he giveth grace i.e. if a man comes to defile himself the doors are open to him but if he comes to purify himself he is held in the school of our Ishmael it was taught it is as when a man sells naphtha and bomb Talmud, Mas Yuma if a purchaser comes to measure naphtha he the shopkeeper says to him measure it out for yourself but to one who would measure out bomb he says wait till I measure together with you so that both I and you may become perfumed the school of our Ishmael taught sin dulls the heart of man as it is said neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them that ye should be defiled thereby read not we admit that you should be defiled but you them that you should become dull-hearted our rabbis taught neither shall you make yourselves unclean that you should be defiled thereby if a man defiles himself a little he becomes much defiled if he defile himself below he Becomes defiled from above if he defile himself in this world he becomes defiled in the world to come our rabbis taught sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy if a man sanctify himself a little he becomes much sanctified if he sanctify himself below he becomes sanctified from above if he sanctify himself in this world he becomes sanctified in the world to come chapterib mishnah he shook the urn and brought up the two lots on one was inscribed for the lord and on the other four as is all the deputy high priest was at his right hand ahead of the ministering family at his left if the lot having for the lord inscribed thereon came up in his right hand a deputy high priest would say to him sir high priest raise thy right hand and if the lot with the inscription for the lord came up in his left hand ahead of the family would say sir high priest raise thy left hand and he placed them on the two he goats and said a sin offering unto the lord our Ishmael said he did not need to say a sin offering but unto the Lord and they answered after him blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever tomorrow why was it necessary to shake the urn lest he take one intentionally Rabbah said the urn was of wood and profane and could hold no more than the two hands at its mouth Rabbah demurred to this it is quite right that its mouth could contain no more than his two hands i.e. to prevent his
Now on the left and during the same time the crimson colored strap would become white from that time on it would at times become white at others not also throughout those 40 years the western most light was shining from that time on it was now shining now failing also the fire of the pile of wood kept burning strong so that the priests did not have to bring to the pile any other wood besides the two logs in order to fulfill the command about providing the wood unintermittently from that time on it would occasionally keep burning strongly at other times not so that the priests could not do without bringing throughout the day wood for the pile on the altar during the whole period of blessing was bestowed upon the omer the two breads and the shoe bread so that every priest who obtained a piece thereof as big as an olive and became satisfied with some eating thereof and even leaving something over from that time on a curse was sent upon omer two breads and shoe bread so that every priest received a piece as small as a bean the well-bred ones were through their hands from it whilst voracious folk took and devoured it once one of the latter grabbed his portion as well as that of his fellow wherefore they would call him Ben Talmud, Mas Yuma Behams and Grasper until his dying day Rabbi B. Arshila said what scriptural basis is there for this appellation oh my god rescue me out of the hand of the wicked out of the grasp of the unrighteous and homey ruthless man. Rabbi said from here is the basis obtained learn to do well seek justice strengthen Hamas the oppressed i.e. strengthen him Hamas who is oppressed but strengthen not homey the oppressor our rabbis taught in the year in which Simeon the righteous died he foretold them that he would die they said whence do you know that he replied on every day of atonement an old man dressed in white wrapped in white would join me entering the holy of holies and leaving it with me but today I was joined. By an old man dressed in black wrapped in black who entered but did not leave with me after the festival of Sukkot he was sick for seven days and then died his brethren that year the priests forbore to mention the ineffable name in pronouncing the priestly blessing our rabbis taught during the last forty years before the destruction of the temple the law for the Lord did not come up in the right hand nor did the crimson colored strap become white nor did the western most light shine. And the doors of the Hikal would open by themselves until our Yohan and Bizakai rebuked them saying Hikal Hikal why wilt thou be the alarm of thyself I know about thee that thou wilt be destroyed for Zechariah Benido has already prophesied concerning the open thy doors O Lebanon that the fire may devour thy cedars our Isaac B. Tabli said why is its name called Lebanon because it makes white the sins of Israel our Zitra B. Tobia said why is it called forest as it is written the house of the forest of Lebanon to tell you that just as a forest produces sprouts so does the temple for our Hosea said when Solomon built the sanctuary he planted therein all sorts of precious golden trees which brought forth fruit in their season when the wind blew against them their fruits would fall down as it is said may his fruit rustle like Lebanon they were a source of income for the priesthood but as soon as the idolaters entered they called they dried up as it is said and the flower of Lebanon languished at end. The Holy One blessed be he will restore it to us as it is said it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it our rabbis taught ten times did the high priest pronounce the ineffable name on that day three times at the first confession thrice at the second confession thrice in connection with the ego to be sent away and once in connection with the lots and it already happened that when he pronounced the name his voice was heard. Even unto Jericho Rabbi Barhanna said from Jerusalem to Jericho it is a distance of ten parsangs the turning hinges of the temple doors were heard throughout eight Sabbath limits the goats in Jericho used to sneeze because of the odor of the incense the women in Jericho did not have to perfume themselves because of the odor of the incense the bride in Jerusalem did not have to perfume herself because of the odor of the incense our Jose B. Digley said my father had goats on the mountains of Mikor and they used to sneeze because of the odor of the incense our high B. Avin said in the name of our Joshua B. Karha an old man told me once I walked towards Shiloh and I could smell the odor of the incense coming from its walls our Jan A said to bring the lot up out of the casket is indispensable but to place it on the bullock's head is not our Yohan and said even to bring up the lot is not indispensable on the opinion of our Judah who said that services performed in the white garments. Outside the Holy of Holies are not indispensable there is no dispute all agreeing that the bringing up of lots is not indispensable they dispute only the opinion of our Nehemiah he who says it is indispensable holds even as our Nehemiah does whereas the other who holds it is dispensable explains our Nehemiah to refer to an actual service whereas the casting of the lots is no service others say on the opinion of our Nehemiah who says it is indispensable there is no dispute all agreeing that it is indispensable the dispute touches only the opinion of our Judah he who holds it is dispensable agrees with our Judah whereas he who holds it is indispensable explains that it is different here because scripture repeats twice on which the law fell and objection was raised it is a command to cast the lots but if he has failed to do so the service is nevertheless valid now that will be quite right according to the version that none disputes that on our Judah's view it is dispensable so that this teaching is in accordance with our Judah Talmud, Mas Yuma, but according to the version that they are disputing on our Judah's view it would again be quite right according to him who holds it is dispensable for then the authority for this teaching would be our Judah but according to him who considers it indispensable the question is asked who will be the authority for this teaching read it is a command to place the lots on the bullock's head come and here it is a command to cast the lots and to make confession but if he had not cast the lots or made confession the service is valid and should you reply that here too you would read to place the lot on the bullock's head say then the second part our Simeon said if he has not cast the lots the service is still valid but if he has failed to make confession it is invalidated now what does if he has not cast the lots mean would you say it means he has not placed the lots this would imply would it not that our Simeon holds the casting of the lots is indispensable but surely it was taught if one of the two bullocks died he brings the other without new casting of lots these are the words of our Simeon our Simeon did not know what the sages meant with the phrase lowly grill and thus he said to them if by agrala you mean casting of the lots itself I dispute with you on one matter but if by agrala you mean the placing of the lots then I disagree with you on two counts come in here with regard to the sprinkling of the blood within the veil the regular service of the bullock is indispensable for the service of the ego to be valid but the regular service of the ego is not indispensable for the service of the bullock to be valid now it is quite right that the regular service of the bullock is indispensable for the ego e.g. if he performed the rites of the ego before those of the bullock he has done nothing but that the regular service of the ego is not indispensable to the bullock what does it mean would you say it means that if he sprinkled the blood of the bullock in the hikal before the sprinkling of the egoat within the veil but surely scripture says statute rather must you say it means that if he sprinkled the blood of the bullock within before the casting of the lots it is valid now since the order is not indispensable is it not to be inferred that the casting of the lots itself is not indispensable no it means that he made the sprinkling of the blood of the bullock on the altar before sprinkling the blood of the egoat in the hikal and this teaching is in accord with our Judah who says that anything done in the white garments outside the holy of holies is dispensable but does it not state with regard to the sprinklings within rather it is in accord with our Simeon who holds the casting of the lots is dispensable or if you like say still I say it is in accord with our Judah and although the order of the service is not indispensable it Casting of the lots is indispensable and they follow their own principle for it was taught Talmud, Mas Yuma be Talmud, Mas Yuma be with reference to it shall be set alive before the Lord to make atonement over him how long must it stay alive until the blood of its fellow sacrifice is sprinkled this is the opinion of our Judah our Simeon holds until the confession of sin wherein do they differ as it was taught to make atonement over him scripture speaks of atonement through blood thus does it. Also say and when he hath made an end to atoning for the holy place just as there it refers to atonement by blood so does it refer here to atonement by blood this is the opinion of our Judah our Simeon says to make atonement over him scripture speaks of atonement by words confession come and hear the disciples of our Akiva ask him if it the law for the Lord came up in the left hand may he turn it to the right he replied do not give all occasion for the Sadducees to rebel the reason then of his negative answer is so as not to give an occasion for the Sadducees to rebel but without that we would turn it yet you said that the casting of the lots is indispensable and since the left hand has determined its destination how can we turn it Rabbi answered this is what they said if the lot had come up in the left hand may one change it and he go to the right whereupon he answered give no occasion to the Sadducees
does sanctify how much more will the naming sanctify where the lot also does so sanctify therefore scripture says and offer him for a sin offering to intimate it is a lot which designates it a sin offering but the naming does not make it a sin offering Talmud, Mas Yuma now who's is the anonymous opinion in the Sifra Arjudas and he teaches the lot designates the sin offering and the naming does not make it a sin offering hence we see that the casting of the lots is indispensable this will be a refutation of the opinion that it is not indispensable it is a refutation Arhista said the special designation of the couples is made either by the owner or by the priest's action Arshai Mabi Ashi said what is the basis of Arhista's dictum because it is written she shall take for a burnt offering and, and the priest shall offer one as a sin offering i.e. the designation is made either at the owner's taking purchasing or at the offering up by the priest they raised it following objection and make it a sin offering i.e. the lot makes it a sin offering but the naming alone does not make it a sin offering for I might have assumed this could be inferred a minority if in a case where a lot does not sanctify the naming does how much more should the naming sanctify where the lot does therefore scripture says and make it for a sin offering to intimate it is a lot which makes it a sin offering but the naming does not make it a sin offering here it is neither the time of its purchase nor of its being offered and yet he states that it should designate Rabbah said this is what he said if in a case where the lot does not sanctify even at the time of the purchase and even at the time of the offering the naming does sanctify it at the time of either purchase or offering how much more shall the naming at either the time of purchase or of offering sanctify it in a case where the lot sanctifies outside the time of either purchase or offering therefore scripture says and make it a sin offering i.e. the lot makes it a sin offering but the naming does not make it a sin offering come and here if someone defiled the sanctuary whilst poor and put aside money for his burnt couple offering and afterwards became rich and said there upon this money be for the sin offering and that for the burnt offering he adds to the money for the sin offering to bring his obligatory offering but he may not add to his burnt offering to bring his obligatory offering now here it is neither the time of the purchase nor the time of the offering and yet he teaches that it is designated Arshis hate said how do you reason surely our Eliezer said in the name of our Hashai if someone defiled the sanctuary whilst rich and brought the offering of a poor person he has not done his duty now since he has not done his duty how could he have designated it must you not rather say that he had designated it when already poor thus here too the cases that he said it from the time when he Set the money aside, but according to our hack in the name of Arjusai, who said he has done his duty, Talmud, Masyuma be what is there to be said, do not read and said thereupon, but and thereupon he bought and said, but if thereupon he bought and it states he may add and bring his obligatory sacrifice, it must mean that he redeems the burnt offering, but surely a burnt offering may not be redeemed. Our Papa said, for instance, if he bought one single pigeon, if he bought it as a burnt offering, then he adds to the money for his sin offering, the money for his new obligatory sacrifice, the burnt offering of the bird becoming a free will offering, if he bought it as a sin offering, he may not add to the money for the burnt offering for the purchase of his new obligatory sacrifice, and that sin offering is left to perish. The text above states our Eliezer said in the name of our Hashai, if one defied the sanctuary whilst being rich and brought the offering prescribed for a poor person, he has not done his duty our hack in the name of our Josiah says he did perform it the following objection was raised if a poor leper brought the offering prescribed for a rich person he has performed his duty if a rich person brought the offering prescribed for a poor one he has not performed his duty there it is different because it is written this shall be the law of the leper if that is so then let it apply in the first part of the mission too surely the divine law includes that case through the word Torah law as it was taught the word Torah the law includes a poor leper who brought a rich leper sacrifice one might have assumed that even a rich leper who brought a poor leper sacrifice might be included so as to have performed his duty therefore it says this let us infer from it for one who defiled the sanctuary the divine law by saying and if he be poor excludes all but the leper mission he bound the thread of crimson wool on the head of the goat which was to be sent away and meantime he placed it at the gate once it was to be sent away and the ego that was to be slaughtered at the place of the slaughtering he came to his bullock a second time pressed his two hands upon it and made confession and thus he would say O Lord I have dealt wrongfully I have transgressed I have sinned before the eye in my house and the children of Aaron thy holy people O Lord pray forgive the wrongdoings the transgression and the sins which I have committed transgressed and sinned before the eye in my house and the children of Aaron thy holy people as it is written in the Torah of Moses thy servant for on this day atonement be made for you to cleanse you from all the sins shall yet be clean before the Lord and they responded blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever Gemara they raised the question and the ego that was to be slaughtered at the place of the slaughtering does this refer to the tying of the strap or to the placing of the animal come and here for our Joseph learned he bound a crimson colored strap on the head of the goat which was to be sent away and placed it against the gate once it was to be sent away and the goat which was to be slaughtered at the place where it was to be slaughtered lest they become mixed up one with the other or with others it will be quite right if you say it refers to the binding of the strap but if you say it refers to the placing of the animal granted that it would not be mixed up with its fellow goat because the one had a strap whilst the other had none but it could surely be mixed up with other goats hence we learn from here that it refers to the tying of the strap this proves it our Isaac said I have heard of two straps one in connection with the red heifer the other with the goat to be sent away one requiring a definite size the other not requiring it but I do not know which requires the size our Joseph said let us see it. Strap of the goat which required division hence also required a definite size whereas that of the heifer which does not need to be divided does not require a definite size either Rami Bihamad demurred to this that of the heifer also requires weight Rabbah said the matter of this weight is disputed by Tanaim but does the strap of the heifer not have to be divided against this Abbe raised the following objection how does he do it he wraps them together with the remnants of the strips of scarlet wool say with the tail of the strip our Hanin said in the name of Rabbi if the cedar wood and the scarlet thread were merely caught by the flame they are usable for the ceremony they raised the following objection if the strap caught fire another strap is brought and the water of lustration prepared Abbe said this is no contradiction one speaks of a flame which blazes up the other of one which is subdued Rabbah said concerning the weight of the heifer strap there is a division of Opinion among Tanaim for it was taught why does he wrap them together in order that they form together one bunch this is the opinion of Rabbi our Eliezer son of our Simeon says in order that they have sufficient weight to fall into the midst of the burning heifer when our Demi came from Palestine he said in the name of our Yohanan I heard of three different straps one that of the red heifer the other that of the ego to be sent away the third of the leper one having a weight of ten zoos. the other a weight of two cells the third a weight of one shekel and I do not know how to specify it when Rabin came he specified it in the name of our Jonathan Talmud Masyuma that of the heifer had the weight of ten zoos, that of the ego to be sent away had the weight of two cells and that of the leper weighed one shekel our Yohanan said about the strap used in connection with the heifer our Simeon be and the sages are disputing one saying it weighed ten shekels the other it Wait, but one shekel as a mnemotechnic sign used whether one gives much or one gives little our Jeremiah of 50 said to Rabbi they are not disputing in regard to the strap of the heifer but in regard to that of the ego to be sent away and on the day of their dispute died Rabbi of Bijishi and as a sign to remember this coincidence they uttered the death of the righteous Rabbi of Bijishi obtains atonement even as the ego to be sent away our Isaac said I heard of two slaughterings one of the red heifer the other of his bullock one being permissible to a lay Israelite the other being invalidated if performed by a lay Israelite and I do not know which is which it is reported concerning the slaughtering of the heifer and of his bullock there is a dispute between Rab and Samuel one holding the heifer to be invalidated if killed by a lay Israelite but that his bullock so slaughtered is fit while the other holds that his bullock is invalidated if a commoner killed but so killed the heifer is fit it may be ascertained that it is Rab who holds that the slaughtering of the heifer by a Israelite renders it invalid for our Zara said the slaughtering of the heifer by a Israelite is invalid and Rab said thereupon Eliezer and statute we learned in connection therewith but as for Rab wherefore the difference between the law and the case of the heifer because Eliezer and statute is written in connection therewith when also in connection with his bullock. Aaron and
Burning and if the divine law had written it only touching the burning one would have said attention is necessary there because just now the heifer is being made ready but during slaughtering no attention is necessary therefore it was necessary for the divine law to mention that too what does this exclude is it to say to exclude the gathering of its ashes and the drawing of the water for the putting in of the ashes Talmud, Mas Yuma be surely scripture says and it shall be kept. For the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of sprinkling rather it excludes the casting in of cedar wood hyssop and scarlet because they are not part of the heifer itself it was reported if the heifer was slaughtered by a lay Israelite RMI said it is valid or Isaac the Smith said it was invalid Ullah said it is valid whilst some there are who say that he said it was invalid or Joshua B. Abba raised an objection in support of Rabbi know only that the sprinkling of its water is not valid if performed by a woman as when done by a man and that it is valid only if done by day once do I know that the slaughtering of the heifer the reception of its blood the sprinkling of its blood the burning of the heifer and the casting into the burning heifer of cedar wood hyssop and scarlet may not be done by night to teach us that scripture said this is the statute of the law I might have assumed that this should include also the gathering of its ashes and the drawing of the water for the putting in of the ashes to teach us that scripture said this what causes you to include those and to exclude these since scripture both extends and limits say we shall infer everything from the regulations touching the sprinkling of its water just as the sprinkling of its water is not proper if done by a woman as it is if performed by a man and not valid except if done by day thus include also the slaughtering of the heifer the reception of its blood the sprinkling of its blood the burning of the heifer and the casting into the burning heifer of cedar wood hyssop and scarlet since these functions may not be performed by a woman so may they be performed only by day but I exclude the gathering of its ashes and the drawing of the water for the putting in of its ashes which since they may be performed by either man or woman hence may also be performed by night but how is this a refutation will you say that because the slaughtering is stated to be invalid if performed by a woman it must be invalid also if performed by a lay Israelite there would be as counterproof the sprinkling of its waters which whilst invalid if performed by a woman yet may be done by a lay Israelite said Abbe this is the refutation why is the woman excluded from the slaughtering because scripture said Eliezer implying but not a woman that must be applied to the lay Israelite also for the analog inference Eliezer the priest implies but not a lay Israelite Ulla said in that whole section of the red heifer there are texts implying an exception from a preceding implication and texts independent of preceding or following implications and ye shall give her unto Eliezer the priest implies only this one to Eliezer but not the heifers in later generations to Eliezer some say in later generations you shall give it to the high priest others in later generations to a common priest it is quite right according to him who holds that in later generations the heifer is to be handed over to a common priest but once does he infer who holds that in later generations it is to be given to the high priest he infers it from the identical word statute statute used also in connection with the day of atonement and he shall bring it forth implies that he must not bring forth another one with her as we have learned if the heifer refused to go forth one may not send a black one with her lest people say they slaughtered a black heifer nor may another red heifer be brought forth with her lest people say they slaughtered too. Our Jose said this comes not under this title but because it is written and he shall bring it forth it implies by itself and the anonymous first Tana surely wrote it who is this first Tana it is our Simeon who interprets the reason of biblical law what is the difference between them there is a difference Talmud, Mas Yuma if one should bring forth an ass with her and he shall slay it implies that one must not slaughter any other heifer with it before him implies according to Rab that he must not divert his attention from her according to Samuel that Eliezer may slaughter and Eliezer look on and Eliezer the priest shall take of its blood with his finger is written according to Samuel in order to refer it the right back to Eliezer according to Rab this is a limitation following a limitation and a double limitation serves to widen the scope is that even a common priest May do it and the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet is written according to Samuel that even a common priest may take and cast it according to rabbit is necessary to mention it for you might have thought and said since these things do not belong to the heifer itself they do not require any priest service therefore scripture informs us that they do then the priest shall wash his clothes implies in his priestly garments and the priest shall be unclean until the even implies that he shall be in his priestly garments even in future generations that will be quite right according to him who holds that the heifer ceremony will in future generations be performed by a common priest but according to him who holds that in future generations the heifer ceremony will be performed by the high priest now since a high priest is required is it necessary to state that he must be in his priestly garments yes scripture does occasionally take the trouble to mention Things which might have been inferred a menorah and a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up. A man is written to declare fit a lay Israelite that is clean to declare fit a woman and lay them up implies one who has understanding how to lay them up that excludes one deaf and dumb and idiot and a minor who have not the understanding of how to lay them up. We learned elsewhere all are fit to prepare the waters of lustration with the exception of the deaf and dumb the idiot and the minor are Judah declares fit a minor and disqualifies a woman and an hermaphrodite. What is the reason for the rabbi's view? Because it is written and for the unclean they shall take of the ashes of the burning of the purification from sin and put upon them running water in a vessel. I.e. they whom I declared unto the unfit for the gathering of the ashes I also declared unto the unfit for the preparation of the waters of lustration but they whom I declared fit to the for the gathering I have also declared unto thee fit for the preparation and what does our Judah say if that were so scripture should have said he shall take wilika what is the meaning of they shall take to intimate that even a minor whom I declared unto the unfit there is fit to act here once does he know that a woman is unfit because scripture says he shall put i.e. but not she shall put and the rabbis if the divine law had written he shall take he shall put one might have assumed the same man must both give and put therefore scripture wrote and they shall take and if the divine law had stated they shall take and also they shall put one might have assumed that there must be two to take and put therefore scripture wrote they shall take and he shall put to indicate that even if it is right to take the ashes and one puts the running water in a vessel and a clean man shall take his and cup it in the water and sprinkle according to the rabbis a man implies but not a woman clean is written to declare fit even a minor according to our Judah a man implies but not a minor clean to declare fit a woman an objection was raised all are qualified to sprinkle except one whose sex is unknown and hermaphrodite and a woman but a child that is without understanding a woman made in sprinkling Talmud Mas Yuma B and here our Judah does not dispute Abbe said since the master said that this chapter contains texts implying an exception from a preceding implication and texts independent of preceding or following implications he surely disputes and the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean clean implies that he was unclean before that informs us that a T is qualified to officiate at the heifer ceremony RC said when our Yohanan and Reshlakish engaged in investigating questions about the heifer they were unable to produce more than what a fox can bring up from a plowed field but they said this chapter contains Text implying an exception from a preceding implication and text independent of preceding or following implications Atana recited before Aryohan and all the slaughterings may be performed by a lay Israelite with the exception of that of the red heifer Aryohan and said to him go out and teach it in the street we do not find that slaughtering is disqualified if performed by a lay Israelite nor would Aryohan and not listen only to Atana in this matter he would not even listen to his own master for whereas Aryohan and said in the name of our Simeon Bij Hosadak the slaughtering of the heifer by a lay Israelite is invalid he added but I say it is valid for we do not find that slaughtering of sacrifices by a lay Israelite is invalid he came to his second bullock why is it that in the first confession he does not say and the children of Aaron thy holy people and in the second confession he mentions the children of Aaron thy holy people the school of our Ishmael taught common sense Dictates this it is better that one innocent obtained atonement for the guilty than that one guilty obtained atonement for the guilty mission he killed it the bullock and received its blood in a bowl and he gave it to the one who should stir it up on the fourth terrace within the sanctuary lest it congeal he took the coal pan and went up to the top of the altar clearing the coals to both sides took a panful of the glowing cinders from below came down and placed the coal pan on the fourth terrace. In the temple court on other days he would take out the cinders with a
Hence full every day it was fine but today the finest possible on other days the priests would go up on the east side of the ramp and come down on the west side today the high priest goes up in the middle and comes down in the middle Arjuna says the high priest always goes up in the middle and comes down in the middle on other days the high priest sanctified his hands and feet from the labor this day from the golden little Arjuna says the high priest always sanctifies his hands and feet from a golden little on other days there were four wood piles there today five says Armadir Arjuna says on other days three today four Arjuna says on other days two today three tomorrow but it is written and there shall be no man in the tent of meeting Arjuna said read of the Kala rabbis taught and there shall be no man in the tent of meeting Talmud Masuma one could assume not even in the temple court therefore it says in the tent of meeting I know this prohibition only for the tent of meeting in the wilderness whence do we know thereof for Shiloh and the everlasting sanctuary to teach us that scripture says in the holy place I know the prohibition only during the time of the smoking of the incense whence do I know that it applies also during the time of the sprinkling of the blood to teach us that scripture says until he come out and have made atonement for himself I know it only at the time of his entering whence do I learn at his coming forth to teach us that it says until he come out and he shall have made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of the house of Israel i.e. the atonement for himself precedes that for his household and the atonement for his household precedes that for his brethren the priests and the atonement for his brethren the priests precedes that for all the assembly of Israel the master said I know of the prohibition only for the time of the smoking of the incense how is this implied Rabbah and Thus also our Isaac be of Dimi and thus also our Eliezer said scripture says and he shall have made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of the house of Israel what atonement is there which obtains evenly for himself his household his brethren the priests and the whole assembly of the house of Israel it is the smoking of the incense but does the incense obtain atonement indeed for our Hanani cited we learned that the incense obtains atonement for what was said and he put on the incense and made atonement for the people and the school of our Ishmael taught why does incense obtain atonement for the sin of the evil tongue evil speech let that which is performed in secret come and obtain atonement for what is committed in secret we have learned elsewhere people must keep away from the place between Ulam and altar at the time of the smoking of the incense our Eliezer said this was taught only during the time of the smoking of the incense in the sanctuary but during the time the incense was smoked in the Holy of Holies people had to keep away from the Hekal but not from the place between the Ulam and the altar at Abiyahaba or as some say Kadi raised the following objection Our Jose says just as they keep away from the place between Ulam and altar during the smoking of the incense so do they keep away at the time of the sprinkling of the blood of the anointed priest Fulak and of the bullock offered up because of an error of the congregation and of the he goats offered up because of idolatry what gradation of sanctity is there then between the Hekal and the space between Ulam and altar not except that from the Hekal men keep away both during the time of the smoking of the incense and outside of the time of the smoking of the incense but from the space between Ulam and altar people keep away only in the time of the incense at any rate at the time of the smoking of the incense they do keep away what you not say it means during the time of the smoking of the incense in the Holy of Holies, know the reference is to the time of smoking in the Hekal. If so, how explain what then is the gradation between the two places, etc. Is the above the only difference in gradation? Is there not also this difference that from the Hekal they keep away during the time both of the smoking of the incense in the Hekal itself and of the smoking of the incense in the Holy of Holies, whereas from the place between Ulam and Altar they keep away only during the time of the smoking of the incense in the Hekal itself? This exactly is what he teaches, except that from the Hekal men keep away both during the time of the smoking of incense in the Hekal and outside of the time of the smoking of the incense in the Hekal, but from the place between Ulam and Altar they keep away Talmud, Masuma be only in the time of the smoking of the incense in the Hekal, but there is also this gradation that they keep away from the Hekal. Both during its own sanctification and that of the Holy of Holies, whereas from the space between Ulam and Altar they do not keep away except when the call is being sanctified. Rabbi said the term keep away includes it all in one. The master said so do they keep away at the time of the sprinkling of the blood of the anointed priest's bullock and of the bullock offered up because of an error of the congregation and of the he goats offered up because of idolatry. Whence do we know that our pedeth? Said we infer that from the identity of the word atonement occurring also with reference to the day of atonement, our Ahabi Ahabi said conclude from this that the gradations of sanctity are biblical and thus they have learned them by tradition. For if it should enter your mind that they are only rabbinical enactment, then what in law is the difference in the space between Ulam and Altar from which they must keep away for fear that they might enter by accident, they should analogically keep. Away from the whole temple court out of fear that they might accidentally enter the space between Ulam and altar since it is not marked off in any fashion is not recognizable sufficiently whereas the temple court since there is the other altar to mark it off is sufficiently recognizable Rabbi said conclude from this that the holiness of Ulam and Hikal is the same for if it should enter your mind that they are of two different degrees of sanctity then the sanctity of the Ulam itself is due only. To rabbinic enactment shall we then enact a preventive measure to prevent the violation of another preventive measure know the Ulam and the space between Ulam and altar are of one degree of sanctity they call and the Ulam however are of two degrees of sanctity on other days he would take them out with a silver coal pan what is the reason the Torah has consideration for the money of Israel today he took them out with a golden pan in which he was to bring them in why to prevent weakness of it. I priest on other days he would take them up with a coal pan containing four calves a tannin taught one calf of the embers became scattered and he swept it into the channel one berry that teaches one calf and another two calves it is quite right according to the one which teaches one calf for it is in accord with what the rabbi said but the one that taught two calves is in accord neither with the rabbis nor with our Jose our Hisda said it is our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan be Berakah for it was taught our Ishmael son of our Yohanan be Berakah said he brought the cinders in a pan containing two calves our Ashi said you can also say that it is in accord with our Jose and he said it thus on other days he would take them up with a pan containing a of the wilderness and pour it into one containing three Jerusalem calves on other days the pan was heavy today it was light a taught on other days it was a fixed size but this day it was thin on other days its handle was short today long why that's a that the arm of the high priest may support it attended taught on other days it had no covering today it had one this is the statement of the son of the seed and on other days its gold was yellowish our hista said there are seven kinds of gold gold good gold gold of over fine gold spun gold locked gold perwain gold gold and good gold as it is written and the gold of that land is good over gold so called because it derives from over fine mupes gold talmud masuma because it resembles the shining jewel pas spun gold because it is spun like a thread locked rare gold because when its sale is opened all other shops are being locked up gold of perwain because it looked like the blood of the bullet parr she said there are but five varieties each having gold and good gold thus was it also taught on other days the gold was yellowish this day it was red and that was the perwain gold which looks like the blood of the bullet on other days he would offer up half a mina etc on other days it was fine today most fine our rabbis taught why was it necessary to stay beaten small since it is written already and thou shalt beat some of it very small it is but to intimate that it must be most fine on other days the priests would come up on the eastern side of the ramp because a master said any turn you make shall be but to the right i.e. toward the east but today he comes up in the middle and goes down in the middle why to honor the high priest on all days the high priest sanctified his hands and feet from the labor etc why to honor the high priest on other days there were four wood piles there are rabbis taught on other days there were two wood piles today three one for the big wood pile one for the second pile for the incense and one which is added for this day this is the opinion of our Judah our Jose said on other days three today four one for the big wood pile one for the second pile of the incense one to keep up the fire and one which was added for this day our Meir said on all days four and today five one for the big wood pile one for the second pile for the incense one to keep up the fire and one for the burning of limbs and fat pieces which had not been consumed on the eve and one which was added on this day at any rate all are agreed about two whence do they know it scripture says it is that which goeth up on its firewood upon the alt
Could it enter your mind that a lay Israelite could come up to the altar? Rather, does this passage teach that the kindling of the figwood must take place on the top of the altar? And our Judah, if we had to infer it from there, we might assume he may stay on the ground and kindle it with bellows. Therefore, he informs us as above. Whence does our Meir know about limbs and fat pieces unconsumed from the eve before requiring a special pile? He infers it from and the fire and the rabbis. They do not interpret the end bob. But what according to the rabbis does he do with the limbs and fat pieces unconsumed from the eve before he returns them to the big pile? For it was taught whence do we know of limbs and fat pieces unconsumed from the eve before Talmud? Masyuma be that he lays them in order on the altar, and if the latter cannot hold them, that he lays them on the ramp or on the gallery until the great pile is made to teach us that scripture says where to the fire hath consumed the burnt. Offering on the altar and our Meir, this is to teach you may place back their unconsumed parts of the burnt offering, but you may not place their unconsumed parts of the incense for our Hanania Bimayumi of the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob said with reference to where to the fire hath consumed the burnt offering on the altar, you place back unconsumed parts of the burnt offering, but you do not place back unconsumed parts of the incense. At any rate, all agree that one adds an additional pile on. That day, whence do they infer that they infer that from and the fire, for even he who does not expound above expounds Bobby, and what does fire shall be kept burning upon the altar continually mean it is required as it was taught, fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually, it shall not go out that teaches concerning the second pile for the incense that it shall be laid in order only on the outer altar. Whence do we know that about fire for the coal pan on the day of atonement? And for the candlestick that can be inferred as follows the word ash fire is mentioned in connection with the incense and the same word is mentioned in connection with coal pan and candlestick hence just as the former comes upon the other altar so do the latter come upon the other altar or turn this way perhaps the word ash fire is mentioned in connection with incense and is also mentioned in connection with coal pan and candlestick just as for the former it comes for the altar near to it so for the latter it comes from the altar near to it to teach us the right law scripture says fire shall be kept burning on the altar it shall not go out i.e. the continual fire whereof I spoke to you must be nowhere else but on the top of the other altar we thus learned it for the fire of the candlestick whence do we know it for the fire of the coal pan this can be inferred the word ash fire is stated in connection with the coal pan and ash is used in connection with the candlestick Hence just as the former comes from the other altar so does the latter come from the other altar but perhaps turn this way the word ash is mentioned in reference to the incense and ash is used in connection with the coal pan hence just as the former comes from the altar near to it so the latter too comes from the altar near to it therefore it says and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord now which altar is only partly before the Lord but not wholly before the Lord you must say it is the other altar now it was necessary for scripture to mention both from off the altar and from before the Lord for if the divine law had written only from off the altar I might have said that altar means the inner altar hence the divine law said from before the Lord and if the divine law had written from before the Lord alone I might have said it must be exactly before the Lord Talmud Masyuma, but not to one side or to the other therefore it was Necessary to have both phrases our Eliezer said in the name of Barca for our Meir used to say for any of the limbs of the daily burnt offering which remained over a special pile is to be arranged even on the Sabbath what is he teaching us have we not learned every day there were four piles of wood there are of and said it was necessary to state it for those which became somewhat invalidated this however is only when the fire has already touched them but not when the fire has not taken hold of them some there are who say whether they were valid or invalid the same rule applies if the fire had touched them a special pile is needed but if not not you say even on the Sabbath surely we have learned thus and today five piles of wood are Ahabi Jacob said it was necessary to mention that the thought might have arisen in you that this applied only when the day of atonement fell immediately after Sabbath because the fat pieces of the Sabbath may be offered up on the day of Atonement, but not if it fell in the middle of the week. Therefore, he informs us that it applies then to Rabba said, Who is it that does not care what flour he grinds? Have we not learned on all other days these were for this is a real difficulty now? He barkeeper disputes with Arhuna who holds a continual offering suspense of Sabbath only at its beginning, but not at its end. To turn to the main text, the continual offering suspense of Sabbath only at its beginnings, not at its end. What does it not suspend? Arhis does says it suspends the Sabbath, but not the law of Levitical impurity. Rabba said it suspends the law of Levitical impurity, but not the Sabbath said of Rabba, there is a difficulty on your view as well as on the view of Arhis. According to you, there is a difficulty. Why does it suspend the law of Levitical impurity? Because scripture said in its due season, i.e., even in Levitical uncleanness, it should suspend also the Sabbath since in its due season implies. Even on the Sabbath, and according to our Hisdah, there is a difficulty wherefore the difference in law in the case of Sabbath touching which it is written in its due season, i.e., even on the Sabbath, the same should apply to Levitical impurity since in its due season implies even in Levitical uncleanness. He answered, There is no difficulty according to my view, nor is there any difficulty according to our Hisdah. There is no difficulty on my view, for the beginning is like the end, Talmud, Masyumabi. Consequently, in the case of the law of Levitical impurity, since it is suspended at the beginning, it is also suspended at the end, but with regard to the Sabbath, since it is not suspended at the beginning, it is also not suspended at the end, nor is there any difficulty according to our Hisdah. He does not hold that the end is like the beginning. Consequently, with regard to the Sabbath, since it is inoperative when a community sacrifice is concerned, it is suspended also at the end of the sacrifice. Whereas as regards the law of Levitical uncleanness since in the face of a community sacrifice it is only suspended it is suspended only at the beginning which is essential for the obtainment of atonement but not at the end which is not essential for atonement it was stated if one puts out the fire of the coal pan or of the candlestick Abbe holds him guilty Rabbah holds him not guilty if he put it out on the top of the altar all agree that he is guilty they dispute it only if he brought it down to the ground and put it out there Abbe holds him guilty because it is fire of the altar whereas Rabbah holds him guilty since he snatched it away he has snatched it according to whose opinion will be then what Arnaman said in the name of Rabbah Abba one who takes an ember down from the altar and puts it out is guilty shall we say it will be in accord with Abbe you may also say that it is in accord with Rabbah for in the one case it was not snatched away for its ordained use in it. Other case it was snatched away from the altar for its ordained use some there are who say none disputes the case where he took it down to the floor and put it out there all agreeing that he is not guilty the dispute concerns but the case where he put it out on the top of the altar Abbe holds he is guilty because it is the top of the altar whereas Rabbah holds him guilty since he snatched it away he has snatched it according to whose opinion then will be the teaching of Arnaman in the name of Rabbah Biabob is one who brings an ember down from the altar and puts it out is guilty will you not say it will be in accord with neither Abbe nor Rabbah no there it was not snatched away for its ordained use here it was snatched away for its ordained use Talmud Masyum A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R B Mishnah they brought out to him a little and the pen from the letter he took his two hands full of incense and put it into the little a tall high priest according to his size a short one According to his size and thus was its measure he took the pen in his right hand and the ladle in his left hand Gemara the pen but was it not taught he took the pen and went up to the top of the altar took out the burning coals and went down there the reference is to the pen of burning coals here to the pen of the incense for it was taught one brought out for him the empty ladle from the cell of vessels and the heaped pen of incense from the cell of the house of Athenus he took his two hands full and put it into the ladle a tall high priest according to his size a short one according to his size and thus was its measure for what purpose was the ladle on the day of atonement necessary surely the divine law said and he shall take his hands full and bring it because otherwise it is impossible for how shall he do it shall he bring in the pen of burning coals and then again bring in the incense the divine law refers to one bringing in not to two bringings in shall he Take the incense in his handfuls and place the pan of burning coals on top of it. Entering thus, then when he comes within the veil, how shall he act? Shall he take it between his teeth and set the pan of burning coals down? Now, if such procedure is unseemly in the presence of a mortal king, how much
carefully sifted and then strengthened me it was told of our Ishmael bekimeth that one day he talked in the street to an Arab and spittle from his mouth flew on his garments whereupon his brother Shabab entered and ministered in his stead thus their mother saw two high priests on one day furthermore it is told of our Ishmael bekimeth that he went out and talked with a certain lord in the street and spittle from his mouth squirted on his garments whereupon Joseph his brother entered and ministered in his stead so that their mother saw two high priests on one day the sages said unto her what hast thou done to merit such glory she said throughout the days of my life the beams of my house have not seen the plates of my hair they said to her there were many who did likewise and yet did not succeed our rabbis taught with his fists that means that he must not make a measure for his fistful the question was how about making a measure for his handfuls is it only there since it is written with his fist whereas here where it is not written with his handfuls but his handful of fine incense it matters not or does he derive the meaning of full from the word full occurring in connection with his fist come and here and thus was its measure would you not say that it means if he wishes to make a measure he may do so no this is what it means in the same manner would he take the handful within the holy of holies may not you then conclude from this that he takes it Handfuls outside and repeats it inside again. No, perhaps it means that if he wants to have a measure made, he may do so, or that he must take neither less nor more. Our rabbis taught his fistful. One might have assumed that it may come forth on both sides. Therefore, scripture says, with his fist from with his fist, I might have inferred that he should just take some with his fingertips. And scripture says, his fistful, i.e., in the manner in which people take a fistful, how so he bends three of his fingers up to his wrist and takes a fistful Talmud. Masyuma be in the case of the meal offering baked in a griddle and the meal offering of the stewing pan, he makes it even with his thumb from above and with his small finger from below. And this was the most difficult service in the sanctuary. You say this is and nothing else. Was there not the pinching of the bird's head and was there not the taking of the fistfuls? But say rather, this was one of the difficult priestly functions in the Sanctuary are Yohanan said our Joshua B. Oza asked how about that which is between the fingers of the fist our Papa answered that which is inside needs no question for it surely belongs to the fistful concerning that which is on the outside too there is no doubt it surely is considered a remainder the question attaches only to such portions as are in between the fingers how about these said our Yohanan our Joshua B. Oza had subsequently solved the question bis concerning the portion in between uncertainty prevails how then shall he act or Hanan said he shall burn as an offering first the fistful and then the portions in between the fingers for if we were to burn up the in between portions first perhaps they are considered remainders and it would thus be a case where the remainders became reduced between the taking of the fistful and the burning of it on the altar whereas the master has said that if remainders became reduced between the taking of the fistful and it Burning thereof no more fistfuls may be burnt up on their account if that be so then even now apply thereto the rule whatever had partly been used in fire offering must no more be burnt as an offering said our Judah son of our Simeon because he burns them the remainders up as would in accord with our Eliezer for it was taught our Eliezer said for a sweet savor for this you must not bring them up but you may bring them up as fuel this will be in accord with our Eliezer but what is there to be said in accord with the sages our Mari said fat priests take the fistful now that you have come to this answer according to our Eliezer too there is a procedure which may be adopted at the outset this fat priest should take the fistful our Papa inquired how about the middle portions in between connection with the two hands full what is he inquiring about if he derives the meaning of the word full from full occurring there it is the same as the first question this is what our Papa asks should we Say that we require that he shall bring it his hands full, which is the case here, or is it required that he take bring in, which is not the case here? The question remains unanswered. Our Papa said, It is obvious to me that his fistful means in the manner in which people usually take a fistful, but our Papa asked if he had taken the fistful with his fingertips, what is the law then, or if he took it from below upward or from the sides, what then the questions remain unanswered. Our Papa said, It is obvious to me that the handfuls are to be taken as men usually take them, but he asked if he took the handfuls with his fingertips, what then, or from below upward or from the side, or if he swept it with one hand and with the other and then brought the hands together, the questions remain unanswered. Talmud, Masyuma, our Papa asked if he stuck the fistful onto the side of the vessel, what then does the law require that it be put into the middle of the vessel, which is the case here, or must it be placed? Inside the vessel properly, and this was not done in our case. The question remains unanswered. Mar the son of Arashi asked if he overturned the vessel and placed the fistful on the bottom of the vessel. How then does the law require placing it in the vessel which was done here, or is it to be placed properly, which has not been done? The question remains unanswered. Our Papa asked with regard to the handfuls, are they to be heaped or leveled? Our Abba said to Arashi, Come and hear the handfuls whereof they spoke are to be neither leveled nor heaped, but liberally measured. We learned elsewhere if the blood was poured out on the pavement and he gathered it up, it is invalidated, but if it was poured out of the vessel on the pavement and he gathered it up, it is usable. Once do we know this for the rabbis taught, and the anointed priest shall take of the blood of the bullock from the blood of life and not from the blood of the skin, nor from the last blood oozing out from the blood of the bullock. I.e. the blood from the bullock shall he receive straight for if you were to interpret from the blood of the bullock as meaning from the blood i.e. even if only part of the blood has not rabbed Judah said he who receives the blood must receive the whole of the bullock's blood as it is said and all the remaining blood of the bullock shall he pour out at the base of the altar hence it is evident from here that from the blood of the bullock must be interpreted as blood from the bullock straight he holding the view one may remove a letter and add one and thus interpret our papa ask if the incense was scattered from his handfuls how then is his hand to be compared to the neck of the animal so that the incense would be invalidated or is it to be compared to a ministering vessel and thus is not invalidated the question remains unanswered our papa ask further if in taking the handfuls of the incense he had an unlawful intention what then do we say that we infer the meaning of full by analogy of full occurring with the meal offering, this is in that case an unlawful intention affects an invalidation. So here too, an unlawful intention will affect an invalidation, or is it not so? Our Shimai B. Ashi said to our Papa, Come and here our Akiva added the cases of the fine flour, the incense, the bomb, and the embers of the sanctuary that if a tea bullion had touched part of them, he invalidated all of them. Now the assumption is that since a tea bullion invalidates them, so does their being kept overnight, and since their being kept overnight invalidates them, so does unlawful intention. Our Papa asked Talmud, Masyuma B. If he in removing the coals for the incense had an unlawful intention, what then are preliminary means of a religious act to be considered as the act itself, or not? The question remains unsolved. The question was asked of Arshi's hate if the blood was carried to the altar in the left hand, what is the law? Arshi's hate answered, You have learned that he took the pen of burning coals in his right hand and the ladle in his left but he could have settled that point to them from what we have learned he carried the right hind leg in the left hand with the inside of the skin outward if the argument were based on that i might have assumed this applies only to a carrying of such things which are not indispensable to atonement but in the case of a carrying of things which are indispensable to atonement it would not apply therefore he has to bring the above reference talmud masyuma they raised the following objection a lay israelite in one and one inebriate or one with a blemish are invalidated for the receiving the carrying and the sprinkling of the blood and so is one seated in the left hand this is a refutation but arshis hate himself has asked this question in refutation for arshis hate said to the amora of arhista who asked of arhista may the blood be carried by a lay israelite he answered it is proper and a scriptural verse supports me and they killed the Passover lamb and the priests dashed of their hand and the levites flayed them and Arshis hate raised this question a lay Israelite a mourner and an or one blemish are invalidated for the receiving the carrying or the sprinkling of the blood and so is one seated in the left hand after having heard it he raised it in objection against Arhista but Arhista had cited a scriptural passage in support they served only the purpose of a portico our papa asked if another priest took his hands full and put it into his the high priest's hands how then is what we require that it be his hands full which we have here or is it required that he both take his hands full and bring it in which was not the case here the question remains unsolved our Joshua B. Levi asked if he had taken his hands full and then died what about someone else entering within the holy of holies with his the first one's handful said our Hannah this is a question of the older generation
Justified that he holds with the bullock includes also with the bullock's blood. Now, according to this, his view, his question is like the question of an older generation. What about that? Our Papa said, if we say that he takes the handful first and then must take it again, then his fellow may enter with his hafana because the hafana is still the same. But if we say that he takes the handfuls once but does not take them again, then your question arises, said Arunah, son of our Joshua, to our Papa Amit. Contrary, if we say that he performs the hafana twice, none else should enter with his hafana because it is impossible that the second take not either a bit less than the handfuls of the first or a bit more. But if we say that he performs only one hafana, does your question arise? For the question had been raised, must he perform the hafana twice? Come in here and such was its measure. Now, does not that mean that as a measure in the outside hafana, so was it in the hafana within the holy? Of holies, no, perhaps the meaning here is that if he wanted to make a measure, he could do so, or that he must not take either more or less in the one case than in the other. Come and hear Talmud. Masyuma how does he do it? He takes hold of the dish with his fingertips according to some with his teeth and pulls it with his thumb until it reaches his elbows, then he turns it over in his hands and heaps up the incense in order that its smoke may come up slowly. Some say he scatters it in order that its smoke may come up fast, and this is the most difficult ministration in the sanctuary. This alone, none other, but is there not the pinching of the bird's head and the taking of an exact fistful of the incense? Rather, say this is one of the more difficult ministrations in the sanctuary. At any rate, infer from here that he had to perform the hafana twice. The inference is right. The question was raised if the priest slew the animal and died, may someone else enter with its blood, do we? Say with the bullock includes even with the blood of the bullock or with the bullock only but not with its blood are Hannah said with the bullock but not with its blood are Lakish said with the bullock and even with its blood are Amai said with the bullock but not with the blood of the bullock are Isaac the Smith said with the bullock and even with its blood are Amai raised the following objection one may be counted in for the Paschal lamb or one may withdraw from being counted in it until it be slaughtered now. If that view were correct this should read until he sprinkles the blood there is a special situation because it is written Mihyot Misa'i as long as the lamb is alive Marzich raised the following objection one must not redeem with a calf or with a beast of chase or with what had been slaughtered or with a crossbred or with a koi only with the lamb there is a different case because the meaning of lamb here is inferred from lamb mentioned in connection with the Paschal lamb then. Just as that must be male without blemish and one year old is too ought to be male without blemish and one year old to prevent such interpretation scripture states thou shalt redeem thou shalt redeem to include both if repetition of thou shalt redeem means to include then all ought to be included what value would the word lamb have in that case Talmud, Masyuma A.R. Isaac the Smith raised the following objection to RMI's view even the whole bullock shall he carry forth it means. He shall take it out in its completeness and the bullock of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering our Papa answered nobody disputes with regard to skin flesh and excrement the dispute applies only to the blood one holding blood to be designated bullock the other holding that blood is not designated bullock Arashi said it seems reasonable to hold with the view that blood is designated bullock for it is written here which shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock now. Does he bring it in with its horns? Is it not rather with its blood? And yet it is called bullock. And the other it means is how is Aaron legally permitted to enter the sanctuary with a young bullock for a sin offering, but derive it from the fact that it is a sin offering whose owners have died, and a sin offering whose owners have died is left to die. Said Rabin, the son of Arada to Rabbi, your own disciple, said in the name of Aram, this is a community sin offering, and the sin offering of the community is not left. For we learned our Meir said are not the bullock of the day of atonement, and the pancakes of the high priest, and the Paschal lamb each offerings of an individual, and yet they suspend the law of Sabbath and the laws touching Levitical impurity. Would you not infer therefrom that there must be a view according to which these are considered offerings of the congregation? But according to your own arguments, when it states our Jacob said to him, but are there not the bullock to be? Offered for an error of the congregation and the he goats to be offered up for idolatry and the festive offering, all of which are community offerings, and yet they suspend neither the laws of the Sabbath nor those of Levitical impurity. Would you infer from this that there must be a view that they are sacrifices of an individual? Rather, what you must therefore say is he answered the first Tana whom he heard saying that a community sacrifice suspends the laws both of the Sabbath and those touching Levitical impurity, whilst the sacrifice of an individual suspends neither the laws of the Sabbath nor those affecting Levitical uncleanness. Whereupon our Mayor said is the law concerning the offering of an individual general rule is there not the bullock of the day of atonement? Are there not the pancakes of the high priest and the paschal lamb, all of which are private offerings, and yet they suspend both the Sabbath and the impurity laws? And also our Jacob said is the law concerning the Offering of the community rule are there not the bullock for an error of the community and the he goats for idolatry and the festive offering all of which are community offerings yet suspend neither the laws of the Sabbath nor those touching Levitical impurity rather accept this principle whatsoever has a fixed time suspends both the laws of the Sabbath and those touching Levitical impurity even though the sacrifice concerned be that of an individual and whatsoever has no definite time. Fixed suspends neither the Sabbath laws nor those affecting Levitical uncleanness even if a community offering were involved have they raised the following objection if the bullock and the he goat of the day of atonement had been lost and other animals had been set aside in their stead then they must all be left to die similarly if the he goats offered in expiation for idolatry had been lost and others had been set aside in their stead they must all be left to die this is the view of our Judah. Our Eliezer and our Simeon hold they should be left to go to pasture until they become unfit for sacrifice whereupon they should be sold and the money realized should go to the fund for providing free will offerings because a community sacrifice is not left to die. Bullock here refers to the bullock offered up for an error of the community but the text reads of the day of atonement this refers to the he goat but it was stated if the bullock of the day of atonement and the he goat of the day of atonement had been lost and others were set aside in their stead they must all be left to die this is the view of our Jude. Our Eliezer and our Simeon hold they should be left to go to pasture until they become unfit for sacrifice whereupon they should be sold and the money realized for them should go to the fund for providing free will offerings because a community offering is not left to die do not read for a community sacrifice is not left to die read rather for a sacrifice belonging to partners. Is not left to die. What is the practical difference that the priests will not have to bring a sacrifice for an error in a legal decision? Come in here for our Eliezer asked Talmud. Masyuma be according to him who holds that the bullock of the day of atonement is a private sacrifice is a substitute made for it valid or not. Does not this imply that there is one who considers it a community offering? No, the inference is that there is one who considered it an offering of partners to turn to the main text. Our Eliezer asked according to him who holds that the bullock of the day of atonement is an offering of an individual is a substitute made for it valid or not. What is his question? Shall we say as to whether the validity of a substitute is dependent on him who consecrated it or on him who attains atonement thereby? Obviously, it may be objected. We make it dependent on him who attains atonement thereby for our Abu said in the name of our Yohanan, he who consecrates must add the fifth to. And he who obtains atonement thereby can render valid a substitute and one who separates the priestly gift from his own produce for that of his neighbor has the benefit of the pleasure in truth it is obvious that the matter depends on him who obtains atonement and this is what he asked have his fellow priests a definite share in the atonement or do they receive their forgiveness merely by implication come and here there are some aspects of the original sacrificial animal severer than those of a substitute animal there are some aspects in which the substitute animal has more rigid rules than the original sacrificial animal more severe are the regulations touching the original inasmuch as it applies both to an individual and to a community suspends the Sabbath law and the law concerning Levitical impurity and renders a substitute valid all these things not applying to the substitute animal more severe are the regulations touching a substitute animal than those of the original. Sacrificial animal inasmuch as a substitute is affected even if it have a permanent blemish and it cannot be made available on redemption for profane use either to be shorn or put to work all these things not applying to the original animal now what kind of sacrifice is meant here if we are to assume an individual sacrifice is meant how could it suspend the laws of either Sabbath or those touching Levitical impurity if again
Available on redemption for profane use to be subjected to shearing or work hence you must say he does not deal with whatever goes by the name of an original sacrifice why is it different with substitute animals the substitutes all have uniform rules whereas the original sacrificial animal includes firstborn and tithe for cattle now as to our she's hate why does he refer the teaching to the ram of Aaron let him rather refer to the paschal lamb which suspends the laws of the sabbath and of Levitical uncleanness and can have a substitute because it is an individual sacrifice he holds that a paschal lamb is never offered for one individual then let him put the case as dealing with the second paschal lamb is that able to suspend the laws of Levitical impurity said Arhuna the son of our Joshua to Rabbah why does the Tana designate the paschal lamb an individual sacrifice and the festal offering a community sacrifice would you say because the latter is offered up by large crowds so is the paschal lamb offered up by large crowds there is the second paschal lamb which is not offered up by large crowds said he to him if so I ought to suspend the laws of Sabbath and those of Levitical impurity he answered yes he holds in accord with him who says that it suspends them for it was taught the second paschal lamb suspends the Sabbath but not the laws of Levitical impurity our Judah says it suspends also the laws of Levitical impurity what is the reason for the view of the first? Tana he will tell you you have postponed it only because of Levitical impurity how then shall it suspend the laws of Levitical impurity and Arjuna he will tell you scripture says according to all the statute of the Passover shall they keep it i.e. even in Levitical impurity the Torah gave him an opportunity to do it in Levitical purity but if he was not privileged to do so let him do it even in impurity Talmud, Masyuma be but let him infer it from the words of the divine law which is of himself i.e. he shall bring it from what belongs to him for it was taught which is of himself that means he must bring it of his own possession not from community funds one might have assumed he must not bring it from community funds because the congregation obtains no atonement therefrom but he may bring it from the funds of his fellow priests because they do obtain atonement therefrom therefore scripture says which is of himself one might have assumed he must adjure not bring it from funds beside his own but that if he de facto had done so I would be valid therefore scripture says again which is of himself repeating the condition in order to render conformity with it indispensable but according to your own view if his fellow priests have no part in it how can they obtain atonement even by implication rather must you say it is different with regard to the private treasury of Aaron for the divine law has declared it free to his fellow priests thus also with regard to the question of a substitute sacrifice we say the private treasury of Aaron is different since the divine law has made it free for his fellow priests Mishnah he went through they call until he came to the place between the two curtains which separated the holy from the holy of holies and between which there was a space of one cubit our Jose said there was but one curtain as it is said and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy Gemara our Jose gave a proper Rejoinder to the rabbis what about the rabbis they will tell you those things applied at the Mishkan but in the second temple because there was lacking the partition wall which had been in the first temple and the sages were doubtful as to whether its sacredness partook of the character of the holy or the holy of holies they made two curtains our rabbis taught he was walking between altar and candlestick this is the view of our Judah our Meir says between the table and the altar some there are who say between the table and the wall who are the Samar his said it is our Jose who said the entrance was to the north and our Judah he will tell you that the entrance was to the south according to whose view was that of our Meir if it agreed with our Judah's let him enter as our Judah states if it agreed with our Jose let him enter as our Jose states in truth he agrees with our Jose but he will tell you the tables were placed between north and south hence they would interrupt his walk preventing him from getting himself in or if you like you might say in truth the tables were placed from east to west but it does not seem proper Talmud, Masyuma to go straight ahead towards the seat of the divine presence and our Jose Israel is so beloved that scripture does not wish to burden their messenger as to our Judah let him enter between the candlestick and the wall his garments would become blackened our Nathan said concerning the cubit of partition the sages did not decide as to whether its sanctity was that of the holy of holies or of the holy place outside of it to this rubbin what was their reason shall we say because it is written and the house which king Solomon built for the Lord the length thereof was three score cubits and the breadth thereof twenty cubits and the height thereof thirty cubits also it is written and the house that is the temple before the sanctuary was forty cubits long and it is further written and before the sanctuary which was twenty cubits in length and twenty cubits in breadth and twenty cubits in the height thereof so that we do not know whether the space of a cubit of the partition was to be deducted from the twenty or the forty perhaps it is to be deducted from neither the twenty nor the forty the account referring only to the free spaces not to the walls as a proof is the fact that whenever the walls are mentioned they are mentioned separately for we have learned the sanctuary was a hundred cubits square and a hundred cubits in height the wall of the ulam was five cubits thick and the ulam eleven the wall of the sanctuary six and its interior forty cubits the partition one cubit and the holy of holies twenty cubits the wall of the sanctuary six the cell six and the wall of the cell five rather the question is whether the sanctity of the partition is as that of the inner part the holy of holies or the outer part and this is as our Yohanan reported Joseph of Uzalast it is written at a debir in the Midst of the house from within he prepared to set there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The question was asked in the Academy, what does scripture mean to say? Does it mean a debir in the midst of the house from within? He prepared to place the ark there or a debir in the midst of the house from within. But could they have any doubt? Surely it was taught as he Judah said there are five verses in the Torah, the grammatical construction of which is undecided Talmud, Masyuma be lifted up. Like almond blossoms tomorrow cursed and rise up, it was also taught Joseph of Husel is the same as Joseph the Babylonian and is identical with Isibi Judah, also with Isibi Gari, also with Isibi Gamal, also with Isibi Mahalil. What was his real name? Isibi Akiba in the Torah. There is no other but in the prophets there is, but is there in the Torah no other? Surely there is for our Hista asked it is written, and he sent the young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings. Does it mean of lambs and sacrifice peace offerings unto the Lord namely of oxen or does the word oxen refer to all sacrifices or his had indeed his doubts about it but to Isibi Judah it was obvious mission of the outer curtain was held back by a clasp on the south side and the inner curtain on the north side he walked along between them until he reached the north side when he reached the north side he turned around to the south and went on along the curtain to his left until he reached the ark when he reached the ark he put the pan of burning coals between the two bars he heaped up the incense upon the coals and the whole house became full with smoke he came out by the way he entered and in the outer house he uttered a short prayer he did not make the prayer long so as not to frighten Israel Gemara to what are we referring here if it be the first sanctuary was there then a curtain again if it is to the second sanctuary was there then an ark surely it has been taught when it Ark was hidden there was hidden with it the bottle containing the manna and that containing the sprinkling water the staff of Aaron with its almonds and blossoms and the chest which the Philistines had sent as a gift to the God of Israel as it is said and put the jewels of gold which he returned to him for a guilt offering in a coffer by the side thereof and sent it away that it may go who hid it Josiah hid it what was his reason for hiding it he saw the scriptural passage the Lord will bring the end thy king whom thou shalt set over thee therefore he hid it as it is said and he said to the Levites that taught all Israel that were holy unto the Lord put the holy ark into the house which Solomon the son of David king of Israel did build there shall no more be a burden upon your shoulders now serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel and our Eliezer said we derive by analogy between the words their generations and to be kept occurring in these passages in truth we refer to the Second sanctuary and what does he came to the ark mean i.e. he came to the place of the ark but the text reads he placed the pan of burning coals between the two bars read it to mean as if it were between the two bars he heaped the incense upon the coals we learn here in accordance with the view that he heaped the incense up one berry the taught he begins to heap it up on the inner side which is to him the outer side whereas another taught he begins to heap it up on the outer side which is to him the inner side Abbe said it is a matter of dispute among Tanaim further said Abbe the view of him who holds he begins to heap it on the inner side which is to him the outer side seems logical for we have learned one teaches him be careful Talmud, Masyuma not to start in front of thee lest thou
Deal with the case where he brought in two incenses, one incomplete, the other defective, so that he is not guilty because of the purposeless entrance because he had offered up a perfect incense, but he is guilty in regard to the incense because he had offered up one defective incense. The master had said, Whence is it known that he must place a smoke razor into it to teach us that it is said, so that the cloud may cover, etc. What need of one scriptural verse added to another said, Our Joseph. This is what is meant from here. I know only about the leaf of the smoke razor. Whence do I know about the root to teach us that scripture said so that it may cover, etc. Said Abbe to him, but the opposite has been taught, for it was taught if when he put in the root of the smoke razor it would rise up straight like a stick until it reached the ceiling beams. As soon as it reached the beams of the ceiling, it would come slowly down the walls until the house became full of smoke, as it is said, and the house was filled with smoke. Rather said Abbe, this is what it means. Now I know only about the root of the smoke razor. Whence do I know also about its leaf to teach us that scripture said so that it may cover, etc. Our sheets hate said, I know only about the tent of meeting in the wilderness. Whence do I know about Shiloh and the eternal sanctuary to teach us that scripture said so that it may cover, etc. But that we infer from and so shall he do for the tent of meeting that dwelleth with them. Rather is this meant now I know about the day of atonement whence do I know about the other days of the year to teach us that scripture said so that it may cover etc. Our Ashi said one passage refers to the commandment the other to its indispensable this said one refers to the penalty incurred the other to the prohibition it was taught our Eliezer said that he die not i.e. the penalty for I appear in the cloud i.e. the prohibition I might have assumed that both were stated before the death of the sons of Aaron to teach us the true fact it is written after the death of the two sons of Aaron one might assume that both were said after the death of the two sons of Aaron to teach us the true fact it is written for I will appear in the cloud upon the ark cover how is that to be explained the prohibition was stated before the death the penalty after the death how is this inference made Rabbah said for I will appear in the cloud but he had not appeared yet then why were they Punished as it was taught, our Eliezer said the sons of Aaron died only because they decided a question of law in the presence of Moses their master. What was it they decided? And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar means although the fire was coming down from heaven, yet was it obligatory to bring private fire? He came out by the way he entered. Whence is this known? Said our Samuel be Namani in the name of our Jonathan. Scripture said so Solomon came to the high place that was at Gibeon unto Jerusalem. What has Gibeon to do with Jerusalem? Rather, Scripture compares his departure from Gibeon towards Jerusalem with his entrance from Jerusalem into Gibeon, i.e., just as when he entered Gibeon from Jerusalem, his face was directed towards the high place in the same way as he had come in, in the same manner as he left Gibeon for Jerusalem, his face was turned toward the high place, even in the same way as when he had come in, in similar manner the priests as they ministered did. Love it's on their service the Israelites on their post as they left they would not turn their face back to go out but would turn their face sideways to leave thus also a disciple taking leave of his master must not turn his face back to go away but must turn sideways to depart as was the case with our Eliezer whenever he took leave of our Yohanan if our Yohanan wanted to leave our Eliezer would stand on his place the head bowed until our Yohanan disappeared from his sight but when our Eliezer wished to take leave he would walk backwards until he disappeared from the sight of our Yohanan when Rabbah was about to take leave of our Joseph he would go backwards so that his feet were bruised and the threshold of the house of our Joseph was stained with blood Talmud Mas be the people told our Joseph that Rabbah did that whereupon he said to him may it be the will of God that you raise your head above the whole city our Alexandria said in the name of our Joshua believe I one who prays the Amidah go. Three steps backwards and then recite peace. Our Mordecai said to him, having taken the three steps backwards, he ought to remain standing as should a disciple who takes leave of his master. For if he returns at once, it is as with a dog who goes back to his vomit. It has also been taught us one who prays shall take three steps backwards and then pronounce peace. And if he did not do so, it would have been better for him not to have prayed at all in the name of Arshimea. They said he should pronounce peace towards the right and towards the left. As it is said, at his right hand was a fiery law unto them. And it is also said, a thousand may fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. For what reason? And it is also said, you might have said, it is the usual thing to take a thing with the right hand. Come therefore, and here a thousand may fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. Rabbi Sabe pronouncing peace first towards the right. And he said to him, do you mean that you're Right hand is meant it is your left hand which is the right of the Holy One. Blessed be he or high the son of our Hunas said I saw Abay and Rabbah who were taking all three steps with one genuflection and he uttered a short prayer in the outer house. What did he pray? Rabbah son of Arada and Rabin son of Arada both reported in the name of Rab. May it be thy will, O Lord our God, that this year be full of heavy rains and hot, but is a hot year in advantage. Rather, if it be a hot one, let it be rich in rain. Araha the son of Rabbah concluded the prayer in the name of our Judah. Thus may there not depart a ruler from the house of Judah, and may the house of Israel not require that they sustain one another and permit not the prayers of travelers to find entrance before you. Or Hannah Bidosa was walking along a road when rain came down upon him. He said, Lord of the universe, all the world is comfortable, and Hannah is afflicted. The rain stopped as he came home. He said, Lord of the universe, all the world is. Afflicted and Hannah is comfortable. The rain came again. Our Joseph said, Of what use is the prayer of the high priest against our Hannah? Abidosa, our rabbis taught it happened with one high priest that he prolonged his prayer. His fellow priests undertook to enter after him. As they began to enter, he came forth. They said to him, Why did you prolong your prayer? He said, Is it disagreeable to you that I prayed for you for the sanctuary that it be not destroyed? They said to him, Do not make a habit of doing so. For thus have we learned he would not pray long lest he terrify Israel. Mission after the ark had been taken away, there was a stone from the days of the earlier prophets called the Shethiah, three fingers above the ground on which he would place the pan of burning coals. He would take the blood from him who was stirring it and enter again into the place where he had entered and stand again on the place on which he had stood and sprinkle thereof once upwards and seven times downwards. Aiming to sprinkle neither upwards nor downwards, but commis live making the movement of swinging a whip, and thus would he count one one and one one and two one and three one and four one and five one and six one and seven. Then he would go out and put it on the golden stand in the sanctuary. One would bring him the he goat. He would slay it, receive its blood in a basin, enter again the place he had entered before, stand again on the place he had stood on before, and would sprinkle there from once upwards and seven times downwards. Thus would he count one one and two etc. Then he would go out and place it on the second golden stand in the sanctuary. Our Judah said there was no more than one golden stand. He would take the blood of the bullock and put down the blood of the he goat, sprinkle thereof upon the curtains facing the ark outside. Once upwards seven times downward, aiming to sprinkle neither upwards nor downwards, but came as making the movement of swinging a whip. Thus would he count. As above, then he would take the blood of the he goat, depositing the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle thereof upon the curtain facing the ark outside. Once upward, seven times downwards. As above, then he would pour the blood of the bullock into the blood of the he goat, emptying the full vessel into the empty one. Gemara, the mission does not teach after the ark has been hidden away, but after the ark had been taken away. This is in accord with him who holds that the ark went into exile to Babylonia. For it was taught, our Eliezer said the ark went into exile to Babylonia, as it was said in the following year. King Nebuchadnezzar sent and had him brought to Babel together with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord. Our Simeon B. O. He said the ark went into exile to Babylonia, as it was said, nothing shall be left. Saith the Lord, i.e., the Ten Commandments contained therein. Our Judah B. I. Said the ark was hidden, buried in its own place, as it was said, and the staves were so long that the Ends of the staves were seen from the holy place even before the sanctuary, but they could not be seen without, and there they are unto this day. Now he disputes Allah for Allah said, Our Matthew Biharish asked our Simeon Biohe in Rome. Now, since our Eliezer had taught us on the first and second occasion that the ark went into exile to Babylonia, the first was the one which we said just now, and he had him brought to Babel together with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord. But what is the second? One, because it is
He answered here the word there is used there this expression is not used what you say that wherever the word there is used it implies forever but the following objection can be raised and some of them even of the sons of Simeon 500 men went to Mount Seir having for their captains Pelasia and Nuria and Raphai and Uziel the sons of Ishi and they smote the remnants of the Amalekites that escaped and dwelt there unto this day but Sennacherib king of Assyria had come up already and confused all the lands as it is said I have removed the bounds of the peoples and have robbed their treasures this is a refutation Arnaman said it was taught that the ark was hidden away in the chamber of the witch Arnaman B. Isaac said thus where we also taught it happened to a certain priest who was whiling away his time that he saw a block of pavement that was different from the others he came and informed his fellow but before he could complete his account his soul departed thus they Knew definitely that the ark was hidden there. What had he been doing? Our Helbo said he was playing with his axe. The school of our Ishmael taught two priests afflicted with a blemish were sorting the woods when the axe of one of them slipped from his hand and fell on that place whereupon a flame burst forth and consumed him. Our Judah contrasted the following passages and the ends of the staves were seen and it is written, but they could not be seen without how is that possible they could be observed? But not actually seen, thus was it also taught and the ends of the staves were seen. One might have assumed that they did not protrude from their place to teach us the fact scripture says and the staves were so long one might assume that they tore the curtain and showed forth to teach us the fact scripture says they could not be seen without how then they pressed forth and protruded as the two breasts of a woman as it is said, my beloved is unto me as a bag of murder that lieth betwixt my Breasts are Katniss said whenever Israel came up to the festival the curtain would be removed for them and the cherubim were shown to them whose bodies were intertwisted with one another and they would be thus addressed look you are beloved before God as the love between man and woman are his stories the following objection but they shall not go in to see the holy things as they are being covered in connection with which Rab Judah in the name of Rab said it means at the time when the vessels are being put into their cases are and answered that may be compared to a bride as long as she is in her father's house she is reserved in regard to her husband but when she comes to her father-in-law's house she is no more so reserved in regard to him or had a son of Arkatna raised the following objection it happened with a priest who was whiling away his time etc he was answered you speak of a woman who has been divorced when she is divorced she goes back to her earlier love of what Circumstances are we treating here if we were to say the reference is to the first sanctuary but there was no curtain if again the reference be to the second sanctuary but there were no cherubim in truth the reference is to the first sanctuary and as to curtain the reference here means the curtain at the entrances for our Zara said in the name of Rab there were thirteen curtains in the sanctuary seven facing the seven gates two more one of which was at the entrance to the call the other at the entrance to the Elam due to the Deber two corresponding to them in the loft for Ahabi Jacob said in truth the reference here is to the second sanctuary but it had painted cherubim as it is written and he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers within and without and he overlaid them with gold fitted upon the graven work and it is written also according to the space of each with loyal wreaths round about what does According to the space of each with loyal mean rabbi son of Arshila said Talmud, Masyuma be even as a man embracing his companion Reshlech said when the heathens entered the temple and saw the cherubim whose bodies were intertwisted with one another they carried them out and said these Israelites whose blessing is a blessing and whose curse is a curse occupy themselves with such things and immediately they despised them as it is said all that honored her despised her because they have seen her nakedness and it was called Shethiah and taught it was so called because from it the world was founded we were taught in accord with the view that the world was started created from Zion on for it was taught our Eliezer says the world was created from its center as it is said when the dust runneth into a mass and the clods keep fast together our Joshua said the world was created from its sides on as it is said for he said to the snow fall thou on the earth likewise to the shower. Of rain and to the showers of his mighty rain are Isaac the smith said the holy one blessed be he cast a stone into the ocean from which the world then was founded as it is said whereupon were the foundations thereof fastened or who laid the cornerstone thereof but the sages said the world was started created from Zion as it is said a psalm of Asaph God God the Lord hath spoken whereupon it reads on out of Zion the perfection of the world that means from Zion was the beauty of the world perfected it was taught our Eliezer the great said these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven the generations the creations of heaven were made from the heaven and the generations of the earth were made from the earth but the sages said both were created from Zion as it is said a psalm of Asaph God God the Lord hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof and scripture further says out of Zion the perfection of beauty God hath shined forth that means from it the beauty of the world was perfected he took the blood from him that was stirring it etc what does came Ajlav mean our Judah showed it to mean Talmud Masyuma is one swinging with the tanda taught as he sprinkled he did so not upon the ark cover but against its thickness and when he is to sprinkle upwards he first turns his hand down and when he is to sprinkle downwards he first turns his hand up whence do we infer this our Ahabi Jacob said in the name of our Zara scripture says and sprinkle it upon the ark cover and before the ark cover now with regard to the he goat it need not be said that he should sprinkle downwards for that can be inferred from the procedure with the bullock where the sprinkling downwards is made when and is it mentioned here too to compare the sprinkling upon the ark cover with the sprinkling before it just as the sprinkling before does not mean before actually so does Sprinkling upon here not mean really upon on the contrary it was not necessary to state with regard to the bullet that the sprinkling should be done upon the ark cover for that could be inferred from the fact that the he goat's blood was sprinkled upon it why then was it mentioned to compare the sprinkling before it to the sprinkling upon it is just as upon means exactly so shall before here mean upon exactly how can you say this granted if you say that the downward sprinkling in the case of the he goat is mentioned for the purpose of comparison and sprinkling upward written in connection with the bullet is necessary in accord with the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob for the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob taught upon the face of the ark cover on the east the special case establishes a general rule is that wherever scripture says before face it means on the east but if you say that the upwards in connection with the bullet is mentioned for the purpose of comparison then for what purpose is the downward in connection with the he goat mentioned our rabbis taught and he shall sprinkle it upon the ark cover and before the ark cover from this we know how often the he goat's blood is to be sprinkled upwards is once I do not know though how often downward so that I infer that thus the word blood is used in connection with the downward sprinkling of the bullock's blood and the same word blood is used about the downward sprinkling of the goat's blood hence just as downwards with the bullock means seven times so does downwards with the goat mean seven times or argue it this way the word blood is used in connection with the upward sprinkling of the goat's blood and the word blood is used in connection with the downward sprinkling of the he goat's blood hence just as upwards with the he goat means once thus also shall downwards with the he goat mean once let us see what comparison is legitimate one may infer downwards from downwards but one may not infer downwards from upwards on the contrary it is legitimate to infer one aspect of one matter from another aspect of the same matter but one may not infer one matter from an extraneous one to teach the true facts scripture says and he shall do with his blood as he did with the blood of the bullock now it was not necessary to say as he did why then was it said to show that all the doings of them should be alike as there were seven sprinklings downward with the bullock so shall there be seven sprinklings downward with the goat we learned thus how many sprinklings downwards there are to be both with bullock and he goat but I do not know how many sprinklings upwards are to be made with the bullock's blood and so I infer the word blood is used for the upward sprinkling in the case of the he goat and the word blood is used for the upward sprinkling in the case of the bullock hence the inference that just as the upward sprinkling in the case of the he goat has to be made once so shall the upward sprinkling in the case of the bullet be made once or argue it this way the word blood is used for the downward sprinkling in the case of the bullet and the word blood is used in the case of the upward sprinkling of the bullet hence just as seven downward sprinklings have to be made with the bullet's blood so must seven upward sprinklings be made with the bullet's blood let us see what comparison is legitimate one may fitly infer something about upward sprinklings from other upward sprinklings but one
Teaching purpose why then was it said he shall sprinkle to indicate that the first sprinkling shall be counted with each subsequent one what is the practical difference between the two in case he had not counted but also had made no mistake he went out and placed it on the golden stand in the sanctuary we have learned there there were no money chests provided for obligatory bird offerings to prevent confusion what does to prevent confusion mean are Joseph said to prevent confusion. Between free will and obligatory offerings have they said to him let him make two and inscribe on them this is a free will offering the other obligatory are Judah Talmud, Mas Yumabi does not consider such inscriptions of any value for we have learned Arjuta said there was no more than one stand now why not two evidently because they might be mixed up but then let him provide two and write upon them this is for the bullock and this for the he goat hence you must assume that Arjuta does not. Consider such inscriptions of any value an objection was raised in the academy there were thirteen money chests in the temple on which were inscribed new shekels old shekels bird offerings young birds for the whole offering with frankincense gold for the mercy seat and on six of them free will offerings new shekels i.e. those shekels to each year old shekels i.e. one who had not paid his shekel last year must pay it the next year bird offerings these are turtle doves young birds for the whole offerings these are young pigeons and both of these are for whole offerings this is a view of our Judah when our Dimi came from Palestine he said in the west they said it is a preventive measure against the case of a sin offering whose owner has died but do we indeed take that into consideration have we not learned if someone sends his sin offering from a faraway province it is offered up in the assumption that he is alive rather the preventive measure is against the case of a sin offering whose owner has assuredly died but in that case let us separate four zoos and cast them into the sea so that the rest will be available for use our Judah rejects the principle of bearer I once do we know this what you say from what we have learned if a man buys wine from the Kutians on the eve of Sabbath as it is getting dark he may say let the two logs which I am about to set apart be he offering Talmud, Mas Yuma a ten tithe offering and nine second tithe and after he sets aside the redemption money for the second tithe he may drink it at once these are the words of our Meir Talmud, Mas Yuma be our Judah our Jose and our Simeon prohibited hence we see that he rejects the principle of bearer how does that follow perhaps the matter is different there as the motive is taught there they said to our Meir don't you admit that if the bottle burst he would be found retrospectively to have drunk untithed wine he said to them if it bursts rather is it to be derived from what Ao taught for he taught Arjuna said no man may stipulate two possibilities at the same time but if the sage comes from the east his Arab applies eastwards alone if he comes from the west his Arab applies westwards alone but never in both directions and we ask concerning it what is the difference touching both directions that it cannot apply it is only because the principle of bearer is rejected the same ought to apply even where the condition was if the sage comes from the east or west thereupon are. Yohanan said in this case the sage has arrived already but now that we maintain that Arjuna rejects the principle of bearer whilst upholding the value of inscriptions notices also for the day of atonement let there be prepared two stands with such inscriptions because the high priest is fatigued he would not pay attention to them for should you not agree to this consideration he could really do without any such inscriptions for one contains more blood and the other less and if you were. To say he does not receive the whole of it but Arjuna said he who slays the animal must receive the whole blood as it is said the whole blood of the bullet he shall pour upon the base of the altar and if you were to say some thereof might be spilled still one blood is lighter in color the other darker hence you must needs explain that the high priest because of his fatigue could not pay sufficient attention to the difference in the blood thus is it here because of his fatigue the high priest could not pay sufficient attention to the inscriptions once a man went down to the praying desk in the presence of Rabbah and read then he came forth and placed it upon the second stand in the temple he took the blood of the bullet and deposited the blood of the he goat he said to him in one point in accord with the sages in another with Arjuna rather say he deposited the blood of the he goat and took the blood of the bullet and he sprinkled thereof upon the curtain outside opposite. The ark our rabbis taught and so shall he do for the tent of meeting what does that come to teach that as he sprinkles in the holy of holies thus must he sprinkle in the hikal i.e. just as in the holy of holies he sprinkles once upward and seven times downward from the blood of the bullock thus shall he sprinkle in the hikal that dwelleth with them in the midst of their uncleanness i.e. even when they are unclean the divine presence is among them a certain sadducee said to our hand in the Talmud, Mas. Yuma now you are surely unclean for it is written her filthiness was in her skirts he answered come and see what is written concerning them that dwelleth with them in the midst of their uncleanness even at the time when they are unclean the divine presence is among them but may something inferred by analogy be used as basis of another by analogy the inference here came from the subject itself for which inference was made together with another thus cannot be considered inference by Analogy this will be well in accord with the view that such inference is not inference by analogy but what can be said according to the view that even that is inference by analogy only the localities are inferred here from one another or if you like say he infers the outside sprinklings from the inside one simultaneously it was taught when he sprinkled he did not sprinkle directly upon the curtain but towards it or Eliezer B. Jose said I saw it in Rome and there were upon it many drops of blood both of the bullock and the goat of the day of atonement perhaps these stains were those from the blood of the bullock offered up for an error of the community or of the goats offered in expiation for idolatry he saw that they were in their regular order it has also been taught in connection with the bullock offered up for an error of the community when he sprinkled the drops were not to reach the curtain but if they did they just did and our Eliezer B. Jose said I saw it in Rome. And there were upon it many drops of blood from the bullock offered up for an error of the congregation and from the he goats offered up for idolatry but perhaps they came from the bullock and he goat of the day of atonement he saw that they were not in their regular order if the blood of the one was mixed up with the blood of the other rubber holes he sprinkles once upwards and seven times downwards and it serves for both when this was reported before our Jeremiah he said those foolish Babylonians because they live in a dark country they utter dark teaching surely he would be giving the upward sprinkling of the blood of the he goat before the downward sprinkling of the blood of the bullock whereas the Torah said and when he hath made an end of atoning for the holy place implying he must complete the sprinkling of the blood of the bullock then complete the sprinkling of the blood of the he goat rather said our Jeremiah he sprinkles once upward and seven times downward in the name of the bullock and then he sprinkles once upward and seven times downward in the name of the he goat if the blood of one was mixed up with the blood of the other in the midst of the last sprinklings then our papa wanted to say before rabba he makes seven downward sprinklings in the name of the bullock and he goat then makes one upward in the name of the he goat said rabba to him now they had just called us foolish now they might call us the most foolish of the foolish for we teach them but they learned not surely now he would be making the downward sprinkling of the blood of the he goat before the upward sprinkling of the blood of the he goat whereas the torah said sprinkle first upward and downward talmud mas be rather said rabba he makes seven downward sprinklings in the name of the bullock then makes one upward and seven downward sprinklings in the name of the he goat if the cups of blood have become confused then he sprinkles and sprinkles again and sprinkles once more three times if part of the blood became mixed up and part not then obviously when he makes the sprinklings he makes them from that part which is definitely known to be unmixed but as for the other is it to be considered a remainder and must thus be poured out at the base of the altar or is it to be considered rejected from sacred use and must be poured into the canal our papa said even according to the view that one cup renders the other a remainder that applies only where he could make the sprinklings if he wanted to do so but in this case even if he so desired he would be unable to make the sprinkling Arhuna the son of our Joshua said to our papa on the contrary even according to the view that one cup renders the other rejected that applies only if he rejected it with his hands deliberately but where he had not rejected it with his hands it would not apply for it has been taught above it is said and the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out and below and all the Remaining blood thereof shall he pour out once do we know that in the case of a sin offering if he had received the blood in four cups and sprinkled from each one cup thereof one sprinkling all the remaining blood must be poured out at the base to teach us that scripture said and all the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out one might have assumed that even if he made the four sprinklings from one of the cups to teach us correctly scripture said and the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out i.e. only this is to be poured out
said already once to this, our Jonathan replied, but was it not said already from the blood of the bullock and the blood of the ego? Why then was the word once stated to tell you sprinkle once, but not twice from the blood of the bullock once, and not twice from the blood of the ego? Another very thought, and he shall take from the blood of the bullock and from the blood of the ego, i.e., that the two shall be mixed together. You say that they shall be mixed together, but perhaps he should. Sprinkle separately from the one and from the other to teach us the right thing. Scripture says once, and the anonymous Baritha is in agreement with the view of our Joshua. He poured the contents of the full vessel into the empty one. Rami Biham asked of Arhistag if he placed one bowl into another and this received the blood. What then is homogeneous matter considered an interposition or not? He answered, You have learned that already he poured the contents of the full vessel into the empty one. Does this mean that he placed the full bowl into the empty one? No, it means that he poured the full vessel into the empty one. But the first part states already he poured the blood of the bullock into the blood of the ego. It is repeated in order to make sure that he will mix it very well. Indeed, come and here if he stood upon any vessel or upon his fellow's foot, it is invalid. It is different with his neighbor's foot because he his fellow does not abandon it. Some there are who say. This is how he asked of him is such a matter of ministration or not come and here for the school of our Ishmael taught and they shall take all the vessels of ministry wherewith they minister in the sanctuary i.e. two vessels but one ministry service Rami Biham asked of our his dog if he deposited vast in the bowl and he received the blood there with what then is heterogeneous matter considered an interposition or not is it not considered an interposition since it penetrates the blood or is there no difference he replied to him we have learned that he empties out the water until the sponge is reached it is different with water because it is very weak some there are who say this is how he answered him in the case of the blood it is permitted but in the case of the fistful it is invalid Talmud Masyuma be and he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord that is the golden altar then he begins to sprinkle downward whence does he commence from the northeast horn of the altar then the northwest then the southwest then the southeast where he commences sprinkling on the outer altar there he completes sprinkling on the inner altar our Eliezer said he remained in his place and sprinkled and he would sprinkle every horn from below upwards with the exception of the horn at which he was standing which he would sprinkle from above downwards then he sprinkled the top of the altar seven times and poured out the remainder of the blood at the western base of it. Outer altar and the remainder of the blood sprinkled on the outer altar he poured out at the southern base both mingled in the canal and flowed into the brook Kidron and they were sold to gardeners as manure and by using them one transgresses the law of trespass Gemara our rabbis taught and he shall go out unto the altar what does that mean to teach our Nehemiah said since we find that in connection with the bullet offered up for the transgression in error of any of the commandments that Priest stands outside the altar and sprinkles towards the curtain. One might have assumed that here the same would take place. Therefore, Scripture said, and he shall go out unto the altar. Hence, he must have been found before on the inner side of the altar. Another very the top before the Lord. What does that mean to teach our Nehemiah? Said, since we find with the bullet and he go of the day of atonement that the priest stands on the inner side of the altar and sprinkles upon the curtain as he sprinkles. One might have assumed here the same would be the case. Therefore, Scripture has come to teach us the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tent of meeting that implies the altar before the Lord, but not the priest before the Lord. How that he stands outside the altar and sprinkles? He began to sprinkle downward. Our rabbis taught he began to sprinkle downward. Whence did he commence from the southeastern horn, proceeding to the southwestern, northwestern, and north? Eastern horns respectively this is a view of our Akiva, our Jose the Galilean says he started from the northeastern proceeding to the northwestern southwestern and southeastern horns respectively at the place where according to our Jose the Galilean he commenced there according to our Akiva, he stopped at the place where our Akiva would have him start there our Jose the Galilean would have him stop all agree at any rate that he does not start at the point he first comes to what is the reason said Samuel scripture said and he shall go out unto the altar i.e. only after he has gone over the whole altar but according to our Akiva, he ought to go around it to the right shall we say then that they are disputing a teaching of Rami be Ezekiel for Rami be Ezekiel said concerning the sea which Solomon made scripture states it stood upon twelve oxen three looking toward the north and three looking toward the west and three looking toward the south and three looking toward the east and the sea was Set upon them and all their hinder parts were inward, hence you are taught that all the turns you make in the temple must be to the right, i.e. eastward. One master, our Jose the Galilean, agreeing with Rami B. Ezekiel, the other master, our Akiva, disagreeing. No, all agree with the view of Rami B. Ezekiel, and the matter of dispute here is rather this one master holds that the regulations within are inferred from those without the other master holding. We do not infer the regulations within from those without, but according to our Akiva, granted that he does not infer within from without, let him be permitted to do it one way if he so chooses, or the other way if he so chooses. Our Akiva will tell you as far as the your regulation is concerned, he ought to start at the horn to which he had come first. For Reshlakish has said, one must not forego the occasion for performing a religious act, and the reason why he does not do so is because scripture said, and he shall go out unto the altar, i.e. until. He has gone outside the whole altar therefore as soon as he has sprinkled the blood on this horn he returns to the horn with which he should have started from the beginning Talmud, Masyuma or if you like say if we hold that the sprinkling on the inner altar was done in walking around there would be general agreement that we infer within from without but the dispute here rests on this one master holds the sprinkling was done by circular movements of the hand the other master holding it. Sprinkling was done in walking around or if you like say all agree that the sprinkling on the inner altar was done by circular movements of the hand the point of dispute here is one master holds we may infer the regulations touching the hand from those governing the foot the other master holding that we do not infer the hand from the foot but does our Jose the Galilean hold that the sprinkling was done by circular movement of the hand surely since the second part reads our Eliezer said he Remained in his place and sprinkled it follows that the first tana did not hold so hence it is obvious as we have answered before one master holds the sprinkling was done by circular movement of the hand whereas the other master holds it was done by walking around and if you like to say the dispute lies therein that one master holds that the phrase roundabout mentioned in connection with the inner altar signifies the same as roundabout mentioned in connection with the outer altar. Whereas the other master holds that the whole of the inner altar occupied as much space as one horn of the outer altar it was taught our Ishmael said two high priests had survived the first sanctuary one said I had done the sprinkling in the inner altar by circular movement of my hand the other said I had done the sprinkling by walking around the altar the first advanced the reason for his procedure so did the second the first said the roundabout of the inner altar had to be as the roundabout. Of the outer altar, the other stating the whole of the inner altar occupied as much space as one horn of the outer altar. Our Eliezer said he remained in his place and sprinkled with whom does our mission agree with our Judah? For it was taught our Meir said our Eliezer said he remained in his place and sprinkled and all the sprinklings he made from above downward with the exception of the one afford which he made from below upward. Our Judah said our Eliezer said he remained in his place and sprinkled all the sprinklings he made from below upward with the exception of this one right before him which he made from above downward to prevent his garments from becoming sullied. Then he sprinkled the top tahero of the altar. What does tahero mean? Rabbi son of Arshila said the center of the altar front as people say the moonlight tahero shines meaning there by the middle of the day an objection was raised as he sprinkles he sprinkles neither upon the ashes nor upon the embers but he removes it. Cold to both sides and sprinkles rather said Rabbi son of Arshila it means the cleared surface of the altar as it is written and the like of the very heaven for Tohar clearness it was taught Hananiah said he would sprinkle standing on the north side our Jose said he would sprinkle standing on the south side wherein are they disputing one Hananiah holds the entrance was through the curtain on the south whereas the other our Jose holds it was on the north side at any rate all agree that on the place where he completed the sprinkling on the horns there he would sprinkle on the top thereof what is the reason scripture says and he shall cleanse it and hallow i.e. where he hallows it there shall he cleanse it with tahero and the remainder of the blood he sprinkled upon the western base of the outer altar for scripture said and all the remaining blood of the bullet shall he pour out etc and as
According to biblical law, however, there is no trespass when do we know these things? Allah said, Scripture said to you, i.e., it belongs to you, the school of our Simeon taught to make atonement, i.e., I have given it for atonement, but not for the law of trespass to apply our Yohan and said, Scripture said it, i.e., implying that it is before atonement, just as after atonement one cannot be guilty of trespass concerning it, thus can one before atonement not be guilty of trespass concerning it, but perhaps say, it is after the atonement as before the atonement, just as before the atonement one may become guilty of trespass concerning it, so also after atonement may one become guilty of trespass concerning it, there is nothing concerning which one can become guilty of trespass once the atonement touching it has been fulfilled, but there is a removal of the ashes from the altar Talmud, Mas Yuma, that is because referring to the removal of the ashes and the priestly garments, there are two verses. Written for the same purpose and wherever two verses have the same purpose no deduction can be made from them for other precepts that will be right according to the rabbis who hold and he shall put them there signifies that they must be hidden away but what can be said according to our dosa who holds that the garments of the high priest may be used for a common priest that is because concerning the removal of the ashes and the heifer whose neck is to be broken are two verses written for the same purpose and wherever two verses are written for the same purpose no deduction can be made from them that will be right according to the view that holds from two identical scriptural statements no deduction can be made but what can be said in accordance with the view that such deduction is permissible there are two limiting qualifications and he shall put them and the one whose neck was broken for what purpose are three scriptural verses necessary in connection with the blood one is two. Exclude blood from the rule touching leftovers, one to exclude it from the rule touching trespass, and one to exclude it from the rule touching ritual uncleanness, but no verse is necessary to exclude it from the rule touching pickle, for we have learned whatever has that which renders the offering permissible, whether for human beings or for service on the altar can make one liable on its account for pickle and blood itself is a thing which renders the offering permissible mission concerning. Every ministration of the day of atonement mentioned in the prescribed order, if one service was done out of order before another one, it is as if it had not been done at all. If he sprinkled the blood of the he goat before the blood of the bullock, he must start over again, sprinkling the blood of the he goat after the blood of the bullock. If before he had finished the sprinklings within the holy of holies, the blood was poured away, he must bring other blood starting over again and sprinkling. Again within the Holy of Holies likewise in matters of the sanctuary and the golden altar since they are each a separate act of atonement our Eliezer and our Simeon say wherever he stopped there he must begin again tomorrow our rabbis talk concerning every ministration of the day of atonement mentioned in the prescribed order if one service was done out of order before another one it is as if one had not done it at all our Judah said when does this apply only with regard to service performed in white garments within the Holy of Holies but any service performed in white garments without if in connection with them he performed one out of order before the other one then what he has done is done valid our Nehemiah said these things apply only to service performed in white garments whether performed within the Holy of Holies or without but in case of services performed in golden garments outside what has been done is done said our Yohanan and both expounded it on the basis of one Scriptural passage and this shall be an everlasting statute unto you once in the year Talmud, Mas Yuma B. Our Judah holds this means the place on which once a year atonement is obtained whereas our Nehemiah holds that it refers to the objects through which once a year atonement is obtained but according to our Judah is then place written here rather is this the reason for our Judah's view it is written this and it is written once one excludes services performed in white garments the other. Those performed in golden garments and our Nehemiah one excludes the golden garments the other the remaining blood which if done out of order do not impair the service and our Judah if an act performed in white garments out of order impairs the service it impairs it here too and if it does not impair the service it does not impair it here either as it was taught and when he hath made an end of atoning for the holy place i.e. if he has obtained atonement he has completed it if not not this. Is the opinion of our Akiva our Judah said to him, Why should we not interpret thus if he has completed it, he has obtained atonement, if not not to say that if one of the sprinklings is missing, he has done nothing, and we inquired what is the difference between them and our Yohanan and our Joshua Bili by each gave an answer, one said they differ only as to the interpretation of the text, while the other said the remaining blood is what they differ in, but did our Yohanan hold thus surely our Yohanan said our Nehemiah taught in accordance with the view that the remaining blood offered not as prescribed impairs the service. This is a refutation. Our Hanan said if he took the handfuls of the incense before the slaying of the bullock, he has done nothing according to whom is this presumably not according to the view of our Judah. Surely he said that the word statute was written only in connection with ministrations performed in white garments within the Holy of Holies. No, you may say that it is even. In agreement with our Judah's view, inasmuch as what is necessary for a service performed within is considered as a service within, we learned if before he had finished the sprinklings within the Holy of Holies, the blood was poured away, he must bring other blood starting over again and sprinkling within again. Now, if this view were right, it should read, he should start again with the taking of the handfuls. Talmud, Masuma, he does not treat of the incense, Ola said, if he slew the he goat. Before sprinkling the blood of the bullock, he has done nothing, we learned if he sprinkled the blood of the he goat before the blood of the bullock, he must start over again, sprinkling the blood of the he goat after the blood of the bullock. Now, if this view were right, it should read, he shall start over again and slaughter Ola explained this to refer to the sprinklings in the sanctuary, and thus also Ari explained it to refer to the sprinklings in the sanctuary, likewise in matters of it. Sanctuary and the golden altar are rabbis taught and he shall make atonement for the most holy place i.e. the holy of holies for the tent of meeting i.e. the sanctuary for the altar in the literal sense he shall make atonement this refers to the courts the priests in the literal sense the people i.e. Israel he shall make atonement this refers to the levites and they are all declared alike in respect of one atonement for all other sins they obtain atonement through the ego that is to be sent away this is the view of our Judah our Simeon said just as the blood of the ego the rites of which are performed within obtains atonement for Israel in all matters of impurity touching the sanctuary and its holy things thus also does the blood of the bullock obtain atonement for the priests in all matters of impurity touching the sanctuary and its holy things and just as the confession over the ego to be sent away obtains atonement for Israel with regard to all other transgressions. So does the confession over the bullock obtain atonement for the priest for all other transgressions our rabbis taught and when he hath made an end of atoning for the holy place this refers to the holy of holies the tent of meeting i.e. the sanctuary the altar in its literal sense this teaches that for all of these special independent atonements must be obtained hence they said if he sprinkled some of the sprinklings made within and the blood was poured away he shall bring other blood and start again from the beginning with the sprinklings within our Eliezer and our Simeon say he shall start but from the place where he stopped if he has completed the sprinkling due within and the blood was poured away then he shall bring other blood and he shall start from the beginning with the sprinklings in the sanctuary if he had sprinkled some of the sprinklings due in the sanctuary and the blood was poured away he shall bring other blood and start again from the beginning with the sprinklings. Do in the sanctuary our Eliezer and our Simeon say he needs start but from the place where he had stopped if he had completed the sprinklings do in the sanctuary and the blood was poured away he shall bring other blood and start again from the beginning with the sprinkling do on the altar if he had made some of the sprinklings do on the altar and the blood was poured away he shall bring other blood and he shall start again from the beginning with the sprinklings do on the altar our Eliezer and our Simeon said he shall not start except from the place where he had stopped if he had completed the sprinklings do on the altar and the blood was poured all agree that this is no handicap said our Yohan and both infer it from one scriptural passage with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once a year our Meir holds I have spoken to thee of one sin offering whereby to obtain one atonement not of two sin offerings our Eliezer and our Simeon holding I have spoken of one sprinkling not of two. Sprinklings it was taught Rabbi said our Jacob taught me a difference with regard to the logs but is there no dispute surely it has been taught if he made some of the sprinklings within the sanctuary and the blood was poured away he must bring another log of oil and start again from the beginning with the sprinklings do within our Eliezer and our Simeon hold he starts again from the place he had stopped at if he had completed the sprinklings do within the sanctuary and the log was spilled
demurred to them surely it is written that this is a refutation it was taught in accord with our Yohanan if the guilt offering of a leper had been slaughtered not for its own purpose or if one had not sprinkled of its blood upon the thumbs and toes it is considered a burnt offering in regard to the altar and requires the prescribed libations and he requires another guilt offering to render him right again and our Hisdah he will answer you what means he requires he requires but he has no remedy. To get it but would attend a teach he requires when he has no remedy of getting it indeed as it was also taught concerning a bald head not right Beth Shammai taught he requires to pass through a razor over his head whereas Beth Hillel said he need not pass through a razor over his head and our Abinah said when Beth Shammai say it is necessary they mean he requires to do so but he has no remedy he thus contradicts Rabadath for our Pedath said Beth Shammai and our Eliezer say one and the same. Think that Shammai as we have stated above and our Eliezer as we have learned if he have no thumb or toe he can never obtain purity our Eliezer said one should place it on the place too and thereby the duty is done our Simeon said if he placed it on the thumb and toe of the right he has done his duty our rabbis taught and the priest shall take receive of the blood of the guilt offering one might have assumed that is to be done with a vessel therefore the text reads and he shall put it i.e. just as the putting must be done by the priest himself so must the taking be by the priest himself one might have assumed the same applied to the blood which is to be used for sprinkling upon the altar therefore the text reads for as a sin offering so is the guilt offering just as a vessel is necessary for receiving the blood of a sin offering so is a vessel necessary for the blood of the guilt offering you thus find yourself stating that in the case of the guilt offering of the leper too. Priests receive the blood thereof one in his hand the other in a vessel the first who receives it in the vessel proceeds to the altar whereas the other who receives it in his hand goes to the leper we have learned there all of them render the garments levitically impure and are to be burnt in the place where the ashes are deposited this is the opinion of our Eliezer and our Simeon the sages say they do not render the garments ritually unclean and they are not to be burnt in the place where the ashes are deposited except the last one because with that he completed the atonement Rabbah asked the following question of our Naman how many he goats is he to send away he answered should he perhaps send his flock away he said to him Talmud Masyuma does he not burn his flock how compare these two with regard to this it is written it touching the other it is not written it was stated our Papi said in the name of Rabbah he sends away the first our Shimei said in the name of Rabbah he sends away the Last it is quite right according to our Shimei in the name of Rabbah who said he sends the last away that is because with him he completes the atonement but what is the view of our Papi in the name of Rabbah he holds with our Jose who says the commandment is properly fulfilled with the first one which view of our Jose is referred to here shall I say it is our Jose's view in the case of the baskets for we learned there were three baskets each of three seahs in which they took up Teramah out of the shekel chamber and on them were inscribed the letters Allah Beth Gimel and it was taught our Jose said why were Allah Beth Gimel inscribed upon them so that one may know which of them was taken up first out of the shekel chamber so as to use it first for the commandment properly applies to the first but perhaps it is because at the time when the first is to be used the others are not ready for use rather do we refer to the view of our Jose touching the Paschal sacrifice for it has been taught if one Set aside his Passover sacrifice and it was lost went astray and he set aside another one in his place and then the first was found again so that both are before him then he may offer up whichever he wants this is the view of the sages our Jose says the commandment attaches properly to the first but if the second be better than the first then he may offer it C-H-A-P-T-E-R-B I mission the two he goats of the day of atonement are required to be alike in appearance in size and value to have been bought at the same time but even if they are not alike they are valid if one was bought one day and the other the following day they are valid if one of them died before the lot was cast another one is bought for the second one but if it died after the lot was cast another pair must be bought and the lots cast for them over again and if the one that was cast for the Lord died he the high priest should say let this on which the lot for the Lord has fallen stand in its stead and if the one that was cast for Azazel died he should say let this on which the law for Azazel has fallen stand in its stead the other one is left to pasture until it becomes blemished when it is to be sold and its value goes to the temple fund for the sin offering of the congregation must not be left to die our Judah says it is left to die furthermore said our Judah if the blood was poured away the goat to be sent away was left to die if the goat to be sent away died the blood is poured away G-E-M-A-R-A Talmud Masyuma be Talmud, Masyuma be our rabbis taught and he shall take two he goats now the minimum of he goats is two why then is two mentioned to indicate that the two be alike whence do we know that even if the two are not alike they are valid therefore the text reads he goat he goat which is inclusive widens the scope now the reason then is only that the divine law expressly includes it but had the divine law not done so one would have assumed that they are invalid whence do we derive this indispensability you might have thought that we say two is written three times but now that the divine law has twice written he goat what is the purpose of two written three times one applies to appearance the other to size the third to value it has been similarly taught in connection with the lambs of the leper and he shall take two lambs now the minimum of lambs is two then why does the text say two to indicate that the two be alike whence do we know that even if the two be not alike they are valid therefore the text reads lamb lamb which is inclusive widens the scope now the reason is only that the divine law expressly includes it but had the divine law not done so one would have assumed that they are invalid once do we assume this indispensability you might have thought we say it is written this shall be the law but now that the divine law has said lamb lamb what purpose serves shall be that refers to the rest of the status of the leper it was similarly taught in connection with the birds of the leper birds now the minimum of birds is two why then is two mentioned to indicate that the two be alike once do we know that even if they be not alike they are valid therefore the text reads birds birds which is inclusive now the reason then is that the divine law expressly includes it but had the divine law not included it one would have assumed that they are invalid once do we derive this indispensability you might have thought that we say that it is Written shall be, but now that the divine law through birds birds includes it, what purpose serves shall be because of the rest of the status of the leper. If so, in the case of the daily burnt offerings, let us make a similar deduction. Lamb's lamb, since the minimum of lambs is two, why does the text read two to indicate that they shall be alike? And once do we know that even if they are not alike, they are valid. Therefore, the text reads lamb lamb, which is inclusive, but as far as proper performance of the precept is concerned, is it indeed required that the lambs shall be alike? Here we need it for what has been taught to for the day, i.e., against the day you say against the day, but perhaps it really means the daily duty when it says the one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. Behold, the daily duty is already stated. Hence, how do I apply the words two for the day, i.e., against the day? How is that the continual morning offering was being? Slain on the northwestern corner on the second ring, whereas that of the even was slain on the northeastern corner on the second ring, but the additional sacrifices of the Sabbath certainly must be alike. Our rabbis taught if he the high priest slew two he goats of the day of atonement outside the temple court before the lots were cast, then he is guilty in respect of both. If however after the lot was cast, then he is guilty in respect of the one cast for the Lord, but free in respect of it. One cast for Azazel, if before he has cast the lots, he is guilty in respect of both of them. But what sacrifice are they fit for set are his since each is fit to be offered up as the he goat, the rites of which are performed without, but why is it impossible to offer it up as the he goat of which rites are performed within the Holy of Holies, presumably because it still lacks the casting of the lot, but then it ought to be unfit to be used as the he goat of which rites are performed. Without for the reason that it still lacks the other ministrations of the day Arhisda holds one may not call the absence of any functions due on the same day a lack of time said Rabbanah now that Arhisda said that the absence of the casting of the lot has the same significance as the absence of a direct action then in view of what Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel peace offerings which have been slain before the doors of the temple have been opened are invalid as it is said and he shall slay it at the gate of the tent of meeting i.e. at the time when it is opened but not when it is closed Talmud, Masyuma if someone had slain them outside before the doors of the temple had been opened he would be free because the lack of opening is like the lack of a direct action but does Arhisda adopt the principle of since surely Arhisda said if someone had slaughtered the Passover sacrifice
All correct in the case where it was slaughtered in its name since it is not fit for the temple but where it was not in its name why should it be exempt surely it would be fit as a sacrifice not in its own name within the temple and he said this in reply the removal of the name of a sacrifice outside the temple is not deemed an effective removal when Rabin came from Palestine he said that our Jeremiah said in the name of our Yohanan if one had slain a Passover sacrifice outside. On any of the other days of the year, whether in its own name or not in its own name, he is called to believe in its own name. But have we not learned a sacrifice whose time has not yet come? Maybe such either because of itself or because of its owner, which is a sacrifice whose time has not yet come because of its owner. If the owner, either man or woman, was afflicted with gonorrhea or was a woman after childbirth or a leper and had offered up their sin offering or their guilt offering outside, before the appointed time they are free. But if they offered up their whole offerings or their peace offerings outside, they are culpable. And our Hilkiah Bitobi said they did not teach us only if they were offered up in their own name, but if they were not offered up in their own name, they were not culpable. Now at any rate, then when offered up in their own name, the owners are culpable. But why that let us say since they are fit to be offered up in their own name, within they should be culpable. How compare their removal is necessary, but your Passover sacrifice during the rest of the days of the year is a peace offering. Our Ashi taught the owner is culpable, as we had stated above. Our Jeremiah of Dipti taught he is not culpable because he is of the opinion that the Passover sacrifice during the rest of the days of the year requires a removal, and the removal outside the temple is not effective. There are any disputes with our Hilkiah Bitobi. The master said, When the lot has been cast, he is culpable in respect of the one he goat cast for the Lord, and free with respect to the one cast for Azazel. Our rabbis taught what man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it without the camp, and hath not brought it unto the entrance of the tent of meeting to present it as an offering unto the Lord Talmud. Mas Yuma be from the word offering, I might have assumed that even offerings for the temple repair are included, which are. Also called offerings in accord with the scriptural words, and we have brought the Lord's offering. Therefore, the text reads, and hath not brought it unto the entrance of the tent of meeting. I.e., whatsoever is fit to be brought to the tent of meeting if offered up outside involves culpability, but whatsoever is fit to be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting if offered up outside does not involve culpability. Thus, I would exclude only those which are not fit to be offered up at the entrance of the tent of meeting, but I would not exclude the cow for the sin offering and the he go to be sent away, which are fit to be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. Therefore, the text reads, unto the Lord, I.e., only those assigned to the Lord to the exclusion of such as are not assigned to the Lord, but do the words unto the Lord imply exclusion. I shall raise a contradiction. It may be accepted for an offering made by fire unto the Lord, i.e., the fire offerings. Whence do we know that one may? Not dedicated before its time has come, therefore the text reads as an offering unto the Lord includes the ego to be sent away, said Rabbah. There the meaning is determined by the context, and here too its meaning is determined by the context. There unto the entrance implies inclusion, therefore unto the Lord implies exclusion. Here an offering made by fire implies exclusion, hence unto the Lord has inclusive meaning. Now the only reason then is that the divine law included it, but if it had not done so, I would have assumed that the ego to be sent away could be dedicated before its time, but the law does not determine except such an animal as is fit for the Lord, said our Joseph. This is in accord with Hanan the Egyptian, for it was taught Hanan the Egyptian says, even if the blood is in the cup, may he bring its mate and fear them, but admitted that Hanan does not accept the opinion concerning rejection. You surely did not hear that Hanan does not accept the opinion as to the necessity. Of casting the lots, perhaps he, the high priest, would have to bring two and cast lots afresh. Rather, said our Joseph, this Beretha is in accord with our Simeon, for it was taught if one of them died, he brings another one without casting lots. This is a view of our Simeon. Rabbin has said the reference in the Beretha is to a case in which one of them became blemished and was redeemed with another one. But whence will you say that a blemish renders it the scapegoat invalid as it was taught? Nor make an offering by fire of them. This refers to the pieces of fat from here. I could infer only as to all the pieces. Whence do we know that it applies also to parts thereof? Therefore, the text reads of them the altar, i.e., the sprinkling of the blood unto the Lord that includes the ego to be sent away. Now it was necessary for the scripture to write disqualifying a scapegoat, the blemished animal, and one whose time has not yet come for it. The divine law had written only about the animal whose Time has not yet come, I would have assumed there it is disqualified applies because its time has not yet come, but in the case of one blemish whose time had come, I might have assumed that the disqualification does not apply, and if the divine law had written about the blemished animal alone, I might have assumed the reason for its being disqualified there lies in repulsiveness, but with the animal whose time has not yet come and where there is no repulsive feature, one might have assumed. The law does not apply, hence it was necessary to write about both Talmud, Masyum and Rabbah said it was necessary for the case that he had a sick person in the house for whom he killed the mother animal on the day of atonement, but is it forbidden in such a case does not the divine law say ye shall not kill it, and this is not killing in the West Palestine, they said hurling it down from the mountain peak that is it's killing if that for the Lord died, etc. Rab said the second of the first. Pier is to be offered up the second of the second pier should be left to pasture. Our Yohanan said the second of the first pier should be left to pasture. The second pier should be offered up in what principle do they differ? Rab holds living animals are not rejected forever whereas our Yohanan holds living animals are rejected forever. What is the reason for Rab's view? He infers it from those whose time has not yet come an animal whose time has not yet come although it is as yet unfit when it later becomes fit again will be quite in order. Thus also here how can this be compared there it was never fit at all here it was once fit and then rejected rather is this the reason of Rab's view? He infers it from an animal afflicted with a passing blemish an animal afflicted with a passing blemish surely although now unfit yet when it is fit again is quite in order. Thus also here but once do we know if touching the former because it is written because their corruption is in them there is a Blemish in the mighty only as long as a blemish is in them are they not acceptable but when their blemish passes they are acceptable and are Yohanan the divine law stated in the mighty only these are acceptable after the blemish has passed but all other animals rejected through temporary unfitness once they have been rejected stay rejected and wrap the words in them signify that only as long as they are in their natural form are they not acceptable but as soon as they are mixed up with others they are acceptable as we have learned if the members of unblemished whole offerings were mixed up with the members of blemished animals our Eliezer says if the head of one of them had been offered the heads of all may be offered if the legs of one of them had been offered the legs of all may be offered the sages however say even if all the members with exception of one have been offered this one must go forth to the place of burning and the other one are Yohanan he infers that from the fact that Instead of Bam is written Baham and the other one Rab he does not expound from Baham instead of Bam but according to Rab granted that animals cannot be rejected forever if he wishes let him offer this and if he wishes let him offer the other Rab said Rab holds to the view of our Jose who said the command attaches properly to the first which view of our Jose are you referring to shall I say you say the view of our Jose concerning the baskets for we have been taught there were three baskets each of three seahs in which they took up terima out of the shekel chamber and on each of them was inscribed Aleph Beth and we have been taught our Jose said why is Aleph Beth inscribed upon them so that one may know out of which of them the terima was taken up out of the shekel chamber first to use it first for the command properly applies to the first but perhaps it is different there because at the time when the first is to be used the others are not ready for use yet. Rather is it our Hosea's view concerning the Passover sacrifice for it was taught if someone has separated his Passover sacrifice and it is lost and he thereupon puts aside another one in its place and afterwards the first one is found again so that both are standing ready to be used then he can offer up whichever he prefers this is the view of the sages our Hosea holds the commandment attaches properly to the first Talmud, Mas Yuma be but if the second one be very much better he shall offer it up. Rabbah said our mission points to be in accord with Rab whereas the Beretha is in accord with our Yohanan our mission is in accord with Rab for it reads if the one that was cast for the Lord died he the high priest should say let this on which the law for the
Offering is not left to die. This implies that one of an individual in such a case would be left to die now that will be right according to our Yohan and following our Abba in the name of Rab for our Abba said in the name of Rab Talmud. Mas Yuma all agree that if he had obtained atonement through the animal that had not been lost, the animal that had been lost must be left to die. But according to Rab, it would be as if someone had set aside two sin offerings as a guarantee that one of them should be available if the other be lost. And Arashai said if someone had set aside two sin offerings for the purpose of guarantee, he gains atonement through one of them and leaves the other to pasture. Since Rabba said that Rab followed the view of our Jose who holds a commandment properly attached to the first, it is as if it had from the very beginning been set aside in substitution for the one that was lost. We learned our Judah says it shall be left to die. It is quite right in the view of our. Yohanan who said that the second of the first peer must be left to pasture that is according to the rabbis and it is this one which according to our Judah be left to die so that he obtains atonement through the second one of the second peer but if the view of Rab who said that the second of the second peer must be left to pasture and it is this one which according to our Judah must be left to die then according to our Judah through which can he obtain atonement do you understand that our Judah refers to the second of the second peer our Judah refers to the second of the first peer others framed the above question against Rab in the following manner furthermore did our Judah say if the blood was poured away the scapegoat is left to die if the scapegoat died the blood is poured away now it is in order according to Rab in the first part of the mission they are disputing about the sin offering of the community and in the latter part about the rejection of living animals but according to our Yohanan, what does furthermore signify this difficulty remains furthermore said our Judah if the blood was poured away the scapegoat is left to die it is quite right that when the blood was poured away the scapegoat must die because the command with it had not been fulfilled but when the scapegoat died why should the blood be poured away surely the commandment therewith had been fulfilled the school of our Janay said scripture said the goat shall be set alive before the Lord to make atonement i.e. how long must he stay alive until the time that his fellow's blood is sprinkled we have learned elsewhere if the inhabitants of a town sent their shekels and they were stolen or lost and if Teramah has been taken up already they swear an oath before the temple treasurers and if not they swear an oath before the people of the town and the people of the town must pay the shekels anew if they were found again or the thieves restored them then both are taken as shekels and they do not Count as prepayment for the dues of the next year. Arjuda says they count for the next year. What is the reason of Arjuda's view? Rabba said Arjuda holds that obligatory offerings of one year may be brought up in the following year. Abbe raised the following objection against him. If the bullock or the he goat of the day of atonement were lost and he had set aside others in their place, also if the goats offered up for idolatry were lost and others were set aside for them, then they must all be left to die. This is the opinion of Arjuda. Our Eliezer and our Simeon hold they shall be left to pasture until they become blemished when they should be sold and the money realized for them should go for free will offerings for the sin offerings of the community must not be left to die. He Rabba answered Talmud, Masyuma, you speak about community sacrifices. It is different with community sacrifices, even as our Tabi said in the name of Arjusai, for our Tabi said in the name of Arjusai, scripture said. This is a burnt offering of every new moon throughout the months of the year. The Torah indicates renew and bring me an offering of the new terima that will be right concerning the goat. But can it be said in the case of the bullet preventive measure attaches to the bullet because of the goat and because of preventive measure shall they be left to die? And furthermore, the statement of Artavi in the name of Arjusai characterizes the action as merely a meritorious deed for Arjuna said. In the name of Samuel, it is a meritorious deed to offer the community sacrifices which are due in this and from the new terima. If he had offered them from the old, he has fulfilled his duty but has omitted a meritorious deed. Rather, said Arzira, the reason why they cannot be offered in the following year is because the lot of one year cannot determine for the following year. But let us cast lots again. There is a fear that people might say the lots do determine from one year for the next that. Will be reasonable as far as the goat is concerned, but what can be said about the bullet? The prohibition attaches to the bullet because of the goat and because of a preventive measure shall they be left to die. The rabbis before Abbe said that to be a preventive measure on account of a sin offering whose owner had died that will be right in the case of the goat. But what of the case of the bullet? The restriction in the case of the bullet derives from the goat and because of a preventive measure shall they be left to die. Rather, is it a restriction because of a sin offering whose year is past? Is that but a preventive measure? This is itself a sin offering whose year is past. This is no difficulty in accord with the view of Rabbi, for it was taught a full year. One counts three hundred and sixty-five days according to the year of the sun. This is the view of Rabbi. The sages say one counts twelve months from day to day. Talmud, Masyuma, and if the year be prolonged. Here the advantage belongs to the seller that is right as far as the goat is concerned but what can be said in the case of the bullet the preventive measure attaches to the bullet because of the goat and because of a preventive measure shall he be left to die and furthermore a sin offering whose first year is passed is left to pasture for Rush Lakish said as to a sin offering which has passed its year we look upon it as if it were standing on the cemetery and it is left to pasture. Rather said Rabbah is a restriction due to the fear of an offense for it was taught one may neither consecrate anything nor vow any valuation nor declare anything is devoted nowadays and if one had consecrated or vowed a valuation or declared anything is devoted if an animal it should be uprooted if fruits vessels or covers one should let them rot if money or metal vessels they are to be taken to the salt dead sea and what does uprooting mean locking the door before it so that it die of Itself, what kind of offense is here contemplated? If an offense in connection with the offering up that ought then to apply to other cases of pastoring animals, also if an offense in connection with shearing or working it, then that ought to apply to other pastoring animals too. In truth, the offense contemplated is one in connection with the offering up, but with those which are not to be offered up, one is not preoccupied. Whereas with this one, since it is to be offered up, he would be preoccupied. Now, as to the question itself, whether we fear the possibility of an offense, tannis are disputing for it was taught in one berith of Paschal lamb which was not offered up on the first Passover may be offered up on the second, and if not offered up on the second, may be offered up in the following year. And another berith taught it must not be offered up. Is it not then that they dispute touching the fear of an offense? No, all agree we are not apprehensive as to a possible offense, but here. They are disputing in the matter at issue between rabbi and the sages and there is no contradiction between the two berithas the one is in accord with rabbi the other with the rabbi sages but was it not taught the same applies to the money hence rather infer from here that they are disputing in regard to the fear of the offense that inference is accepted mission he then came to the scapegoat and laid his two hands upon it and he made confession and thus would he say I beseech thee o Lord thy people the house of Israel have failed committed iniquity and transgressed before thee I beseech thee O Lord atone the failures the iniquities and the transgressions which thy people the house of Israel have failed committed and transgressed before thee as it is written in the Torah of Moses thy servant to say for on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you from all your sins shall yet be clean before the Lord and when the priests and the people standing in the temple Court heard the fully pronounced name come forth from the mouth of the high priest. They bent their knees, bowed down, fell on their faces, and called out, Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. They handed it over to him who was to lead it away. All were permitted to lead it away, but the priests made it a definite rule not to permit an Israelite to lead it away. Our Jose said it once happened that Arsala of Sephoris led it away, although he was an Israelite, and they made a causeway for him because of the Babylonians who would pull its hair, shouting to it, Take and go forth, take and go forth, tomorrow. But he did not say the sons of Aaron, thy holy people, which Tana is of this opinion. Our Jeremiah said this is not in accord with our Judah, for if it were in accord with our Judah, surely he said they too obtained atonement from the scapegoat. Abbe said you might even say that it is in accord with our Judah. Are the priests not included in that people? Israel, our rabbis taught a man. Means to declare a non-priest eligible appointed Talmud, Masyuma B means that he must be prepared from the previous day appointed means that it is to send away even on the Sabbath appointed even if in a state of uncleanness you say man means to declare a non-priest eligible but that is obvious you might have thought that since the term Kapara atonement is written in connection therewith therefore he informs us as above app
Without issue, May one whitewash his house. He replied, May one whitewash his grave. His evasion was due not to his desire to divert them with words, counter questions, but because he never said anything that he had not heard from his teacher. A wise woman asked our Eliezer, since with regard to the offense with the golden calf, all were evenly associated. Why was not the penalty of death the same? He answered her, There is no wisdom in woman except with the distaff. Thus also does scripture say, and all the women that were was hearted did spin with their hands. It is stated, Rab and Levi are disputing in the matter. One said, Whosoever sacrificed and burned incense died by the sword. Whosoever embraced and kissed the calf died the death at the hands of heaven. Whosoever rejoiced in his heart died of dropsy. The other said, He who had sinned before witnesses and after receiving warning died by the sword. He who sinned before witnesses, but without previous warning by death, and he who sinned. Without witnesses and without previous warning died of dropsy. Rab Judah said the tribe of Levi did not participate in the idolatry as it is said. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. Rabbanah was sitting and reporting this teaching whereupon the sons of our papa B. Ab objected to Rabbanah who said of his father and of his mother I have not seen him etc. His father that is the father of his mother and Israelite brother the brother of his mother and Israelite sons that means the sons of his daughter. Which she had from an Israelite and they made a causeway for him etc. Rabbi B. Barhanna said these were not Babylonians but Alexandrians and because they the Palestinians hated the Babylonians they called them the Alexandrians by their the Babylonians name and was taught. Our Judah said they were not Babylonians but Alexandrians. Our Jose said to him may your mind be relieved even as you have relieved my mind. Mishnah some of the nobility of Jerusalem used to go with him up to the first booth. There were ten booths from Jerusalem to the Zat Talmud, Mas Yumai, a distance of ninety rias seven and a half of which make a mill at every booth. They would say to him, Here is food and here is water. They went with him from booth to booth except the last one, for he would not go with him up to the Zat, but stand from afar and behold what he was doing. What did he do? He divided the thread of crimson wool and tied one half to the rock, the other half between its horns and pushed it from behind, and it went rolling down. And before it had reached half its way downhill, it was dashed to pieces. He came back and sat down under the last booth until it grew dark. And from when on does it render his garments unclean? From the moment he has gone outside the wall of Jerusalem, our Simeon says, From the moment he pushes it into the Zat, Gemara, our rabbis taught there were ten booths and twelve mills distance. This is a view of our Meir, our Judah says nine booths and ten mills, our Jose says five booths and ten. Mills and they are all available by means of an Arab. Our Jose said, My son Eliezer suggested to me, as long as I have an Arab, two boots would do even for ten mills with whose view will agree what was taught, but not from the last booth, for nobody would go with him up to the Zot, but standing afar would behold what he was doing according to whom is this according to our Meir. At every booth they would say to him, Here is food and water. A tanda taught never did anyone who carried the goat away find it necessary to use it, but the reason of this provision is because you cannot compare one who has bread in his basket with one who has no bread in his basket. What did he do? He divided the thread of crimson wool, but let him tie the whole thread to the rock, since it is his duty to complete his work with the he goat. Perhaps the thread might become fast white and he would be satisfied, but let him tie the whole thread between its horns at times its head in falling is bent and he would not pay. Attention our rabbis taught in the beginning they would tie the thread of crimson wool on the entrance of the ulam without if it became white they rejoiced if it did not become white they were sad and ashamed thereupon they arranged to tie it to the entrance of the ulam within but they were still peeping through and if it became white they rejoiced whereas if it did not become white they grew sad and ashamed thereupon they arranged to tie one half to the rock and the other half between its horns are Nahum B. Papa said in the name of our Eliezer Hakapa originally they used to tie the thread of crimson wool to the entrance of the ulam within and as soon as the ego reached the wilderness it turned white and they knew that the commandment concerning it had been fulfilled as it is said if your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white wool before it had reached half its way downhill the question was raised as to those limbs pieces are they permitted for general use rab and Samuel are in dispute on this point. One saying they are permitted, the other they are forbidden. The one who holds they are permitted argues thus Talmud. Mas Yuma before it is written in the wilderness, the one who holds they are forbidden argues because Scripture says cut off. But as for him who considers them forbidden, for what purpose does he use the word wilderness? He needs it in accord with what was taught into the wilderness to the wilderness in the wilderness that means to include Nob, Gibeon, and Shiloh and the permanent house. And what does the other teacher do with cut off? He needs it in accord with what was taught. Gizura. The term Gizura means something that is cut off. Another explanation Gizura means something that goes to pieces as it goes down. Another interpretation Gizura. Perhaps you might say this is a vain thing. Therefore the text reads, I am the Lord. I have decreed it, and you are not permitted to criticize it. Rabbi said the view of him who says they are. Permitted is more reasonable for the Torah did not say send away to create possibility of offense our rabbis taught as a zealot should be hard and rough one might have assumed that it is to be an inhabited land therefore the text reads in the wilderness but whence do we know that it is to be in Azak therefore the text reads cut off another bury the taught as a zealot the hardest of mountains thus also does it say and the mighty Eli of the land he took away the school of our Ishmael taught as a zealot was so called because it obtains atonement for the affair of Hosea and Azal our rabbis taught my ordinances shall ye do i.e. such commandments which if they were not written in scripture they should by right have been written and these are they the laws concerning idolatry star worship immorality and bloodshed robbery and blasphemy and my statutes shall ye keep i.e. such commandments to which Satan objects they are those relating to the putting on of Shad the Halizah. Performed by a sister in law the purification of the leper and the ego to be sent away, and perhaps you might think these are vain things. Therefore, Scripture says, I am the Lord, i.e., the Lord have made it a statute, and you have no right to criticize it. From what on does it render his garments unclean? Our rabbis taught only he who is to take the goat away renders his garments unclean, but he who sends the appointed man away does not render his garments unclean. One might have assumed that he does so as soon as he goes forth outside from the wall of the temple court. Therefore, the text reads, He that let go if you derive from he that let go. One might infer that only when he reaches Zot, therefore, the text reads, And he that let go, how then is it? Our Judah says, As soon as he goes out of the walls of Jerusalem, our Jose says, Azazel and wash are written in close proximity, i.e., only when he reaches the Zot, our Simeon says, And he that let go, the goat for Azazel shall wash his. Clothes, i.e., he flings it down headlong, and his garments become then unclean. Mishnah, he the high priest came to the bullock and the he goat that were to be burned. He cut them open and took out the sacrificial portions and put them on a tray and burnt them upon the altar. He twisted them the beasts around carrying poles and brought them out to the place of burning. From what time do they render garments unclean after they have gone outside the wall of the temple court? Our Simeon says, From the moment the fire has taken hold of most of them, Gemara, and he burnt them up. How could that thought arise? And you rather say to burn them later on the altar? He twisted them around carrying poles. Our Yohan and said so in the form of a network. Attended taught he did not cut them up as one cuts up the flesh of a burnt offering, but he left the skin on the flesh. Whence do we know this? Because it was taught. Rabbi said it is said here skin flesh and dung, and it is said their skin flesh and. Dung Talmud, Mas Yuma, just as above it is carried forth by means of cutting up and not by flaying, so here also it is by means of cutting up and not by flaying. Whence do we know it? Therefore it was taught and its inwards and its dung, and he shall carry forth that teaches that he must carry it forth complete. One might have assumed that he must also burn it complete. Therefore it is said here with its head and with its legs, and there also it is said its head and its legs, hence just as there. It is offered by means of cutting up, so here also it is carried forth by means of cutting up. One might assume that just as there it is by means of flaying, so here too, therefore the text reads and its inwards and its dung. How is this implied in the scriptural text? Our Papa answered, just as the dung is enclosed in the inward, so shall the flesh be enclosed in the skin. From what time do they render garments unclean, etc.? Our rabbis taught and the bullock and the he shall carry. Forth without the camp, and they shall burn there. You will them three camps, and here only one camp. And why does it read without the camp to tell you as soon as he goes
Garments unclean but not he who kindles the fire nor he who puts the wood in order and who is he that burneth he who assists at the time of the burning one might have assumed that even after they have become ashes they shall still defile the garments therefore scripture says am I only as long as they are they do they defile the garments but not once they have become ashes are Eliezer son of Arsimian says the bullock itself defiles the garments but when the flesh is burned too hard lumps it. No more defile the garments what is the difference between the two views if it has been reduced to lumps of charred flesh Mishnah they said to the high priest that he goat has reached the wilderness and whence did they know that the he goat had reached the wilderness they used to set up guards at stations and from these towels would be waved thus would they know that the he goat had reached the wilderness or Judah said but did they not have a great sign from Jerusalem to Beth Hidado was three. Mills they could walk a mill return the mill and tarry the time it takes to walk a mill and thus know that the he goat had reached the wilderness or Ishmael said but they had another sign to a thread of crimson wool was tied to the door of the temple and when the he goat reached the wilderness the thread turned white as it is written though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow Gamara said one may infer from here that Beth Hidado is in the wilderness and this is what he the Tana of the Mishnah informs us that our Judah holds as soon as the Egot has reached the wilderness the commandment concerning it is fulfilled C-H-A-P-T-E-R-B-I-I Mishnah the high priest then came to read if he wished to read in linen garments he could do so otherwise he would read in his own white vestments the synagogue attendant would take a scroll of the law and give it to the head of the synagogue and the head of the synagogue gave it to the second and the second gave it to the high priest and the high priest stands and receives it and reads the section beginning after the death and how be it on the tenth then he would roll up the scroll of the law and put it in his bosom and say more than what I have read out before you is written here and on the tenth which is in the book of numbers he recites by heart and he recites in connection there with eight benedictions for the law for the temple service for the thanksgiving for the forgiveness of sins and for the temple. Separately and for Israel, separately and for Jerusalem, separately for the priests, separately and for the rest of the prayer. He who sees the high priest when he reads does not see the bullock and the ego that are being burnt, and he that sees the bullock and the ego that are being burnt does not see the high priest when he reads. Not that he was not permitted, but because the distance apart was great and both rites were performed at the same time. Gemara, since it states in his own life, vestment the inference is that reading is not a temple service, and then it states if he wished to read in the linen garments, he could do so. From which one may learn that priestly garments may be enjoyed for private use. Perhaps it is different with reading because it is a necessity for the temple service. For the question was raised: Are the priestly garments allowed for private use or not allowed? Come and here they would nor sleep in the holy garments. Now they could not sleep in them, but. They could eat in them perhaps it is different with the eating because it is necessary for the service for it was taught and they shall eat those things wherewith atonement was made this teaches that the priest eat and the owner obtains atonement they could not sleep in them but could they walk around in them in truth they might not walk around in them either Talmud, Masyuma but it is necessary to make special mention of sleep on account of the last clause they may take them off fold them and put them under the head they may take them off fold them and put them under the head you may infer then hence that priestly garments may be enjoyed for private use our Papa said do not say under their heads but rather say next to their heads our Meshashia said you may infer hence that one may keep the tefillin next to oneself whilst asleep it is also logical that the meaning here is next to their heads for if the thought should arise in you that it means under their heads surely. You ought to derive the prohibition of that on account of the mixed texture of wool and linen for among the garments which consisted of a mixed texture is also the girdle so that even if the private enjoyment of priestly garments is permitted surely here he is deriving benefit from a mixed texture that will be right according to the view that the girdle of the high priest on the day of atonement is identical with the girdle of the common priest during the rest of the year but what can be said according to the view that the girdle of the high priest is not identical with that of the commoner and if you were to say mixed textures are forbidden only for wearing and putting on but not for lying on surely was it not taught neither shall there come upon the i.e. but you may spread it under you but the sages declare that this too is forbidden because a fringe of the mattress etc might wind itself round the flesh and if you were to say something was placed in between but did not our Simeon Bipazi in the name of our Joshua believe I say on the authority of Rabbi in the name of the holy community of Jerusalem even if there were ten mattress covers one on top of the other with mixed textures under them it would still be forbidden to sleep on them rather therefore must you say the meaning is next to their heads this is conclusive our Ashi said in reality read under their heads and as to the question but he would enjoy mixed textures the answer is priestly garments are stiff for even so did our Hunasan of our Joshua say the shrunk felt cloth of Nourish is permitted come and here as to priestly garments it is forbidden to go out in them in the province but in the sanctuary whether during or outside the time of the service it is permitted to wear them because priestly garments are permitted for private use this is conclusive but in the province it is not permitted surely it was taught 25th of Tebeth is the day of Mount Gerizim on which no morning is permitted it is the day on which the Kutians demanded the house of our God from Alexander the Macedonian so as to destroy it and he had given them the permission whereupon some people came and informed Simeon that just what did the latter do he put on his priestly garments robed himself in priestly garments some of the noblemen of Israel went with him carrying fiery torches in their hands they walked all the night some walking on one side and others on the other side until the dawn rose when the dawn rose he Alexander said to them who are these the Samaritans they answered the Jews who rebelled against you as he reached Antipatris the sun having shown forth they met when he saw Simeon the just he descended from his carriage and bowed down before him they said to him a great king like yourself should bow down before this Jew he answered his image it is which wins for me in all my battles he said to them what have you come for they said is it possible that star worshippers should Mislead you to destroy the house wherein prayers are said for you and your kingdom that it be never destroyed. He said to them, Who are these? They said to him, These are Kutians who stand before you. He said, They are delivered into your hand at once. They perforated their heels, tied them to the tails of their horses, and dragged them over thorns and thistles until they came to Mount Gerizim, which they plowed and planted with vetch, even as they had planned to do with the house of God. And that day they made a festive day. If you like, say they were fit to be priestly garments, or if you like, say it is time to work for the Lord, they have made void thy law. The synagogue attendant would take a scroll of the law, one may infer from here that one may shew honor to the disciple in the presence of his master. Abbe said, It is all done for the sake of the high priest, and the high priest stands from this. You can infer that he was sitting before, but surely we have learned Talmud, Masum be nobody. May sit down in the temple court except the kings of the house of David alone as it is said and David the king went in and sat before the Lord it is as Arhista had explained elsewhere in the women's court so also here in the women's court where was Arhista's statement made in connection with the following an objection was raised it was taught where did they read therein in the temple our Eliezer B. Jacob said on the temple mount as it is said and he read therein before the broad place that was before the water gate and Arhista said in the women's court and Ezra blessed the Lord the great God what does great imply our Joseph said in the name of Rab he magnified him by pronouncing the ineffable name Argidal said he recited blessed be the Lord the God of Israel from everlasting even to everlasting said Abe to Ardimi but perhaps it means that he magnified him by pronouncing the ineffable name he answered one does not pronounce the ineffable name outside the limits of it. Temple, but may one not is it not written? And Ezra the scribe stood upon the pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And Ezra praised the great God and Argidal, commenting thereupon, said he magnified him by pronouncing the ineffable name that was a decision in an emergency. And they cried with a great loud voice unto the Lord their God, What did they cry? Woe, woe, it is he who has destroyed the sanctuary, burnt the temple, killed all the righteous, driven all Israel into exile, and is still dancing around among us. Thou hast surely given him to us so that we may receive reward through him. We want neither him nor reward through him. Thereupon the tablet fell down from heaven for them, whereupon the word truth was inscribed. Our Hannah said, One may learn therefrom that the seal of the Holy One, blessed be he is truth. They ordered a fast of three days and three nights, whereupon he was surrendered to them. He came forth from the Holy of Holies like a young fiery lion thereupon it. Prophet said to Israel, This is the evil desire of idolatry, as it is said, and he
of the great synod because they restored the crown of the divine attributes to its ancient completeness for Moses had come and said the great God the mighty and the awful then Jeremiah came and said aliens are destroying his temple where are then his awful deeds hence he omitted the attribute the awful Daniel came and said aliens are enslaving his sons where are his mighty deeds hence he omitted the word mighty but they came and said on the contrary therein lie his mighty deeds that he suppresses his wrath that he extends long suffering to the wicked therein lie his awful powers for but for the fear of him how could one single nation persist among the many nations but how could the earlier rabbis abolish something established by Moses or Eliezer said since they knew that the holy one blessed be he insists on truth they would not ascribe false things to him and he read after the death and how be it on the tenth day a question was raised one may skip in reading from it Prophets, but one may not skip in reading from the Torah. That is no difficulty. The one prohibition applies where the passage skipped is sufficiently long to interrupt the interpreter. The other where it is not sufficiently long to interrupt the interpreter. But surely it is in connection therewith that it was taught. One may skip in reading from the prophets, but one may not skip in reading from the Torah. And how much may be skipped in the prophets so much as is not sufficiently long to interrupt the interpreter. This implies that in reading from the Torah, one may not skip at all. Said Abay, there is no difficulty. The permission applies here where one theme is concerned. The prohibition there where two themes are concerned. Thus also it was taught one may skip in the reading from the Torah if the theme be one and same in reading from the prophets. Even if two themes be involved in each case, however, only when it is not sufficiently long to interrupt the interpreter, nor may one. Skip from one prophet Eichel book to another but in case of one of the twelve minor prophets one may skip even from one book to another Talmud, Masyuma provided one does not skip from the end of the book to its beginning then he would roll up the scroll of the law etc. Why all that so as not to discredit the scroll of the law and on the tenth which is in the book of Numbers he recited by heart why that let him roll up the scroll and read from it again Arhuna the son of Arjashua said in the name of Arshis hate because it is not proper to roll up a scroll of the law before the community because of respect for the community then one should bring another scroll and read there from Arhuna son of Arjuda said because it would discredit the first scroll Resh Lakish said because of an unnecessary blessing but we do take into consideration the reason that it would discredit the first scroll has not our Isaac the Smith said if the beginning of the month of Tevate falls on it. Sabbath one brings three scrolls of the Torah and reads from one about the affairs of the day and the second about the new moon and the third about Hanukkah. Three men reading from three scrolls do not imply a discredit for the first and second scroll. One man reading from two scrolls does thereupon he pronounced eight blessings are rabbis taught for the Torah as one pronounces it in the synagogue for the temple service for the thanksgiving for the forgiving of iniquity as usual for the sanctuary separately for the priests separately for Israel separately and for the rest of the prayer are rabbis taught the rest of the prayer except my song petition supplication before thee for that people Israel which are in need of salvation he would conclude with blessed art thou O Lord who here canest unto prayer thereupon each would bring a scroll of the Torah from his house and read therefrom in order to shew the multitude its beauty he who sees the high priest not that it was not Permitted, etc. That is self evident. You might have thought as Resh Lakish does, for Resh Lakish said one must not permit a Mizwah to pass by unnoticed, and what Mizwah is there here in the multitude of the people is the king's glory. Therefore, we are informed that it was permitted. Mishnah, if he read in the garments of linen, he would then sanctify his hands and feet, strip off his clothes, go down and immerse himself, come up and dry himself. The gold investments would be brought to him. He put them on sanctified his hands and feet, went out, offered up his own ram and the ram of the people, and the seven unblemished one year old lambs. This is the view of our Eliezer, our Akiva said these were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the morning, whereas the bullock for the whole offering and the he goat which is offered up outside were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the afternoon. He then sanctified his hands and feet, stripped off his clothes, went down and immersed. Himself came up and dried himself. The white vestments would be brought to him. He put them on and sanctified his hands and his feet. Then he would go in to bring out the little and the fire pan. He would sanctify his hands and feet, strip off his clothes, go down and immerse himself. Come up and dry himself. The golden garments would be brought to him. He put them on, sanctified his hands and feet, and went in to burn up the afternoon incense and to trim the lamps. He sanctified his hands and feet and strip. Then he went down, immersed himself, came up and dried himself. They would then bring to him his own garments. He put them on. They would accompany him to his house. He would arrange for a day of festivity for his friends whenever he had come forth from the sanctuary in peace. Kamara, the question was raised: How does he or Akiva mean that the seven lamps were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the morning, whereas the bullock for the whole offering and the he goat, which is Offered up outside were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the afternoon, or did he mean perhaps this they were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the morning and together also with them the bullock for the whole offering, whereas the he goat which is offered up outside is offered up together with the daily whole offering of the afternoon. Furthermore, when according to our Eliezer who omits reference to him is the bullock for the whole offering being sacrificed. Furthermore, according to both our Eliezer and our Akiva, when are the sacrificial portions of the sin offering smoked, Rabbah said you have no properly arranged order of the service except you adopt either the view of our Eliezer as taught in the school of Samuel or the view of our Akiva as reported in the Tisipta for the school of Samuel taught our Eliezer said he went forth prepared his own ram and the ram of the people and the sacrificial portions of the sin offering but the bullock for the whole. Offering and the seven lambs and the he goat that was offered up outside were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the afternoon. What is the teaching of our Akiva is recorded in the Tisipta for it was taught our Akiva said the bullock for the whole offering and the seven lambs were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the morning as it is said, Ye shall offer these beside the burnt offering of the morning, which is for a continual burnt offering after that the service of the day Talmud, Masyuma be and after that the he goat which is to be offered outside as it is said, one he goat for a sin offering beside the sin offering of atonement, and after that his own ram and the ram of the people, after that the sacrificial portions of the sin offering, and after that the daily whole offering of the afternoon. What is the reason for our Eliza's view? He the high priest performs the service in accord with the order written in scriptures text first he Performs what Leviticus enjoins and then he performs what numbers prescribes and our Akiva it is in accord with the reason he himself states beside the burnt offering of the morning which is for a continual burnt offering which shows that the additional sacrifices were offered up together with the daily whole offering of the morning what does our Eliezer do with the passage beside the sin offering of atonement he uses it for the teaching both atone for similar kinds of sins our Judah said in his our Akiva's name one is offered up together with the daily whole offering of the morning and six with the daily whole offering of the afternoon our Eliezer son of our Simeon said in his name six were offered up with the daily whole offering of the morning and one together with the daily whole offering of the evening what is the reason of the rabbis there are two verses written it is written beside the burnt offering of the morning and it is written and he come forth and offer his burnt offering he Therefore prepares one part with the one and the other with the other wherein are they disputing our Judah holds he offered one first as it is written beside the burnt offering of the morning and then he performed the service of the day because of a possible weakness of the high priest our Simeon B. Eliezer holds since he once started he performs the service of the six lest he be negligent and will not offer them after the service of the day but as to the service to that day he is zealous all. At any rate agree that it was but one ram according to whose view is that in accord with rabbi for it was taught rabbi says the one ram spoken of here is the same ram which is mentioned in the book of numbers our Eliezer son of our Simeon says two rams are involved one mentioned here the other in the book of numbers what is the ground of rabbi's view because scripture says one and our Eliezer son of our Simeon one here means the unique outstanding one of his flock and rabbi he infers that from and all your choice vows and our Eliezer son of our Simeon one refers to obligatory offerings the other to voluntary ones and a statement concerning both is necessary he would sanctify his hands and feet our rabbis taught and Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting for what purpose does he enter to fetch ladle and fire pan Talmud, Masyuma for the whole portion here follows the order with the exception of this verse why are his
That burneth, i.e., just as the letting go takes place before, so does the burning. On the contrary, say, just as the burning takes place now, so does the letting go take place now. And he that letteth go implies to that which was referred to before. Rabbis said, Scripture says, But the goat for Azazel shall be set alive. How long must it needs be set alive until the time of atonement? Now, when is the time of atonement? At the time when the blood is sprinkled, not beyond it, when he who was to take. The he goat away came back and met the high priest in the street. He would say to him, Sir high priest, we have fulfilled your request. If he met him in his house, he would say to him, We have fulfilled the request of him who grants life to all who live. Rabbis said, When rabbis in Pamatiah would take leave of each other, they would say, May he who grants life to all who live grant you a long, happy, and right life. I shall walk before the Lord in the lands of the living. Rab Judah said that means it. Place of markets, public thoroughfare for length of days and years of life and peace will they add to you. But are there years which are years of life and years which are not years of life? Our Eliezer said these are such years of men as have changed from evil to good unto you. O men, I call our Berkia said they are the disciples of the wise who resemble women and do mighty deeds like men. Our Berkia also said if a man wishes to offer a libation upon the altar, let him fill the throat of it. Disciples of the wise with wine as it is said unto you, O men, Ishim, I call furthermore did our Berkia say if a man sees that Torah ceases from his seed, let him marry the daughter of a disciple of the wise as it is said though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground. Talmud, Masium be it through the scent of water it will bud and put forth boughs like a plant and a festive day he would arrange for his friends. Our rabbis taught it happened with a hot. Priest that as he came forth from the sanctuary all the people followed him but when they saw Shemaiah and Abtalion they forsook him and went after Shemaiah and Abtalion eventually Shemaiah and Abtalion visited him to take their leave of the high priest he said to them may the descendants of the heathen come in peace they answered him may the descendants of the heathen who do the work of Aaron arrive in peace but the descendant of Aaron who does not do the work of Aaron he shall not come in peace mission the high priest performs the service in eight pieces of garments and the common priest in four in tunic drawers mitre and girdle the high priest adds there to the breastplate the apron the robe and the frontlet and these were the urim and thummim inquired of but they were not inquired of except for the king for the Beth Din or for one whom the community needs Gemara or rabbis taught all things in connection with which the word Shishvan linen is said had their threads. Sixfold twine denotes eightfold threads, the robe had its threads, twelvefold the curtain, twenty-fourfold the breastplate and apron, twenty-eightfold whence do we know that they had their threads, sixfold scripture said, and they made the tunics of fine linen, the mitre of fine linen, and the goodly head tires of fine linen, and the linen bridges of fine twine linen. Here are five scriptural references, one is necessary for the subject itself, that they must be made of flax, one that their thread shall be sixfold, one to indicate that they must be twisted, one that this applies also to other garments in connection with which the term shish is not used, and once that it is indispensable, what indicates that the word shish means flax are Jose Behan and a said scripture says bad linen, i.e. whatever comes out of the soil singly, but say perhaps it is wool, wool splits off, but flax also splits flax splits into branches through beating rub and a said I infer it from this, they shall have linen. Tires upon their heads and shall have linen bridges upon their loins said Arashi to him but whence did they know that before Ezekiel came but according to your argument what of Arhista's statement this matter we have learned not from the Torah of Moses but from the words of Ezekiel be no alien uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary who taught this before Ezekiel came rather must you say that it was traditionally handed down and when Ezekiel came he strengthened it by attaching it to scripture in our case here too it was a traditional teaching and Ezekiel strengthened it by attaching it to scripture whence do we know that twine denotes eightfold thread scripture says and they made upon the skirts of the robe pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet twine one may infer from the analogy of twine used in connection with the curtain just as there each twine thread was twenty-fourfold so also here was a twenty-fourfold bit thread of each kind of material being eightfold, but one should infer from breastplate and apron just as there it was twenty-eightfold so also here twenty-eightfold one may infer a thing in connection with which gold is not mentioned from another thing in connection with which gold is not mentioned that excludes the breastplate and apron in connection with which gold is mentioned on the contrary one should rather infer concerning one garment from another garment which would exclude it. Curtain because that in a sense is a tent rather if it is inferred from the girdle thus inferring concerning a garment in connection with which gold is not mentioned from another garment in connection with which gold is not mentioned but not inferring concerning anything in connection with which gold is mentioned from something in connection with which gold is mentioned Armari said scripture said thou shalt make it i.e. only nothing else Arashi said and thou shalt make i.e. all the work in. Connection therewith must be the same now. How is that possible if he were to make the three kinds tenfold each there would be thirty threads and if one made two ninefold and one tenfold but scripture said and thou shalt make i.e. all the work in connection therewith must be alike whence do we know that the robe had its threads twelvefold because scripture said and thou shalt make the robe of the ephod Talmud, Masyum a plated of blue and one may infer from the analogy of blue used also in connection with the curtain just as there each of the materials had its threads sixfold so also sixfold here but let us infer from the skirt and the pomegranates just as there it was eightfold thus also here eightfold one may infer for one garment from another but one may not infer for a garment from an adornment to a garment on the contrary one may infer concerning a matter from the matter itself but one may not infer for a thing from something outside thereof for that reason we said one two. Inform us concerning other garments in connection with which she is not used the curtain twenty-fourfold four strands of material each of sixfold threads there being here neither controversy nor decision whence do we know that each twine thread of breastplate and apron was twenty-eightfold because it is written and thou shalt make a breastplate of judgment the work of the skillful workman like the work of the ephod thou shalt make it of gold of blue and purple and scarlet and fine. Twine linen four kinds of material each sixfold amount to twenty-four threads and of the gold one thread to each of the sixfold threads of the four materials four threads together twenty-eightfold twine perhaps the gold two was sixfold our Ahabi Jacob said scripture said and they did beat the gold into thin plates and cut it into threads that means four Arashi said scripture states to work it in the blue and in the purple how should that be done shall one make the gold four times in. Twofold that would amount to eightfold gold thread shall one make it twice twofold and twice a one single thread surely the word make indicates that all the work in connection therewith must be alike Rehubba said in the name of Arjuna one who makes a tear in priestly garments is to be punished with lashes for scripture said that it be not rent our Ahabi Jacob demurred to this perhaps this is what the divine law says make a hem lest it be torn but is it written lest it be torn our Eliezer said one who removes the breastplate from the apron or who removes the staves of the ark receives the punishment of lashes because it was said that it be not loose from the ephod and the staves they shall not be removed from it to this our Ahabi Jacob demurred but perhaps this is what the divine law says fasten them and arrange them properly by forcing the cords through the ring so that they be not loose or that they be not removed is it written that they be not loose or that they be not Removed our Jose Behan and pointed out a contradiction. It is written the staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it, and it is also written the staves thereof shall be put into the rings. How is that possible? They were movable but could not slip off. Thus also was it taught the staves shall be in the rings of the ark. One might have assumed that they could not be moved from their place. Therefore the text reads and the staves thereof shall be put into the rings if I had. This verse to go by one might have assumed that they could be taken out and put in again. Therefore the text says the staves shall be in the rings of the ark. How that now they were movable but could not slip off our hand of Behan and said what is the meaning of the verse thou shalt make the boards of the tabernacle of acacia wood standing up, i.e. they should stand up even as they grow another interpretation standing up, i.e. they kept up the gold they were overlaid with another interpretation. Standing up one might assume their hope of restoration is gone, their expectation is frustrated, therefore the text says standing up, i.e. standing up forever and ever. Rabbi Habibi Hanan said what is the meaning of the text of plated Talmud, Masyum of the garments for ministering in the holy place, but for the priestly garments there
remains alien to him or Johan and pointed out another contradiction it is written make the an ark of wood and it is also written and they shall make an ark of acacia wood hence one learns that the inhabitants of his city are obliged to do the work of the scholar for him within and without shalt thou overlay it Rabbah said any scholar whose inside is not like his outside is no scholar of a or as some say Rabbah Beulah said he is called abominable as it is said how much less one that is abominable and impure man who drink iniquity like water are Samuel be Namani in the name of our Jonathan what is the meaning of the scriptural statement wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom seeing he hath no understanding i.e. woe unto the enemies of the scholars who occupy themselves with the Torah but have no fear of heaven our Janet proclaimed woe unto him who has no court but makes a gateway for his court Rabbah said to the sages I beseech you do not inherit a double Gehenna Mar. Joshua believe I said what is the meaning of the scriptural verse and this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel if he is meritorious it becomes for him a medicine of life if not a deadly poison that is what Rabbah meant when he said if he uses it the right way it is a medicine of life unto him he who does not use it the right way it is a deadly poison our Samuel be Namani said our Jonathan pointed out the following contradiction it is written the precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart, but it is also written the word of the Lord is tried if he is meritorious, it rejoices him if not it tries him. Reshlakish said from the body of the same passage this can be derived if he is meritorious, it tests him unto life, if not it tests him unto death. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Our Hannah said this refers to one who studies the Torah in purity. What does that mean? He marries a woman and afterwards studies the Torah. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple, our high Abba said it the Torah may be entrusted to testify as to those who study it. The work of the skillful workman, the work of the skillful embroiderer, our Eliezer said those embroidered over what they had traced it was taught in the name of our Nehemiah. The embroiderer's is needlework, therefore it has only one visible figure. The designer's is weaving work, therefore it has two different figures in these were the Urim and Thummim inquired of when our Dimi came from. Palestine, he said, in the garments wherein the high priest officiates, the priest anointed for battle officiates, as it is said, and the holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him, i.e., for him who comes after him in greatness of office. Our Adabi, I have some say, he raised an objection. One might have assumed that the son of the anointed for battle succeeds him in service, even as the son of the high priest succeeds him in service. Talmud, Masyuma, Talmud, Masyuma, therefore the text reads, Seven days shall the son that is priest in his stead put them on, even he who cometh into the tent of meeting, etc., i.e., he who is worthy of entering the tent of meeting. Now, if this were the case, then he too would be fit to enter the tent of meeting. Our Naman B. Isaac said, This is what it means, whosoever was mainly anointed for the purpose of the tent of meeting that excludes him who was anointed mainly for battle. The following objection was raised, the anointed for battle officiates. Neither in four garments like a common priest nor in aid like a high priest have they said would you render him than a common man rather neither like a high priest for the sake of preventing ill feeling nor like a common priest because one promotes to a higher degree of sanctity but one must not degrade our Adabi Ahabah said to Rabbah but there is a tana who pays no attention to the prevention of ill feeling yet according to him he does not officiate for it was taught in the following points a high priest differs from a common priest the bullock of the priest anointed and the bullock due in case of unwitting transgression of any commandment the bullock of the day of atonement the tenth of the ephah he does not unbind his hair nor rent his clothes but he the high priest tears his garments from below and the common priest tears his from above he must not defile himself for his deceased relatives he is under obligation to marry only a virgin is prohibited from marrying a widow Causes the slayer to return as one in mourner he may offer up a sacrifice but may not eat or take a share thereof he receives his portion first and takes first part in the offering of the sacrifice he officiates in eight garments is exempt from a sacrifice for an unwitting transgression of defilement relating to the sanctuary and its hallowed thing and the whole service of the day of atonement is legitimate only when performed by him all these laws apply also to priests consecrated by a larger number of official garments with the exception of the bullock to be offered up for the transgression of any commandment all these apply to the high priest who has passed from his high priesthood with the exception of the bullock of the day of atonement and the tenth of the eva all these things do not apply to the priest anointed for battle with the exception of five matters mentioned in that portion of the section he does not unbind his hair nor rent his clothes nor defile himself with any deceased relative is obliged to marry a virgin forbidden to marry a widow and causes the slayer to return according to our Judah whereas according to the sages he does not cause him to return whence does he the Tana consider the question of enmity to arise only with regard to one of similar rank but with one of inferior rank he does consider it our Abba was sitting and reporting this teaching in the name of our Yohanan whereupon our Mi and RC averted their faces some say it was our Ibi Abba who reported this teaching whereupon our Mi and RC averted their faces to this our Papa demurred granted that they could not say anything against our Abba because of the high regard the imperial house had for him but as for our Ibi Abba they should have told him explicitly that our Yohanan had not said so when Rabin came he said this was stated with reference to the time when he is consulted thus also was it taught the garments which the high priest wears when he officiates it. Anointed for battle wears when he is consulted our rabbis taught how were the Urim and Thummim inquired of the inquirer had his face directed to him who was consulted and the latter directed himself to the divine presence the inquirer said shall I pursue after this troop he who was consulted answered thus saith the Lord go up and succeed our Judah said he need not say the saith the Lord but only go up and succeed one does not inquire in a loud voice as it is said who shall inquire for him. Neither shall one but think thereof in one's heart as it is said who shall inquire for him but rather in the manner in which Hannah spoke in her prayer as it is said now Hannah she spoke in her heart one should not put two questions at the same time if one has done so only one question is answered and only the first question is answered as it is said will the men of Hila deliver me up into his hand will Saul come down etc and the Lord said he will come down but you said only the first. Question is answered David had asked Talmud, Masyuma be in wrong order and received his answer in right order and as soon as he knew that he had asked in wrong order he asked again in right order as it is said will the men of Hila deliver up me and my men into the hand of Saul and the Lord said they will deliver thee up but if the occasion required both questions both were answered as it is said and David inquired of the Lord saying shall I pursue after this troop shall I overtake them? And he answered him pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them and shalt without fail recover all and although the decree of the prophet could be revoked the decree of the Urim and Thummim could not be revoked as it is said by the judgment of the Urim why were they called Urim and Thummim Urim because they made their words enlightening Thummim because they fulfilled their words and if you should ask why did they not fulfill their words in Jabu Benjamin it is because they did not inquire whether. The result would be victory or defeat, but at last, when conquered, did the Urim and Thummim approved their action as it is said, and Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver him into thy hand. How was it affected? Our Yohanan said, The letters stood forth, Reshlakish said, They joined each other, but the Zayd was missing. Our Samuel B. Isaac said, They contained also the names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the Tate too was missing. Our Ahabi Jacob said, They contained also the words the tribes of Jeshur, and an objection was raised. No priest was inquired of who does not speak by means of the Holy Spirit, and upon whom the divine presence does not rest. For Zadok inquired and succeeded, whilst Abiathar inquired and failed, as it is said, but Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. He Helped along and one inquired only for a king whence do we know these things are about said scripture said and he shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim i.e. the king and all the children of Israel with him i.e. the priest anointed for battle even all the congregation that is the Sanhedrin C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I mission on the day of atonement it is forbidden to eat to drink to wash to anoint oneself to put on sandals or to have marital intercourse a king or bride may wash the face and a woman after childbirth may put on sandals this
and we raised the point in connection there with why should he be culpable? Surely he stands committed to the oath from Mount Sinai on and Rab Samuel and Aryohanan in reply said it is a case when he includes things permitted in the oath touching foods forbidden, whereas Resh Lakish said this cannot be explained except where he either expressly refers to less than the legal quantity and that in accord with the view of the sages or that he made a general statement Talmud, Mas Yuma and in accord with Arakiva who said that a man may prohibit to himself anything in any quantity however small and if you would say that since it is permitted by the Torah the law relating to the sacrifice for an oath is operative surely we learned an oath of testimony applies only to those qualified to bear witness and we raised the point what does that mean to exclude whereupon our Papa said this excludes a king and our Ahabi Jacob said this excludes a professional dice gambler now a dice player as far as biblical law is concerned is qualified to bear witness and only the rabbis declared him unfit and yet an oath does not apply to him there it is different for scripture said if you do not utter it and this man cannot make a valid utterance now would you say that wherever the punishment is extirpation the term forbidden is not used surely it was taught although the term forbidden was used in connection with all of them the punishment of extirpation applies only to him who eats or drinks or engages in labor this is what is said when the term forbidden is used it is applied but to less than the legal minimum but where the legal minimum has been transgressed the punishment involved is extirpation and also extirpation is the penalty that is the case only with him who eats or drinks or engages in labor or if you like say when the Mishnah uses the term forbidden it refers to the rest of the transgressions for Rabbah and are Joseph taught in the other books of the school of Rab. Whence do we know that it is forbidden on the day of atonement to anoint oneself to wash to put on shoes and to have marital intercourse therefore the text reads it is a Sabbath of solemn rest unto you to turn to the main text as for the matter of less than the legal minimum are you and said it is forbidden by biblical law whilst Rush Lakish said it is permitted by biblical law you and said it is forbidden by biblical law since it could be joined to form a minimum it is forbidden food that he is eating Rush Lakish said it is permitted by biblical law for the divine law speaks of eating and this is not eating are you and raised the following objection against Rush Lakish I know only that whatsoever involves punishment is subject to a prohibition but in the case of the koi and what is less than the legal minimum since they do not involve punishment I might say that they are not subject to a prohibition either therefore the text reads no fat this is only rabbinical and it Text is but a mere support and that is also logical for if one should assume that the prohibition is biblical surely the status of the koi is doubtful and no scriptural text is necessary to cover a doubtful case were it only for this there would be no argument they would hold Talmud, Mas Yuma be the koi is a creature by itself for if you were not to say so how could R.E.D.B. Abin say also all includes the koi since the koi is a doubtful case and surely no scriptural text is necessary to cover doubtful cases hence what you must say is a creature by itself is a different case thus also here say a creature by itself is a different case our rabbis taught ye shall afflict your souls one might assume that one must sit in heat or cold in order to afflict oneself therefore the text reads and ye shall do no manner of work just as the prohibition of labor means sit and do nothing so does the enjoyment of affliction signify sit and do nothing but say perhaps if one sit in the sun and is warm one may not say unto him rise and sit in the shade or when he sits in the shade and is cool one may not tell him rise and sit in the sun it is as with labor just as you have made no distinction with regard to labor so in connection with the prescribed affliction is no distinction to be made another bury the taught ye shall afflict your souls one might assume that one must sit in heat or cold to afflict oneself therefore scripture said and ye shall do no matter of work just as in connection with work the reference is to something for which one may become culpable also in another connection so with affliction it is to something for which one might become culpable in another connection and what is that an abhorred thing or that which remaineth I shall then include only the abhorred thing or that which remaineth because the penalty there is extirpation but not include people since the penalty involved therein is not extirpation therefore the text Reads ye shall afflict and ye shall afflict your souls which is inclusive I might then include people the punishment in connection with which is death but not include carrying the penalty for eating which is not death therefore the text reads ye shall afflict and ye shall afflict your souls which is inclusive I might then include the eating of carrying which involves a transgression of a prohibition but not profane food the eating of which is not prohibited at all therefore scripture said yet shall afflict and ye shall afflict your souls which is inclusive I might then include profane food the eating of which is not commanded but exclude terima the eating of which is commanded therefore scripture said ye shall afflict and ye shall afflict your souls which is inclusive I might then include terima which is not subject to the law concerning remaining over but exclude holy sacrifices in connection with which the law concerning remaining over applies therefore the text reads ye shall Afflict and ye shall afflict your souls which is inclusive and if you should have any remark and objection thereto I can reply behold scripture said and I will destroy that soul i.e. an affliction which causes a destruction of life and what is that but the denial of eating and drinking what is meant by and if you should have any remark and objection thereto one might have said scripture speaks here of marital intercourse therefore the text reads and I will destroy that soul i.e. affliction which causes the destruction of life and that is the abstention from eating and drinking the school of our Ishmael taught here the phrase affliction is used and there the term affliction is used just as there an affliction through hunger is meant so is here an affliction through hunger meant but let us infer from it thou shalt afflict my daughters one should infer concerning the affliction of a community from another affliction of a community but not for the affliction of a community from the affliction of an individual but let us infer it from the affliction in Egypt as it is said and the Lord saw our affliction and in connection with which we said this is the enforced abstinence from marital intercourse rather answer thus one infers for a heavenly affliction from another heavenly affliction but one should not infer concerning a heavenly affliction from an affliction through human beings who fed thee in the wilderness with manna that he might afflict thee. RMI and RC are disputing one said you cannot compare one who has bread in his basket with one who has none the other said you cannot compare one who sees what he eats with one who does not see what he is eating R Joseph said this is an allusion to the reason why blind people eat on without becoming satisfied Abbe said therefore let him who has a meal eat only in daylight R Zara said what scriptural verse intimates that better is the seeing of the eyes than the wandering of it. Desire Rush Lakish said better is the pleasure of looking at a woman than the act itself as it is said better is the seeing of the eyes than the wandering of the desire when it giveth its color in the cup when it glides down smoothly RMI and RC dispute concerning it one said whosoever fixes Talmud, Mas Yuma his eye in the cup all incestual intercourse appears to him like a plane the other said one who indulges in his cup the entire world appears to him like a plane here in it. Heart bowed it down RMI and RC explained it differently one said one should force it down the other said one should tell thereof to others and dust shall be the serpent's food RMI and RC disputed its meaning one said even if the serpent were to eat all the delicacies of the world he would feel therein but the taste of dust the other said even though he ate all the delicacies of the world his mind would not be at ease until he had eaten dust it was taught R Jose said come and See how different the action of human beings is from that of the Holy One. Blessed be he if one of flesh and blood is angry with his neighbor he persecutes him as far as depriving him of his livelihood but it is different with the Holy One. Blessed be he although he cursed the serpent yet when he goes up to the roof there is his food. If he goes down there is his food he cursed Canaan yet he eats what his master eats drinks what his master drinks he cursed the woman all are running after her he cursed the earth all are feeding from it we remember the fish which we were wont to eat in Egypt for not Rab and Samuel were disputing its meaning one said fish here means real fish the other said illicit intercourse one who said it means real fish explains it so because of which we were wont to eat the other who interprets it as illicit intercourse does so because the term for not is used but according to him who said it means intercourse does not scripture read which we were wont. To eat scripture uses a euphemism as it is written she eat and wipe hath her mouth and saith I have done no wickedness what does for not mean according to him who says they were real fish they were brought to them from public property for a master taught when the Israelites were drawing water the Holy One blessed be he prepared for them in the water little fish for their pitchers according to him who said real fish but with regard to illicit intercourse he holds they were not dissolute. It will be quite right that
Also with the matter revealed to Israel what is to be found in clefts or holes how that if e.g. two men came before Moses with a lawsuit one saying you have stolen my servant the other saying you have sold him to me Moses would say to them tomorrow judgment will be pronounced tomorrow then if his slave's omer was found in the house of his first master it was evidence that the other one had stolen him if it was found in the house of his second master that was proof that the former had sold him to the latter similarly if a man and a woman came before Moses with a suit he saying she acted offensively against me and she asserting he acted offensively against me Moses would say to them tomorrow judgment will be pronounced on the morrow if her omer was found in her husband's house that was proof that she had acted offensively but if it was found in her father's house that was evidence that he had acted offensively towards her it is written and when the dew fell upon the camp in the night the manna fell upon it and it is also written and the people shall go out and gather and it is written to the people went about and gathered it how all that unto the righteous it fell in front of their homes the average folk went out and gathered whereas the wicked ones had to go about to gather it it is written bread and it is written dough of cakes and it is written they grounded how that the righteous received it as bread the average Israelites as dough of cakes and it Wicked ones had to grind it in the handmill or beat it in mortars. Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, or as some say, Arham of Behanna, that teaches that there came down to Israel with the manna the cosmetics for women, i.e., a thing that is ground in a mortar and seated it in pots. Arham said this intimates that with the manna there came down to Israel the ingredients for pudding, and they brought yet unto him free will offerings every morning. What does every morning mean? Our Samuel be Namani in the name of our Jonathan said this of those things which came down every morning intimates that together with the manna there came down to Israel precious stones and pearls, as it is said, and Hansiim brought the onyx stones, and it was taught Nisiim here means clouds literally, as it is said, also as clouds Nisiim and winds without rain, and the taste of it was as the taste of a cake baked with oil. Rabu said, Do not read Elishad cake, but Shad breast is just as the infant finds very many. A. Flavor in the breast, so also did Israel find many a taste in the manna as long as they were eating it. Some there are who say Elishad means a real demon, even as the demon changes into many colors, so did the manna change into many tastes. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full attendant taught in the name of our Joshua Bikarha. The flesh for which they asked him properly was given to them at an improper time. Talmud. Masyuma be whereas the bread for which they asked properly was given to them in its proper time. Here the Torah intimates a matter of good form that one should eat meat, but at night, but surely Abay said one who has a meal should eat it only during the day. We mean as in daylight. Arahabi Jacob said, At first Israel were like hands picking in the dunghill until Moses came and fixed for them a definite meal time while the flesh was yet between their teeth, yet it is also written but a whole month. How is that the average people died at once the wicked ones continued to suffer a whole month and they spread them all abroad? Rush Lakish said do not read Wayishu they spread abroad but W. Yishato they were slaughtered which reading intimates that the enemies of Israel had incurred the punishment of being slaughtered spread abroad it was taught in the name of our Joshua B. Karha do not read Shato but Shahad ritually killed which would intimate that there came down to Israel. Together with the man is something requiring ritual killing Rabbi replied so must you infer it from here was it not stated before he caused flesh also to rain upon them as the dust and wing foul as the sand of the sea and was it not taught Rabbi said then thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock as I have commanded thee this teaches that Moses received commandments concerning the gullet and the windpipe and concerning the larger part of one organ in the case of a fowl and the larger. Part of two in the case of cattle, what then does Chito reach a intimate that they the quails came down so as to form layers? It is written bread, but it is also written oil, and it is also written honey. Our Jose Behanada said bread for the youth, oil for the aged, honey for the infants. It is written shla, and we read slaar. Hanada said the righteous eat it at ease, whereas when the wicked eat it, it is unto them like thorns. Our Hanan B. Abba said there are four kinds of slaw quails thrush. Partridge, pheasant, and quail proper. The best of all is the thrush, the worst of all is the quail proper, which is like a small bird. One stuffs it, places it in the oven, and it swells up and becomes so big that it fills the oven. Thereupon one places it on top of twelve loaves of bread, and even the lowest one of them cannot be eaten without some other food in combination. Rab Judah would find them among his jars, or his die among the twigs, unto Rabba his field laborer used to bring them from it. Meadow every day one day he did not bring them he wondered why this he went up to the roof and heard a child which read when I heard my inward parts trembled thereupon he said one knows from this that our his dot is dead it is for this reason that people say by the merit of his master eats the people it is written and when the layer of dew was gone up but it is also written and when the dew fell our Jose Behanada said there was dew above and dew below it it resembled something placed in a box of fine. Scale like thing by Huspaz Resh said it is something that melts on the wrist palm of the hand our Yohanan said it means something which is absorbed by the 248 parts of the human body but the numerical value of Mehuspaz is much more our nom and B. Isaac said the word is written defective our rabbis taught man did eat the bread of the mighty i.e. bread which ministering angels eat this was the interpretation of our Akiba when these words were reported to our Ishmael. He said to them, Go forth and tell Akiba, Akiba, thou hast heard for do indeed the ministering angels eat bread. Was it not said long ago? I did neither eat bread nor drink water. How then do I interpret the bread of Aram of the mighty, i.e., bread which was absorbed by the two hundred and forty-eight parts of Aram? And how do I apply? And thou shalt have a paddle among thy weapons that refers to what foods the foreign merchants were selling unto them. Or Eliezer B. Parada said, Even of the foodstuff which merchants of other nations sold them, the manna would counteract the effect. What then is the meaning of? And thou shalt have a paddle among thy weapons that apply to the time after their offense. The Holy One blessed be. He said, I thought they shall be like ministering angels, but now I shall burden them with the walk of three parts. as it is written, and they pitched by the Jordan from Beth Shemoth even unto Abel Shittim and Rabbi Behanna had said, I have seen this place. It is three. Parasangs in extension and furthermore it was taught when they went to relieve nature they went neither forward nor sideways but rewards but now our soul is dried away there is nothing at all they said this manna will swell up their bowels for is there one born of woman who absorbs food without eliminating it too but when these words were reported before our Ishmael he said to them do not read of iron mighty but of iron parts of the body i.e. something which is absorbed by the two hundred and forty eight parts but how do I then interpret and thou shalt have a paddle among thy weapons that refers to food that came to them from the distant parts another interpretation of man did eat the bread of the mighty Talmud Masyuma that is Joshua for whom man especially fell down as it did to all Israel for it is written here man and also there it is written take thee Joshua the son of none a man in whom is spirit but perhaps it is Moses of whom it is said now the man Moses was very Meek one may infer Ish from Ish but not Ish from Wehaish our Simon Biyohe was asked by his disciples why did not the manna come down unto Israel once annually he replied I shall give a parable this thing may be compared to a king of flesh and blood who had one son whom he provided with maintenance once a year so that he would visit his father once a year only thereupon he provided for his maintenance every day so that he called on him every day the same with Israel one who had four or five children would worry saying perhaps no manna will come down tomorrow and all will die of hunger thus they were found to turn their attention to their father in heaven another interpretation they ate it whilst it was yet warm another interpretation because of the burden of the way and it long ago happened that our Tarfan our Ishmael and the elders were seated and occupied with the portion referring to the manna and also our Eliezer of Modin was seated among them our Eliezer of Modin commenced to Expound and said the manna which came down unto Israel was sixty cubits high. Tarfan said to him, Badai, how long will you rake words together and bring them up against us? He answered, My master, I am expounding a scriptural verse. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Were there indeed fifteen cubits high in the valley? Fifteen cubits in the lowlands. Fifteen cubits on the mountains were the waters standing like a series of walls. And furthermore, how could the ark come to the top of the mountains? Rather, all the fountains of the great deep came up first until the water was even with the mountains. Then the water rose fifteen more
And of thy loyal tyrosh is one, and yet scripture reads, and thou shalt eat whence this fruit. Perhaps it means that he used it as all admixture to a logarum. For Rabbi B. Samuel said, a logarum contains the juice of beets, oxygarum, the sauce of all kinds of boiled vegetables. Rather said, Arahabi Jacob is that inferred from here, and thou shalt bestow thy money for whatever thy soul desired for oxen, for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink to wine, and strong drink applies the term drinking. And yet the divine law reads, and thou shalt eat. How is that conclusive? Perhaps here too the implication is that he uses it as an admixture to a logarum. Scripture says, strong drink, i.e., something which intoxicates, but perhaps the reference here is to preserve figs from Gila, for it was taught if one priest ate preserved figs from Gila and drank honey and milk and thus entered the sanctuary Talmud, Masyuma B. He is culpable, rather he infers it by analogy of strong drink from it. Nazi right, just as there it means wine, so here too is wine involved, but is Tyrosh wine? Was it not taught one who takes a vow to abstain from Tyrosh is forbidden to use any sweet drink, but may use wine, but is Tyrosh not wine? Surely it is written, and Tyrosh makes the maids flourish, the thing which is derived from Tyrosh makes maids flourish, but it is written, and thy bats shall overflow with Tyrosh, thy bats shall overflow with what is derived from Tyrosh, but it is written, harlotry wine, and Tyrosh take away the heart, rather everybody agrees that Tyrosh is wine, but with regard to vows we go after common parlance, why is it wine called Yin and Tyrosh? It is called Yin because it brings lamentation into the world, and Tyrosh because he who indulges in it becomes poor, Arkahana pointed out a contradiction, it is written Tyrosh, and we read Tyrosh, if he is meritorious, he becomes a head rush through it, if not, he becomes poor rush through it, Rabba pointed out this contradiction. It Text reads Yashama whilst we read Yesama if he is meritorious it makes him happy if not it makes him desolate that is why Rabbah said wine and odorous spices made me wise whence do we know that abstention from bathing and from anointing oneself is considered an affliction because it is written I ate no pleasant bread neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth neither did I anoint myself at all what does I ate no pleasant bread mean Rab Judah in the name of our Samuel B. Shalaf said he ate not. Even bread made of pure wheat whence do we know that the abstention from anointing was considered an affliction because it is written and he said unto me fear not Daniel for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to afflict thyself before thy God thy words were heard and I am come because of thy words we have found it now with regard to abstention from anointing oneself whence do we know it about abstention from washing our Zitra son of our Tobia said scripture. Reads and it is come into his inward parts like water and like oil into his bones, but perhaps that applies to drinking it. It is compared to oil just as the oil is applied externally, so also the water is such as is applied externally. But Atana teaches just the reverse, for we learned once do we know that anointing oneself is like drinking on the day of atonement, although there is no conclusive evidence for this, there is some intimation for it is said, and it is come into his inward parts. Like water and like oil into his bones, rather said Arashi that abstention from washing is considered an affliction is evident from the verse itself, for it is written, Neither did I anoint myself at all what does and I am come because of thy words mean it is written, and there stood before them seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jazani the son of Shaphan, every man with his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up furthermore and the form of a hand was put forth and I was taken by a lock of my head and a spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me into the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the gate of the inner court that looked toward the north where Talmud, Masyuma there was a seat of the image of jealousy which provoked to jealousy furthermore and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and it. Altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Now from the implication of the text and their faces toward the east do I not know that their backs were toward the temple of the Lord why then does the text state with their backs toward the temple of the Lord it teaches that they uncovered themselves and committed a nuisance toward that which is below the Holy One blessed be he said to. Michael, Michael, your nation has committed sin. Michael answered, Lord of the universe, let the good ones among them be considered sufficient. He replied, I shall burn both them and the good ones among them immediately then. And he spoke unto the man clothed in linen and said, Go in between the will work even under the cherub and fill both thy hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim and dash them against the city. And he went in my sight thereupon and the cherub stretched forth his hand between the cherubim unto the fire that was between the cherubim and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed in linen who took it and went out. Our hand of business said in the name of our Simeon the pious were it not for the fact that the coals of the hand of the cherub became cold in the process of coming into the hands of Gabriel there would not have been left over from the enemies of Israel one to remain or one to escape for it is written and behold the man clothed in linen. Who had the inkhorn on his side reported saying I have done according to all that thou hast commanded me or Yohanan said in that hour Gabriel was led out behind the curtain and received forty fiery strokes he being told if you had not executed the command at all well you simply would not have executed it but since you did execute it why did you not do as you were commanded furthermore don't you know that one brings no report about mischief thereupon double the guardian angel of the Persians was brought in and placed in his stead and he officiated for twenty one days this is what is written but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days but lo Michael one of the chief princes came to help me and I was left over there beside the kings of Persia twenty one provinces and the port of Mishmah were given to him thereupon he said put down for me Israel for the poll tax they did so put down the sages for the poll tax they did so when they were about to sign Gabriel came forth from behind the curtain and said it is vain for you that ye rise early and sit up late yet and eat the bread of toil so he giveth unto his beloved in sleep what does so he giveth unto his beloved in sleep signifies Isaac said this refers to the wives of the scholars who deny themselves sleep in this world and acquire the world to come no attention was paid to him he said before him lord of the universe if all the wise men of other nations were in one scale of the balance and Daniel the man of pleasant parts in the other would he not be found to outweigh them all the holy one blessed be he said who is it that pleads the merit of my children they replied lord of the universe it is Gabriel he said let him come in as it is written and I am coming because of thy words having commanded that they bring him and they brought him and he noticed that W held the document in his hand and he wanted to take it from him but the former swallowed it some say the document was Written out but not signed, others say it was also signed, but as he swallowed it, the signature was blotted out. Hence, there are some people in the kingdom of Persia who are obliged to pay poll tax while others are free from it. And when I go forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. He cried and cried, and none minded him. Or if you like that abstention from washing is considered an affliction, is deducible from here, for it is written, and unto Abiathar the priest said, The king get thee to an Ahath. Unto thine own fields, for thou art deserving of death, but I will not at this time put thee to death, because thou didst bear the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because thou wast afflicted in all wherein my father was afflicted. And concerning David, it is written, for they said, The people is hungry and faint and thirsty in the wilderness, hungry because of no bread, thirsty because of no water, faint because of what would you not say, because of no washing, but perhaps faint means. Because of no sandals, rather said our Isaac, it is to be deducted from this as cold water to a faint soul, but perhaps it means faint from lack of drink. Does scripture read into a faint soul upon a faint soul is written, and whence is to be inferred that abstention from wearing sandals is considered an affliction because it is written, and David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up, and he had his head covered and went bare bare of what obviously of shoes. Perhaps it means bare because without horse and whip, rather said our nom and be Isaac, the inference comes from go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins and put thy shoe from off thy foot, and it is written, and he did so walking naked and bare bare of what obviously bare of sandals, but perhaps it means he went in patched shoes, for if you were not to interpret thus naked would also have to be explained as stark naked, rather must you here to explain naked, i.e. in shabby garments thus also. Bear in patched sandals, rather said Arnam and be Isaac, it is derived from here, withhold thy fo
Anoint the whole body of however one was sick or had scabs on his head he may anoint himself in his usual way without any fear. The school of Arminus had taught Arsimi and Gamaliel said a woman may wash one of her hands in water to give bread to an infant without any fear. It was reported about the older Shammai that he would not hand food to be eaten even with one hand whereupon the rabbis decreed that he must do so with both hands why that Abbe said because of Shiftar rabbis taught one. Who goes to visit his father or his teacher or his superior may walk through water up to his neck without any fear. They asked how about a master who visits his disciple come and hear for our Isaac B. Barhanda said I saw Zeiri who went to Arashi his disciple Arashi said that was Arhai B. Ashi who went to Zeiri his master Rabba permitted the people of Ibar Jemini to walk through water for the purpose of guarding fruits the crop Abbe said to Rabba I know a teaching that supports you your decision those who guard the crop may walk up to the neck through water without any fear our Joseph permitted the people of Bitarbu to walk through the water in order to go to the lecture of the day of atonement but he did not permit them to return in the same fashion Abbe said to him if so you will put a stumbling block in their way for the future some say he permitted them to go and to return through water whereupon Abbe said quite right to permit them to do so on the way to the Lecture, but why the permission on their return lest you put a stumbling block in their way for the future? Rav Judah and our Samuel, son of our Judah, were standing at the bank of Nihar Papa at the fort of Hustad, and Rami B. Papa was standing on the other bank. He shouted across, How about going over to you to inquire about a decision of the Lord? Rav Judah answered, Rav and Samuel both agree one may come over provided one take not one's hand out of the bosom of his shirt. Some say it was our Samuel, son of Rav Judah, who said we were taught he may come over provided he take not his hand out of the bosom of his shirt. Our Joseph demurred, but even on a weekday, is such action permitted? Does not scripture say he measured a thousand cubits and he caused me to pass through the waters, waters that were to the ankles? Hence we infer that it is permitted to pass through water up to the ankles again. He measured a thousand and caused me to pass through the waters, waters that were up to the knees. Hence we learn. That it is permitted to pass through waters up to the knees again he measured a thousand and caused me to pass through waters that were to the loins hence we know that it is permissible to pass through water up to the loins henceforth afterward he measured a thousand and it was a river that I would not pass through Abbe said it is different with a river whose waters run rapidly one might have assumed that it is permissible to swim across such a river therefore the text reads for the waters were risen waters to swim in what does Sahu mean swim for a swimmer is called Seha one might have assumed that it is permissible to pass through such river in a small Liburnian boat therefore the text reads wherein shall go no galley with oars one might have assumed that one may cross it in a big Liburnian ship therefore scripture says neither shall the launch ship pass thereby how does that follow from the text as our Joseph interprets it no fisher's boat goes thereon no big boat traverses it our Judah because he said even the angel of death has no permission to cross it for here it is said wherein shall go no galley with or shade and there it reads from going shut to and fro in the earth arfinehas in the name of Arhuna of Sephori said the spring that issues from the holy of holies in its beginning resembles the antennae of locusts as it reaches the entrance to the sanctuary it becomes as the thread of the warp as it reaches the ulam it becomes as the thread of the wolf as it reaches the entrance to the temple court it becomes as large as the mouth of a small flask that is meant by what we learned our Eliezer B. Jacob said hence go forth the waters Talmud, Masyuma which will bubble forth from under the threshold of the sanctuary from there onwards it becomes bigger rising higher and higher until it reaches the entrance to the house of David as soon as it reaches the entrance to the house of David it becomes even as a swiftly running brook in which men and women Afflicted with gonorrhoea, menstruating women and women after childbirth bathe as it is said in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for purification and for sprinkling said our Joseph hence there is an intimation that a menstruating woman at her purification must sit in water that reaches in height up to the neck but the law is not in accord with him that will be right on the day of atonement on which no sandal is worn but what? About the Sabbath on which sandals are worn are Nehemiah the son-in-law of the prince said I saw Rmi and Rc who reached the pool of water and crossed it dressed that is all right in shoes but what can be said in the case of sandals are Rahumi said I saw Rabbanah who crossed it in sandals are Ashi said one must not do so at the outset in sandals the eggs large ones came to Hagronia to the house of Arnathan Raphram and all the rabbis attended his lecture Rabbanah did not next day Raphram wanted to remove. Rubina from the mind of the exilarch so he said to him why did you not come to the lecture sir he answered my foot hurt me you should have put shoes on it was the back of the foot you should have put sandals on he answered a pool of water was in the way you should have crossed it in them he replied don't you hold sir the view of Arashi that one must not at the outset do so in sandals Judah be Jared taught it is forbidden to sit on moist muddy ground on the day of atonement our Joshua be Levi said this refers to mud which makes wet though sitting on it Abbe said if it is moist enough to moisten other subjects Rab Judah said it is permitted to cool off by sitting on fruit on the day of atonement Rab Judah would cool off through squash rabba through fresh twigs rabba through a silver cup our papa said on a silver vessel one may not cool oneself if it is full it is permissible only when it is not full on an earthen vessel it is forbidden in either case because the unglazed vessel Let's the moisture ooze through our papa said a silver vessel if not full is also forbidden for use as a cooler off because it may be upset Zeiri Hamma was the host of RMI and RC and our Joshua B. Levi and of all the rabbis of Caesarea he said to our Joseph the son of our Joshua B. Levi O son of a great man come and let me tell you a fine custom that your father had he had a towel from the eve of the day of atonement which he soaked in water made it into a kind of dry vessel and on the morrow would wipe his face hands and feet with it on the eve of the ninth of he would soak it in water and on the morrow he would stroke his eyes with it similarly when Rabbi Bimari came he reported on the eve of the ninth of the towel was brought to him he soaked it in water and put it under his head on the morrow he would there with wipe his face hands and feet on the eve of the day of atonement one brought him a towel which he soaked in water and made it into a kind of dry vessel and on the Tomorrow he stroked his eyes with it said our Jacob to our Jeremiah B. Talifah you had told us the matter in just the opposite fashion and we refuted you by reference to prohibition of ringing out our Manashiach B. Talifah in the name of Aram on the authority of Rabbi B. Barhanda said the following question was propounded to our Eliezer must a scholar who is a member of an academy obtain special permission to declare a firstborn animal allowed or does he not need that special permission what was it? That appeared doubtful to them this is what they wanted to know in accord with the statement of R. E. B. Abin that this matter was left in the hands of the prince as a special distinction for himself the question is must the elder receive permission or since he is an elder and a member of an academy he need not Arzadik B. Halakah thereupon stood up and said I saw our Jose B. Zimri who was both an elder and a member of an academy and indeed was superior to the grandfather of this our prince yet. Obtained permission to declare firstborn animals for profane use. Our Abba replied to him, It was not like this, but rather this was a fact. Our Jose B. Zimmer was a priest, and this was his problem. Is the Halacha in accord with our Meir, who said one who is suspected concerning a matter may neither judge nor offer testimony in connection therewith, or is the Halacha in accord with our Simeon B. Gamaliel, who said such a one would be trustworthy in a case concerning his neighbor, but not in a case concerning himself? The answer given was the Halacha is in accord with the view of our Simeon B. Gamaliel. Furthermore, did they ask our Eliezer how about Talmud, Masyuma be going forth on the day of atonement in sandals of bamboo? Thereupon our Isaac B. Namani stood up and said, I saw myself, our Joshua B. Levi, going forth in sandals of bamboo on the day of atonement. I asked him how about on public rain fast. He answered, There is no difference. Rabbi B. Barhanna said, I saw our Eliezer of Nineveh who was going. Forth in sandals of bamboo on a public rain fast, and I asked him how about the day of atonement. He answered, There is no difference. Rab Judah went forth in sandals made of reeds, Abbe in such made of palm branches, Rabba in such made of twisted reeds, Rabba Bibar handed tied a piece of cloth around his legs, and went thus forth. Rami Bihamma raised an
Sandals to have been put on yesterday for Samuel said let one who would experience a taste of death put on shoes and sleep in them but it is stated that the other matters are permitted implying for them at the very outset rather those things which have nothing to do with their natural growth the rabbis have interdicted these however which are needed for their health the rabbis have not forbidden for Abbe said mother told me the proper treatment for a child consists in bathing in warm water and rubbing with oil if he has grown a bit an egg with cutata if he grows up still more the breaking of clay vessels thus did rabbi by clay vessels in damaged condition for his children who would break them the king and the bride may wash their faces according to whom is our mission according to our Hanani betrayed and for it was taught even the king and the bride may not wash their faces our Hanani betrayed and said in the name of our Eliezer the king and the bride may wash their faces uh, Woman after childbirth may not put on a sandal our Hanani betrayed and said in the name of our Eliezer a woman after childbirth may put on a sandal why may a king wash his face because scripture said thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty why may a bride wash her face lest she become unattractive to her husband Rab said to our high how long does a bride enjoy this privilege he replied as it was taught one must not withhold her adornment from the bride during the full thirty days. After the wedding a woman after childbirth may put on shoes to avoid a cold Samuel said if there is danger of a scorpion it is permitted for all to wear shoes one who eats as much as the bulk of a big date our papa asked Talmud, Mas Yuma does the size of the date spoken of include the kernel or does it not our Ashi asked does a bone as big as a barley corn include the husk or does it not is the reference to a moist one or to a dry one our Ashi did not ask the question posed by our papa for. A big date was said which means a date in its complete size our papa did not ask the question propounded by our Ashi because a moist one would be called shibboleth and one without a tusk Ashla said in the name of Rab Judah the big date spoken of is bigger than an egg and our rabbis had established the fact that with such a quantity a hungry person becomes satisfied but with less than that he does not become satisfied an objection was raised once they brought to our and a dish. To taste and to rabbi Gamaliel two dates and a bucket of water whereupon they said take them up to the sukkah in connection there with it was taught they ordered so not because that was a legal decision but because they desired to take a severe review for themselves and when someone gave Arzadak a piece of food smaller than an egg he would take it with a towel eat it outside the sukkah and pronounce no blessing after it Talmud, Mas Yuma B this implies that if it were as big as an egg it would require to be eaten in the sukkah and if the thought should occur to you that the big date referred to is larger in size than an egg now if two dates without kernels are not even as large as one egg how could a large date with its kernel be bigger in size than an egg our Jeremiah said yes two dates without their kernel are not as large as an egg but a large date with its kernel is bigger than an egg our Papa said therefore do people say two calves of dates contain as much as one calf of Kernels with a bit left over. Rabbi said the reason there was that they were fruits and fruits do not require to be eaten in a sukkah. An objection was raised. Rabbi said when we were studying the Torah with our Eliezer, Bishamu, Fix, and wine berries were brought before us and we ate them outside the sukkah as an incidental meal. That means only as an incidental meal is it permitted to eat fruit outside the sukkah, but as a proper meal, not say we ate them as if we had partaken of an incidental meal outside the sukkah. Or if you like, say we ate them for a regular meal and we ate bread with them outside the sukkah in a quantity small enough to be considered only for an incidental meal. Shall we say that the following supports his view? Therefore, if he made up the number of meals by means of delicacies, he has done his duty. Now, if you should think that fruits must be eaten in the sukkah, he should have stated fruits instead of delicacies. What does he mean by delicacies, fruits, or if you? Like say the reference is to a place wherein fruits are not to be found. Our said the big date whereof they spoke is smaller in size than an egg. For we learned Bet Shammai say of leaven as much as an olive or leaven bread as much as a date. And thereon we were debating what is the reason of Bet Shammai and were given this let the divine write about him a leaven bread alone without needing a reference to leaven. And I would say if the eating of an olive size of him a the leaven whereof is not so intensive is forbidden. How much more is such size forbidden in the case of leaven which is so much more leaven? But since the divine law nevertheless mentioned them separately, it teaches you that the minimum size of the one is not the same as of the other. Is in the case of leaven it is that of an olive in the case of him a that of a date. Now if you should think that the big date mentioned is bigger than an egg, since Bet Shammai are looking for a quantity bigger than an olive. Let them teach that of an egg, and even if the two be of the same size, let them teach that of an egg. Hence, one must infer therefrom that the date spoken of is smaller than an egg. How does that follow? In truth, I may say to you, perhaps that the big date referred to is bigger than an egg, but the normal one is as big as an egg. And even though they be of the same size, Bet Shammai just mentions one of the two. Rather, may one infer it from here? How much must one have eaten to be obliged to make an appointment for common saying of grace after meals the size of an olive, according to our Meir, according to our Judah, the size of an egg? And in connection therewith it was said, wherein are they differing? Our Meir holds, and thou shalt eat. Refers to eating and be satisfied. Refers to drinking, and the minimum of eating is the size of an olive. Whereas our Judah holds, and thou shalt eat and be satisfied, i.e., an eating which brings satisfaction, and that is at least as much as an egg. And if you should. Think that the big date referred to is bigger than an egg. How if the quantity of an egg even satisfied one would it not help one to come to thence? The inference is proper that the big date referred to is smaller than an egg. The quantity of an egg will satisfy one. The size of a big date will help one to come to it. Was taught Rabbi says Talmud, Masuma. All the legal standards for foods are the size of an olive, with the exception of that of the ritual defilement of foods, because there, scripture has used a different expression, and the sages accordingly have altered the standard. The proof for this view is furnished by the Day of Atonement. What is the change in the usual expression in connection there with it follows from for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted, and what is the change in the usual quantity? The sages have decreed here as much as a date, and what constitutes the proof from the Day of Atonement? One could have replied here it is the usual. Scriptural expression whence do we know that the minimum for the ritual uncleanness of foods is the size of an egg said Arabah in the name of our Eliezer scripture says all food therein which may be eaten i.e. food derived from food and that is an egg of a hen but say it is a kid that still requires slaughtering but say it is an animal taken alive out of the slaughtered mother's womb that still requires cutting open then say the egg of Baryukani if you take hold of too large a thing you may lose your hold but if you take hold of the lesser thing you will retain your hold but say the egg of a little bird that is very small Arabah said in his own name all food therein which may be eaten eat food which you may eat in one swallowing and the sages measured that the esophagus cannot hold more than the size of a hen's egg our Eliezer said if one has eaten tallow in these times he must put down make a note of the quantity because another rabbinical court may come and increase it. Measures what does increase the measures mean would say you that they would declare one obliged to bring a sin offering for having eaten the size of a small olive but it was taught when a ruler sineth and doth through error any one of all the things which the Lord his God hath commanded not to be done and is guilty i.e. only he who repents when he finds out his transgression must bring a sacrifice because of his error but he who does not repent when he finds out his transgression does not bring a sacrifice for his error rather therefore must increase the measures signify that they would declare a sacrifice obligatory only when he had eaten a quantity as large as a large olive but according to the first view is that they could impose a sacrifice even for the quantity of a small olive what does increase the measure mean it might mean increase the number of sacrifices required because of the reduced minimum of the quantities are Yohanan said standard measures and penalties are Fixed by laws communicated to Moses on Sinai, but the penalties are written out in Scripture. Rather, the minimum required for penalties is fixed by laws communicated to Moses on Sinai. It was also taught us the minimum required for penalties are fixed by laws communicated to Moses on Sinai. Others say the court of Jebets fixed them, but Scripture said these are the commandments, which means that no prophet is permitted to introduce any new law from then on. Rather, they were forgotten and then they established the manure. If he drank a mouthful, Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, not really a mouthful, but so much that if he moves it to one side, it looks like a mouthful. But we learned a mouthful say as much as a
Drinking they have found that a man will come to with the quantity of his own mouthful but not with less than that are zero then asked another strong question all the world with a date and of the king of Bashan also with a date they replied the rabbis have ascertained that touching food the quantity of a date helps one to come to but with a smaller quantity he will not come to but whereas all the world can come to more so a king of Bashan only some would so are zero again asked. Another strong question fat meat in the quantity of one date and one branch is also in the quantity of one date they replied the rabbis have ascertained that one comes to with so much but not with less with this quantity of fat meat one becomes however more satisfied whilst with the same quantity of one branches one becomes less so rabbi asked a strong question the quantity of an olive during the time one could eat a pears and the quantity of a date during the time required for eating a Paris have they replied the rabbis have ascertained that if at the eating of the quantity of a day takes so long as one could eat a pair as a person will come to but if longer he will not come to rabba asked another strong question the quantity of a day during the time required for the eating of a pair and half a pair during the time required for the eating of a pair our papa answered leave alone the uncleanness of the body which is not determined by biblical law but could our papa have answered thus is it not written neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them that ye should be defiled thereby and our papa said that from here is derived the biblical origin of the laws concerning the bodies becoming defiled through unclean foods it is really rabbinical and scripture is quoted only as mere mnemotechnical aid all foods complement one another in making up the bulk of a date our papa said if one ate a piece of raw meat with salt they are joined and although salt in Itself is no food since people eat the two together they are joined Rashlakish said the juice on the green vegetables joined so as to make up with the vegetable the quantity of a date in connection with the day of atonement but that is self-evident you might have said it is drink therefore he informs us that whatever is used for seasoning food is considered as food Rashlakish said if one eats an excessive meal on the day of atonement he is free from punishment why scripture said that shall not be afflicted and that excludes whatever causes harm our Jeremiah said in the name of Rashlakish if a non-priest eats excessively of Teramah he need pay but the principle but not the fine of the additional fifth for scripture says and if a man eat which excluded one causing harm our Jeremiah said in the name of our Yohan and a non-priest Talmud Masuma who choose barley corns of Teramah must pay the principle but not the additional fifth for scripture said if a man eat that excludes one Causing harm, Arshes by said in the name of our Yohanan, if a non priest swallow jujubes of Teramah and spat them out, and another one ate them, then the first pays the principal and the fifth, whereas the second does not pay more than their would feel value. But what a man eats and drinks does not go together, who is the tana of this part of the mission. Arhista said this has been taught under a controversy of opinion, and it is in accord with our Joshua, for we learned our Joshua pronounced with principal all foods are equal regarding the duration of their uncleanness and the quantity of them required to convey uncleanness combined, if they be equal only concerning the duration of their uncleanness, but not concerning the quantity of them required to convey uncleanness, or only regarding quantity, but not in the duration of uncleanness, or if they be equal neither in respect of duration of uncleanness nor quantity, they do not combine to make up the minimum quantity which constitutes the transgression our and said you may even say that this part of our mission is in accord with the rabbis for the rabbis opposing our joshua hold their view only touching uncleanness because all are designated as uncleanness but here the point involved is coming to and this does not enable one to come to thus also did rush say this has been taught under the controversy of an opinion and our mission is in accord with our joshua for we were taught our joshua pronounced a principle etc but our yohan and said you may even say that our mission is in accord with the rabbis there the rabbis present their view only in connection with uncleanness but here coming to is the point and this does not enable one to come to mission if a man ate and drank in one state of unawareness he is not obliged to bring more than one sin offering but if he ate and performed labor while in one state of unawareness he must offer up two sin offerings if he ate foods unfit for food or drank Liquids unfit for drinking or drank brine or fish brine he is not culpable. Gemara Reshlakish said why is no explicit warning mentioned in connection with the commandment to afflict oneself because it is impossible for how shall the divine law word it were the divine law to write he shall not eat but eating implies the minimum size of an olive shall the divine law write he shall not afflict himself that would mean go and eat our hush I asked a strong question let the divine law write take. Eat lest thou dost not afflict thyself that would mean several prohibitions to this are bbb abedimur let the divine law write take heed concerning the commandment of affliction take heed implies a command if attached to a command and a prohibition if attached to a prohibition are as asked a strong question let the divine law write do not depart from affliction this is a difficulty the following tenet arrives at the prohibition relating to affliction from here and ye shall afflict. Your souls ye shall do no manner of work one might have assumed that the punishment of extirpation is involved for one who disregarded the addition by doing a labor therefore scripture said for whatsoever soul it be that doth any manner of work in that same day he shall be cut off i.e. only for the disregard of that day itself is one punished with extirpation but for labor performed during the additional time one is not punished with extirpation one might have assumed that one does not incur punishment of extirpation by doing labor during the additional time but that one does incur punishment of extirpation for failure to afflict oneself during the additional time therefore the text reads for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day he shall be cut off that means for failure of afflicting oneself on the day itself does the penalty of extirpation come but the penalty of extirpation does not result from failure to afflict oneself during the Additional time one might have assumed that one is not included in the penalty but that one is under a warning against performing work during the additional time therefore the text reads and ye shall do no manner of work in that same day i.e. one is warned concerning the day itself but not concerning work done during the additional time one might have assumed that one is not under a warning concerning labor performed during the additional time but one is under a warning concerning failure of affliction during the additional time but a logical inference cancels that for if in the case of labor the prohibition of which applies on sabbath and festival days one is not under a warning concerning additional time then with regard to the commandment of affliction which does not apply on sabbath and festival days how much more should one not be under a warning against it during the additional time but we have not learned so far of any explicit warning with regard to the obligation to affliction on the day itself whence then do we derive that required warning from the following there was no necessity for stating the penalty resulting from the performance of labor for that is inferable from the commandment of affliction if for failure of affliction which is not commanded on the sabbath and festival days one is punished with extirpation and for the performance of labor the prohibition of which does apply on sabbath and festival days how much more shall one be punished with extirpation why then was the penalty stated it is free for interpretation hence it serves for comparison to derive thence an inference from analogy of expression the penalty is stated in connection with the commandment of affliction and the penalty is stated in connection with the prohibition of labor hence just as the performance of labor was punished only after warning so also is failure of affliction punished only after warning but against this it may be objected that Specific condition with affliction which attaches a penalty to it lies in the fact that no exception against the general rule was made here but would you apply the same to the performance of labor seeing that in its case exceptions from the general rule were made rather argue thus let scripture not mention any penalty in connection with failure of affliction inferring it from the prohibition of labor if the performance of labor from the general prohibition of which some exceptions were made involves the penalty of extirpation how much more must failure of affliction from the general prohibition of which no exception was made involves such penalty then why does scripture mention it? it is free for interpretation hence it serves for comparison to derive as an inference from analogy of expression the penalty is mentioned in connection with failure of affliction and the same penalty is mentioned in connection with the performance of labor hence just as Performance of labor is punished only after warning so is the failure of affliction punished only after warning against this may be objected there is a specific condition in connection with labor to which a penalty is attached in that it is forbidden on Sabbath and festival days but would you apply the same to the commandment of affliction seeing that does not apply on Sabbath and festival days Rabbanah said this tana infers it from the word self same now it must be free for if it were not free the objection as above could be raised against it hence it indeed must be free consider there are five scriptural verses written in connection with labor one indicating the prohibition for the
In the ninth day of the month from even to even shall ye keep your Sabbath. Our Papa did not well interpret as our Ahabi Jacob because it is preferable to use a scriptural text mentioned in connection with the subject itself. But why did not our Ahabi Jacob expound as our Papa did that is necessary for the following teaching? And ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month. One might have assumed that such affliction commences on the ninth of the month already. Therefore, the text reads at even if from it even one might have inferred that one must afflict oneself only after it gets dark, therefore the text reads in the ninth how is this to be explained he should commence to afflict himself whilst it is yet day from here we learn that we add from the profane time to the sacred one thus I know it only at its beginning whence do I know it at its end therefore scripture said from even unto even thus I know it only for the days of atonement whence do I learn the same for the Sabbath. Days therefore the text reads your Sabbath how is that wherever the word Shabbat rest is mentioned we add from the profane time to the sacred one how does the Tana who infers from the word analogy of self same self same interpret the words in the ninth of the month he uses it in accord with what high the son of Rabbah Vipti taught for high the son of Rabbah Vipti learned and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month but is one fasting on the ninth do we not fast on it? Tenth rather it comes to indicate that if one eats and drinks on the ninth scripture accounts it to him as if he had fasted on the ninth and the tenth if he ate foods unfit for food Rabbah said if one chewed pepper on the day of atonement he is not culpable if one chewed ginger on the day of atonement he is not culpable an objection was raised our mayor used to say by mere implication from the text and you shall count the fruit thereof as forbidden I could understand that fruit trees are meant why? Then does scripture say trees for food it means a tree the taste of whose wood and fruit are alike say this is pepper that teaches you that the plant of pepper is subject to the law of Orla and that the land of Israel lacks nothing as it is said thou shalt not lack anything in it that is no difficulty the one case deals with green pepper the other with dry pepper Robin has said to Miramar but Arnaman has said that preserved ginger coming from India is permitted and the blessing who created. The fruit of the ground is obligatory before eating it. This is no difficulty. The one case deals with fresh one, the other with dry one. Our rabbis have taught if one ate the leaves of calamus, he is culpable. If he ate the leaves of vine, he is culpable. What vines are meant here? Our Isaac of Magdala said such as sprouted forth between New Year and the Day of Atonement. Our Kahana said during the first thirty days it was taught in accord with our Isaac of Magdala. If one ate the leaves of calamus, he is not culpable. If he ate the leaves of vines, he is culpable. The vines meant here are those that sprouted forth between New Year and the Day of Atonement. If he drank brine or fish brine, he is not culpable. But if he drank vinegar, he is culpable. According to whom is our mission? According to Rabbi, for it was taught. Rabbi said vinegar restores the soul. Our Gidal of Bari of Naresh reported that the Halachah is not in accord with Rabbi. Whereupon in the following year all went forth to. Drink on the day of atonement vinegar mixed with water when Argidal heard that he became angry and said I spoke only of a de facto case did I say at all that one may do so at the outset I referred only to a small quantity did I speak at all of a large one I spoke only of raw vinegar did I refer at all to vinegar mixed with water Talmud, Masyuma Mishnah one should not afflict children at all on the day of atonement but one trains them a year or two before in order that they become used to religious observances Gemara since the Mishnah has taught already that two years before their attaining majority they must be trained is it necessary to state that one must do so a year before that time Arhista said this is no difficulty the one refers to a healthy child the other to a sickly one Arhuna said at the age of eight and nine years one trains them by hours at the age of ten and eleven they must fast to the end of the day by rabbinic ordinance at the age of twelve day. Must fast to the end of the day by biblical law. All this referring to girls are nominated said at the age of nine and ten. One trains them by hours at the age of eleven and twelve. They must fast to the end of the day by rabbinic ordinance at the age of thirteen. They must fast to the end of the day by biblical law. All this referring to boys are Yohanan said there is no rabbinic ordinance about the obligation of children to fast to the end of the day. But at the age of ten and eleven, one trains them by hours at the age of twelve. They must fast to the end of the day by biblical law. We learned one should not afflict the children at all on the day of atonement. But one trains them a year or two before that will be right according to our Yohanan. Our nominee a year or two before means a year before according to rabbinic law or two years before according to biblical law. But according to our Yohanan, there is a difficulty. Our Yohanan will tell you one or two years before means before their reaching. Maturity come in here for Rabbi Samuel taught one does not afflict children on the day of atonement but one trains them a year or two before their attaining maturity that will be right according to our Yohanan but according to our Huna and our Nam in this presence a difficulty these rabbis will tell you training here means fasting to the end of the day but his training the meaning of fasting to the end of the day was it not taught what is training if he was accustomed to eat at the second hour. 8 o'clock one feeds him now at the third hour 9 o'clock if he was accustomed to eat at the third hour one feeds him now at the fourth Rabbi Ola said there are two kinds of training Mishnah if a woman with child smelt she must be given to eat until she feels restored a sick person is fed at the word of experts and if no experts are there one feeds him at his own wish until he says enough Gemara our rabbis taught if a woman with child smelt the flesh of holy flesh or a pork we put. For her read into the juice and place it upon her mouth if thereupon she feels that her craving has been satisfied it is well if not one feeds her with the juice itself if thereupon her craving is satisfied it is well if not one feeds her with the fat meat itself for there is nothing that can stand before the duty of saving life with the exception of idolatry incest and bloodshed which are prohibited in all situations whence do we know that about idolatry for it was taught our Eliezer said. Since it is said with all thy soul why is it said with all thy might and since it is said with all thy might why is it said with all thy soul it but comes to tell you that if there be a man whose life is more cherished by him than his money for him it is said with all thy soul and if there be a person to whom his money is dearer than his life for him it is said with all thy might whence do we know it about incest and bloodshed because it was taught Rabbi said for as when a man rises against. His neighbor and slay him even so is this matter what matter do we infer for the rape of a betrothed maiden from a murderer rather what was meant to teach learns itself just as in the case of a betrothed maiden it is lawful to save her at the expense of his a would-be raper's life thus also in the case of a murderer and just as in the case of an order to shed blood one should rather be killed oneself than transgress the prohibition of murder thus also in the case of a command to rape a betrothed maiden one should rather be killed than transgress the prohibition of violating her Talmud. Masyuma be right once do we know that this principle applies in the case of a murder this is reasonable for there was a man who came before Rabbah and said to him the lord of my village told me kill so and so and if you will not I shall kill you he Rabbah answered let him kill you but do not kill what makes you see that your blood is redder than is perhaps the blood of that man is. Redder than yours there was a woman with child who had smelled a dish people came before Rabbi questioning him what should be done he said to them go and whisper to her that it is the day of atonement they whispered to her and she accepted the whispered suggestion whereupon he Rabbi cited about her the verse before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee from her came forth our Yohanan again there was a woman with child who smelled a dish the people came to our Hannah who said to them whisper to her that it is the day of atonement she did not accept the whispered suggestion he cited with regard to her Talmud Masyuma the wicked are estranged from the womb from her came forth Shabbatai the hoarder of provisions for speculation a sick person is fed at the word of experts Arjana said if the patient says I need food whilst the physician says he does not need it we hearken to the patient what is the reason the heart know it its own bitterness but that is self evident you might have said the physician's knowledge is more established therefore the information that we prefer the patient's opinion if the physician says he needs it whilst the patient says that he does not need it we listen to the physician why supersedes him we learned a sick person is fed at the word of experts that implies only upon the order of experts but not upon his own order further it implies only upon the order of experts but not upon the order of a single expert this refers to the case that he says I do not need it but one should feed him upon the order of one expert this refers to the case when someone else is present who agrees that he does not need it if so wherefore state that he is fed at the word of experts surely that is self-
Bit by a mad dog, he may not give him to eat the lobe of its liver, but Armathia Beharis permits it. Furthermore, did Armathia Beharis say if one has pain in his throat, he may pour medicine into his mouth on the Sabbath because it is a possibility of danger to human life, and every danger to human life suspends the laws of the Sabbath if debris fall on someone, and it is doubtful whether or not he is there, or whether he is alive or dead, or whether he be an Israelite, or even one should open. Even on Sabbath, the heap of debris for his sake, if one finds him alive, one should remove the debris, and if he be dead, one should leave him there until the Sabbath day is over. Gemara, our rabbis taught, how did they know that his eyes are enlightened again when he distinguishes between good and bad food? Have they said in the taste thereof, our rabbis taught, if one was seized by ravenous hunger, one feeds him with the less forbidden things first, as between people untied food and carry in one. Should feed him carrion first between Tebal and fruit of the seventh year. One should give him the fruit of the seventh year first as between Terima and Tebal. Tanamar of divided opinion for it was taught one should feed him Tebal but not Terima. Ben Tima holds Terima but not Tebal. Rabbi said if it is possible to feed him with common food there is general agreement that one should prepare it for him and feed him with it. The dispute concerns the case when it is not possible to feed him. With common food one holds that the prohibition of Tebal is more severe. The other assuming that the prohibition of Terima is the more severe. The one holds that the prohibition of eating Tebal is more severe because Terima is permissible to priests. The other holding the prohibition of Terima more severe whereas Tebal may be rendered right by tithing Talmud. Masyuma B if it be possible with common food etc. Surely it is self-evident this refers to the case that it would have to be. Done on the Sabbath, but on the Sabbath too it is self-evident because moving is forbidden only by rabbinic decree. We deal here with a pot without a hole. The obligation on which two is only rabbinic. One holds the prohibition of Tebal is more severe. The other holding the prohibition of Terima more severe. Shall we say that Tanaim have been disputing this matter already? For it was taught if one was bitten by a snake, one may call for him a physician from one place into another or tear open a hen for him or cut leek from the ground for him, give it to him to eat without having separated the tithe thereof. This is the view of Rabbi R. Eliezer, son of Arsimian, said he must not eat until tithe has been separated. Shall we say that it is in accord with R. Eliezer, son of Arsimian, and not with Rabbi? You may even say that it is in accord with Rabbi's view. Rabbi, one may say, makes his statement only here because the tithe of vegetables is in question and that is due but rabbinically, but in the Case of the tithe of corn, which is obligatory by biblical law, even Rabbi would agree that if you permit him to eat without due tithing in the case of a pot without a hole, he would come to eat. Likewise, even in the case of a pot with a hole, our rabbis taught if one was seized with a ravenous hunger, he is given to eat honey and all kinds of sweet things for honey and very sweet food enlighten the eyes of men. And although there is no proof for the matter, there is an intimation in this respect. See, I pray you how my eyes are brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. What does although there is no proof for the matter mean because there no ravenous hunger has seized him? Abay said this applies only after a meal, but before the meal it even increases one's appetite as it is written. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat and they gave him water to drink and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came back to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. Arnam and said in the name of Samuel, if one was seized by ravenous hunger, one should give him to eat a tail with honey. Arhuna, the son of our Joshua, said also pure flour with honey. Our Papa said even barley flour with honey is effective. Our Yohanan said once I was seized by ravenous hunger, whereupon I ran to the eastern side of a fig tree, thus making true in my own case. Wisdom preserveth the life of him who hath it. For our Joseph learned one who would taste the full taste of a fig turns to its eastern side, as it is said. And for the precious things of the fruits of the sun, our Judah and our Jose were walking together when a ravenous hunger seized our Judah. He seized a shepherd and devoured his bread. Our Jose said to him, You have robbed the shepherd as they entered the city. A ravenous hunger seized our Jose. They brought him all sorts of foods and dishes. Whereupon our Judah. Said to him, I may have deprived the shepherd, but you have deprived the whole town. Also, Armair and Arjuda and our Jose were on a journey together. Armair always paid close attention to people's names, whereas Arjuda and our Jose paid no such attention to them. Once as they came to a certain place, they looked for a lodging, and as they were given it, they said to him, The innkeeper, what is your name? He replied, Kidder. Then he Armair said, Therefrom it is evident that he is a wicked man, for it is said for a generation. Key door very forward are there. Arjuda and our Jose entrusted their purses to him. Armair did not entrust his purse to him, but went and placed it on the grave of that man's father. Thereupon the man had a vision in his dream, saying, Go take the purse lying at the head of this man in the morning. He, the innkeeper, told him the rabbis about it, saying, This is what appeared to me in my dream. They replied to him, There is no substance in the dream of the Sabbath night. Armair went waited. There all day and then took the purse with him in the morning. They the rabbi said to him, Give us our purses. He said, There never was such a thing. Armadier then said to them, Why don't you pay attention to people's names? They said, Why have you not told this before, sir? He answered, Consider this but a suspicion. I would not consider that a definite presumption. Thereupon they took him the host into a shop and gave him wine to drink. Then they saw lentils on his mustache. They went to his wife and gave her that as a sign and thus obtained their purses and took them back. Whereupon he went and killed his wife. It is with regard to this that it was taught failure to observe the custom of the first water caused one to eat the meat of pig. Failure to use the second water slew a person at the end. They too paid close attention to people's names and when they called to a house whose owner's name was Bala, they would not enter, saying, He seems to be a wicked man as it is written and said, I have her that was Bala worn out by adulteries if someone was bitten by a mad dog or rabbis taught five things were mentioned in connection with a mad dog its mouth is open its saliva dripping its ears flap its tail is hanging between its thighs it walks on the edge of the road some say also it barks without its voice being heard where does it come from rap said witches are having their fun with it Samuel said an evil spirit rests upon it what is the practical difference between these two views this is the difference Talmud Masuma as to killing it by throwing something at it, it was taught in accordance with Samuel when one kills it one does so only with something thrown against it one against whom it rubs itself is endangered one whom it bites dies one against whom it rubs itself is endangered what is the remedy let him cast off his clothing and run as happened with Arhuna the son of Arjashua against whom one mad dog rubbed itself in the marketplace he stripped off his Garments and ran saying I fulfilled in myself wisdom preserveth the life of him who hath it one whom it bites dies what is the remedy of a said let him take the skin of a male hyena and write upon it I so and so the son of that and that woman write upon the skin of a male hyena hami kanti chloros god god lord of hosts amen amen seal then let him strip off his clothes and bury them in a grave at crossroads for twelve months of a year then he should take them out and burn them in an oven and scatter the ashes during these twelve months if he drinks water he shall not drink it but out of a copper tube lest he see the shadow of a demon and be endangered thus the mother of Abu Martha who is Abu Minyumi made for him a tube of gold for drinking purposes furthermore did Armathia say are Yohanan suffered from scurvy he went to a matron who prepared something for him on Thursday and Friday he said to her how shall I do it on the Sabbath she answered him then you will not need it Anymore he said, but if I should need it, what then she replied, swear unto me by the God of Israel that you will not reveal it to others, whereupon he swore to the God of Israel, I shall not reveal it, she revealed it to him, and he went forth and expounded it in his lecture, but he had sworn to her, he swore to the God of Israel, I shall not reveal it, which implies, but to his people, I shall reveal it, but this is a profanation of the name, it was so that he had explained it, the meaning of his oath to her from the very beginning, what did she give to him, Araha, the son of Aram, I said, the water of leaven, olive oil, and salt, Aryamar said, leaven itself, olive oil, and salt, Arashi said, the fat of a goose wing, I said, El tried everything without achieving a cure for myself until an Arab recommended take the stones of olives which have not become ripe, one third burn them in fire upon a new rake and stick them into the inside of the gums, I did so and was c
Whereas the sages hold these are not considered cures now what does these exclude would you not say these excludes the two latter one and not the first one no it means to exclude the first two ones and not the last one Talmud, Masyuma B come and here for Rabbi B Samuel learned if a woman with child has smelled food one feeds her until she is restored and one who was bitten by a mad dog is given to eat from the lobe of its liver and one who has pains in his mouth may be given medicine on it. Sabbath these are the words of our Eliezer B Jose in the name of our Matthew B Harish but the sages say in this case but not in another now what does in this case refer to what you say to the woman with child that is self-evident for is there anyone to say that in the case of a woman with child it would not be permitted hence it must refer to the medicine this is conclusive our Ashi said our Mishnah to justifies this inference our Matthew B Harish said furthermore if one has pains in his mouth one May give him medicine on the Sabbath and herein the rabbis do not dispute him for if it were that the rabbis dispute him he should teach these together and afterwards mention that the rabbis dispute it this is conclusive evidence because it is a possibility of danger to human life why was it necessary to add and wherever there is danger to human life the laws of the Sabbath are suspended Rab Judah in the name of Rab said not only in the case of a danger to human life on the Sabbath but even in the case of a danger on the following Sabbath how that if e.g. the diagnosis estimates an eight-day crisis the first day of which falls on the Sabbath you might have said let them wait until the evening so that the Sabbaths may not be profaned because of him therefore he informs us that we do not consider that thus also was it taught one may warm water for a sick person on the Sabbath both for the purpose of giving him a drink or of refreshing him and not only for this one Sabbath did they rule thus but also for the following one nor do we say let us wait because perchance he will get well but we warm the water for him immediately because the possibility of danger to human life renders inoperative the laws of the Sabbath not only in case of such possibility on this one Sabbath but also in case of such possibility on another Sabbath nor are these things to be done by Gentiles or minors but by Jewish adults nor do we say in this connection we do not rely in such matters on it. Opinions of women or of Samaritans but we join their opinion to that of others our rabbis taught one must remove the bridge to save a life on the Sabbath and the more eager one is the more praiseworthy is one and one need not obtain permission from the Beth house so if one saw a child falling into the sea he spreads a net and brings it up the faster the better and he need not obtain permission from the Beth though either by catches fish in his net if he saw a child fall into a pit he Breaks loose one segment of the entrenchment and pulls it up the faster the better and he need not obtain permission of the Bethdin even though he is there by making a step stairs if he saw a door closing upon an infant he may break it so as to get the child out the faster the better and he need not obtain permission from the Bethdin though he there by consciously makes chips of wood one may extinguish and isolate the fire in the case of a conflagration the sooner the better and he need not obtain permission from the Bethdin even though he subdues the flames now all these cases must be mentioned separately for if only the case of the infant falling into the sea had been mentioned one would have said it is permitted there because meantime the child might be swept away by the water but that does not apply in the case of its falling into the pit because since it remains stays there and one might have thought one may not save it before obtaining permission therefore it is necessary to refer to that and if the teaching had confined itself to the case of the pit one would have thought there no permission is required because the child is terrified but in the case of a door closing upon it one might sit outside and amuse the child by making a noise with nuts therefore it was necessary to include that too for what purposes is the extinguishing and isolating necessary even for the benefit of another neighboring court our Joseph said on the authority of Rab Judah in the name of Samuel in the case of danger to human life one pays no attention to majority how is that what you say in the case of nine Israelites and one even among them but then the majority consists of Israelites or even if there were half and half in the case of danger to human life we take the more lenient view again if you say that it is a case of nine evens and one Israelite that too is self-evident because it is stationary and whatever is stationary is considered Half and half know it refers to a case in which one has gone off into another court you might have said whosoever has gone off has gone off from the majority which consisted of evens therefore the information that in case of danger to human life we are not concerned with question of majorities which consisted of evens but that is not so for RC said in the name of our Yohanan in the case of nine evens and one Israelite if a building collapsed upon them while they were all in that court one must remove debris but not if a building collapsed in another court this is no contradiction in the one case all had gone off in the other only a few had gone off but could Samuel have said that have we not learned if one finds therein a child abandoned if the majority of the inhabitants are evens it is to be considered even if the majority are Israelites it is to be considered an Israelite in the case of half and half it is to be also considered an Israelite and in Connection there with Rab said this was taught only in relation to sustaining it but not for the purpose of legitimizing it Talmud, Masyuma a Talmud, Masyuma whereas Samuel said it was taught with reference to removing the debris for its sake the words of Samuel refer to the first clause if the majority are heathens it is considered a heathen it is in connection there with that Samuel said that it did not apply to the saving of life if the majority are heathens it is considered a heathen. For what practical law is this taught said our Papa to give it to eat carry and if the majority are Israelites it is considered an Israelite for what practical purpose is this taught to restore to it lost property in the case of half and half it is considered an Israelite for what practical purpose is this taught Rush Lakish said with regard to damages how that shall we say that one ox of ours scored one of his let him bring proof and collect no it is necessary for the case that an ox of his head gored one of ours then he must pay one half and concerning the other he can say prove that I am not an Israelite and collect if the debris had fallen upon someone etc what does he teach here with it states a case of not only not only must one remove the debris in the case of doubt as to whether he is there or not as long as one knows that he is alive if he is there but even though it be doubtful whether he is alive or not he must be freed from the debris also not only if it is doubtful whether he be alive or dead as long as it is definite that he is an Israelite but even if it is doubtful whether he is an Israelite or even one must for his sake remove the debris if one finds him alive one should remove the debris but that is self-evident if one finds him alive no the statement is necessary for the case that he has only a short while to live and if he be dead one should leave him there but that too is self-evident it is necessary because of the teaching of our Judah be. Lakish for it was taught one may not save a dead person out of a fire. Arjuna B. Lakish said I heard that one may save a dead person out of a fire. Now even Arjuna B. Lakish says that only because a person is upset about a dead relative and if you will not permit him to save his dead he will ultimately come to extinguish the fire. But here if you do not permit it what can he do? Our rabbis taught how far does one search until one reaches his nose. Some say up to his heart if one searches and finds those above to be dead one must not assume those below are surely dead. Once it happened that those above were dead and those below were found to be alive. Are we to say that these ten names dispute the same as the following ten names? For it was taught from where does the formation of the embryo commence from its head as it is said. Our he that took me goes out of my mother's womb and it is also said cut off goes thy hair and cast it away. Abbas all said from the navel which sends it. Roots into every direction you may even say that the first view is in agreement with Abyssal inasmuch as Abyssal holds his view only touching the first formation because everything develops from its core middle but regarding the saving of life he would agree that life manifests itself through the nose especially as it is written in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life our Papa said the dispute arises only as to from below upwards but if from above downwards one had searched up to the nose one need not search any further as it is said in whose nostrils was the breath of life our Ishmael our Akiva and our Eliezer B. Ezrai were once on a journey with Levi Hasadar and our Ishmael son of our Eliezer B. Ezrai following them then this question was asked of them once do we know that in the case of danger to human life the laws of the Sabbath are suspended our Ishmael answered and said if a thief be found breaking and now if in the case of this one it is doubtful whether he has Come to take money or life and although the shedding of blood pollutes the land so that the Shechina departs from Israel yet it is lawful to save oneself at the cost of his life how much more may one suspend the laws of the Sabbath to save human life our Akiva answered and said if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor etc thou shalt take him from my altar that he may die i.e. only off the altar
Torah said profane for his sake one Sabbath so that he may keep many Sabbaths. Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, if I had been there, I should have told them something better than what they said. He shall live by them, but he shall not die because of them. Rabbah said the exposition of all of them could be refuted except that of Samuel, which cannot be refuted, that of our Ishmael. Perhaps that is to be taken as Rabbah did for Rabbah said, What is the reason for the permission to kill the burglar? No. Man controls himself when his money is at stake, and since the burglar knows that he, the owner, will oppose him, he thinks if he resists me, I shall kill him. Therefore, the Torah says, If a man has come to kill you, anticipate him by killing him. Hence, we know it only of a certain case, but once would we know it of a doubtful one that of our Akiva is there too, there may be a refutation. Perhaps we should do as Abbe suggests, for Abbe said, We give him a couple of scholars so as to find out whether there is any substance in his words. Again, we know that only in the case of certain death, but once would we know it of a doubtful case, and similarly with the exposition of all of them, we know it only of a certain case. Once do we know of a doubtful case, but of Samuel as to that there is no refutation. Rabban or Arnaman B. Isaac said, Better is one corn of pepper than a whole basket full of pumpkins, mission of the sin offering and the guilt offering for the undoubted commission of. Certain offenses procure atonement, death and the day of atonement procure atonement together with penitence. Penitence procures atonement for lighter transgressions, the transgression of positive commandments and prohibitions in the case of severe transgressions. If penitence suspends the divine punishment until the day of atonement comes to procure atonement, if one says I shall sin and repent, sin and repent, no opportunity will be given to him to repent. If one says I shall sin and the day of atonement will procure atonement for me, the day of atonement procures for him no atonement for transgressions as between man and the omnipresent. The day of atonement procures atonement, but for transgressions as between man and his fellow, the day of atonement does not procure any atonement until he has pacified his fellow. This was expounded by our Elias or Bielaria from all your sins before the Lord shall yet be clean, i.e., for transgressions as between man and the omnipresent, the day of atonement. Procures atonement, but for transgressions as between man and his fellow, the day of atonement does not procure atonement until he has pacified his fellow. Our Akiva said, Happy are you, Israel, who is it before whom you become clean, and who is it that makes you clean your father, which is in heaven, as it is said, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. And it further says, Thou hope of Israel, the Lord, just as the fountain renders clean the unclean, so does the Holy One, blessed be he. Render clean Israel, Gemara, only the undoubted guilt offering atones, but not the suspensive one, but is not the word forgiveness written with regard to it. To these others procure complete atonement, the suspensive guilt offering does not procure complete atonement, or else as for these others, another can affect their atonement, whereas in the case of the suspensive guilt offering, nothing else can affect their atonement, for it was taught if those who were liable to sin offerings were guilt. Offerings for the undoubted commission of offenses permitted the day of atonement to pass, they are still obliged to offer them up, but in the case of those who were liable to suspensive guilt offerings, they are exempt death and the day of atonement procure atonement together with penitence, only together with penitence, but not in themselves shall we say that this teaching is not in accord with Rabbi, for it was taught Rabbi said for all transgressions of commands of the Torah, whether one had repented or not, does the day of atonement procure atonement, except in the case of one who throws off the yoke of the Torah, interprets the Torah unlawfully, or breaks the covenant of Abraham our father. In these cases, if he repented, the day of atonement procures atonement, if not, not you might even say that this is in accord with Rabbi, repentance needs the day of atonement, but the day of atonement does not need repentance, penitence procures atonement for lighter transgressions. The Transgression of positive commandments and prohibitions if it procures atonement for the transgression of negative commandments is it necessary to state that it procures it for the transgression of positive ones Rab Judah said this is what he means it procures atonement for the transgression of a positive commandment of a negative commandment that is to be remedied into a positive one but not for the transgression of an actual negative commandment against this the following contradiction is to be raised these are like transgressions for which penitence procures atonement transgression of positive commandments and negative commandments Talmud Mas Yumae with the exceptions of thou shalt not take in vain thou shalt not take and others of the same kind come and here Rab Judah said for everything from thou shalt not take and down repentance procures atonement for everything from thou shalt take and up penitence procures suspension of punishment and the day of Atonement procures atonement, thou shalt not take and others of the same kind come and here since in connection with horror, penitence and forgiveness are stated one might assume that includes the transgression of thou shalt not take therefore it says he will not clear the guilty then I might have assumed that with all others guilty of having transgressed negative commandments the same is the case therefore the text reads will not clear the guilt of him who taketh his name in vain i.e. he does not clear the guilt in the taking in vain of his name but he clears the guilt in the transgression of other negative commandments this is indeed the point of dispute between Tanam for it was taught for what transgression does penitence procure atonement for that of a positive commandment and in what case does repentance suspend punishment and the day of atonement procure atonement in such as involve extirpation death penalty through the Beth Din and in actual negative commandments it Master said in connection with horror penitence and forgiveness is stated once do we know that because it was taught our Eliezer said it is impossible to say he will not clear the guilt since it says he will clear the guilt nor is it possible to say he will not clear the guilt since it is said he will clear the guilt how is that to be explained he clears the guilt of those who repent and does not clear the guilt of those who do not repent our Matthew B. Harish asked our Eliezer B. Ezra in Rome have you heard about the four kinds of sins concerning which our Ishmael has lectured he answered there are three and with each is repentance connected if one transgressed a positive commandment and repented then he is forgiven before he has moved from his place as it is said return O backsliding Giedron if he has transgressed a prohibition and repented then repentance suspends the punishment and the day of atonement procures atonement as it is said for on this day shall atonement be made for you from all your sins if he has committed a sin to be punished with extirpation or death through the Beth Din and repented then repentance and the day of atonement suspend the punishment thereon and suffering finishes the atonement as it is said then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with strokes but if he has been guilty of the profanation of the name then penitence has no power to suspend punishment nor the day of atonement to procure atonement nor suffering to finish it but all of them together suspend the punishment and only death finishes it as it is said and the Lord of hosts revealed himself in my ears surely this iniquity shall not be expiated by you till you die what constitutes profanation of the name Rab said if e.g. I take me for the butcher and do not pay him at once have said that we have learned to regard as profanation only in a place where one does not go out to collect payment but in a place where one does not go out to collect there is no harm in it not paying at once Rabbin said and Matha Mahaja is a place where one goes out collecting payments to whenever Abbe bought me from two partners he paid money to each of them afterwards bringing them together and squaring accounts with both our Yohan and said in my case it is a profanation if I walk four cubits without uttering words of Torah or wearing tefillin Isaac of the school of Arjane said if one's colleagues are ashamed of his reputation that constitutes a profanation of the name Arnaman B. Isaac commented e.g. if people say may the Lord forgive so and so Abbe explained as it was taught and thou shalt love the Lord thy God i.e. that the name of heaven be beloved because of you if someone studies scripture and mission and attends on the disciples of the wise is honest in business and speaks pleasantly to persons what do people then say concerning him happy the father who taught him Torah happy the teacher who taught him Torah woe unto People who have not studied the Torah for this man has studied the Torah. Look how fine his ways are, how righteous his deeds of him does scripture say. And he said unto me, Thou art my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. But if someone studies scripture and mission attends on the disciples of the wise, but is dishonest in business and discourteous in his relations with people, what do people say about him? Woe unto him who studied the Torah. Woe unto his father who taught him Torah. Woe unto his teacher who taught him Torah. This man studied the Torah. Look how corrupt are his deeds, how ugly his ways of him. Scripture says, And that men said of them, These are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. Arham Abihanan said, Great is penitence, for it brings healing to the world. As it is said, I will heal their backsliding. I will love
Said great is repentance because it brings about redemption as it is said and a redeemer will come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob i.e. why will a redeemer come to Zion because of those that turn from transgression in Jacob Reshlakish said great is repentance for because of it premeditated sins are accounted as errors as it is said return O Israel unto the Lord thy God for thou hast stumbled in thy iniquity iniquity is premeditated and yet he calls it stumbling but that is not so for Reshlakish said that repentance is so great that premeditated sins are accounted as though they were merits as it is said and when the wicked turneth from his wickedness and doth that which is lawful and right he shall live thereby that is no contradiction one refers to a case of repentance derived from love the other to one due to fear our Samuel Binaman he said in the name of our Jonathan great is repentance because it prolongs the days and years of men as it is said and when the wicked turneth from his wickedness, he shall live there by our Isaac said in the West Palestine. They said in the name of Rabbi Bimari, come and see how different from the character of one of flesh and blood is the action of the Holy One. Blessed be he as to the character of one of flesh and blood. If one angers his fellow, it is doubtful whether he the latter will be pacified or not by him. And even if he would say he can be pacified, it is doubtful whether he will be pacified by mere words. But with the Holy One, blessed be he if a man commits a sin in secret, he is pacified by mere words. As it is said, take with you words and return unto the Lord. Still more, he even accounts it to him as a good deed. As it is said, and accept that which is good. Still more, Scripture accounts it to him as if he had offered up bullocks. As it is said, so will we render for bullocks the offerings of our lips. Perhaps you will say the reference is to obligatory bullocks. Therefore, it is said, I will. Heal their backsliding, I will love them freely. It was taught our mayor used to say, Great is repentance, for on account of an individual who repents, the sins of all the world are forgiven. As it is said, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. From them it is not said, but from him, how is one proved the repentant sinner? Rab Judah said, If the object which caused his original transgression comes before him on two occasions and he keeps away from it, Rab Judah indicated with the same woman at the same time in the same place, Rab Judah said, Rab pointed out the following contradictions. It is written, Happy is he whose transgression is covered, whose sin is pardoned, and it is also written, He that covereth his transgression shall not prosper. This is no difficulty. One speaks of sins that have become known to the public, the other of such as did not become known. Arzitra Bitopia in the name of Arnaman said, Here we speak of sins committed by a man. Against his fellow there of sins committed by man against the omnipresent it was taught our Jose B. Judah said if a man commits a transgression the first, second, and third time he is forgiven, the fourth time he is not forgiven, as it is said, thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Israel, yet for four I will not reverse it. And furthermore, it says, Lo, all these things does God work twice yet thrice with a man. What does furthermore serve for one might have assumed that applies only to a community, but not to an individual. Therefore, come and hear the additional verse, Lo, all these things does God work twice yet thrice with a man or rabbis taught as for the sins which one has confessed on one day of atonement, he should not confess them on another day of atonement, but if he repeated them, then he should confess them on another day of atonement, and if he had not committed them again, yet confess them again, then it is with regard to him that scripture says as a dog that returneth. To his vomit, so is a fool that repeat his folly. Our Eliezer B. Jacob said, He is the more praiseworthy as it is said, For I know my transgressions and my sin is even before me. How then do I explain as a dog that returneth to his vomit, etc.? In accord with Arhuna, for Arhuna said, Once a man has committed a sin once and twice, it is permitted to him. Permitted, how could that occur to you? Rather, it appears to him as if it were permitted. It is obligatory to confess the sin in detail explicitly as it is said, This people have sinned a great sin and have made them a god of gold. These are the words of Arjuna B. Baba. Our Akiba said, This is not necessary as it is said, Happy is he whose transgression is covered, whose sin is pardoned. And why did Moses say, And have made them a god of gold? That is to be explained in accord with Arjuna. For Arjuna said, Moses said, Before the Holy One, Blessed be he the silver and gold which thou hast increased unto Israel until they said, Enough has caused them. To make gold and God's two good administrators arose unto Israel Moses and David Moses begged let my sin be written down as it is said because ye believe not in me to sanctify me David begged that his sin be not written down as it is said happy is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is pardoned this case of Moses and Aaron may be compared to the case of two women who received in court the punishment of stripes one had committed an indecent act the other had eaten the unripe figs of it. Seventh year whereupon the woman who had eaten unripe figs of the seventh year said I beg of you make known for what offense I have been punished with stripes lest people say the one woman was punished for the same sin that the other was punished for they brought unripe fruits of the seventh year and hanged them on her neck and they were calling out before her this woman was punished with stripes because she ate the unripe figs of the seventh year one should expose hypocrites to prevent it. Profanation of the name as it is said again when a righteous man doth turn from righteousness and commit iniquity I will lay a stumbling block before him the repentance of the confirmed sinner delays punishment even though the decree of punishment for him had been signed already the careless ease of the wicked ends in calamity power buries those who willed it naked did man come into the world naked he leaves it with that his coming forth be like his coming in whenever Rab went to the court he used to say thus out of his own will he goes towards death the wishes of his household he is unable to fulfill for he returns empty to his home with that the coming forth be like the going in whenever Rabba went to the court he used to say thus Talmud Masuma out of his own will he goes towards death the wishes of his household he is unable to fulfill for he returned empty to his house with that the coming forth be like the going in and when he saw a crowd escorting him he would say Though his excellency mount up to heaven and his head reach unto the clouds, yet shall he perish forever like his own dung. They that have seen him shall say, Where is he when Arzitra was carried shoulder high on the Sabbath before the pilgrimage festivals? He would say, For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure unto all generations. It is not good to respect the person of the wicked. It is not good for the wicked that they are being favored by the Holy One. Blessed be he in this world. It was not good for Ahab that he was favored in this world, as it is said, because he humbled himself before me. I will not bring the evil in his day so as to turn aside the righteous in judgment. It is good for the righteous that they are not favored in this world. It was good for Moses that he was not favored in this world, as it is said, because he believed not in me to sanctify me, etc. But had you believed in me, your time to depart this world would not yet have come happy. Are the righteous not? Only do they acquire merit, but they bestow merit upon their children and children's children to the end of all generations. For Aaron had several sons who deserved to be burnt like Nadab and Abihu, as it is said that were left. But the merit of their father helped them woe unto the wicked, not alone that they render themselves guilty, but they bestow guilt upon their children and children's children unto the end of all generations. Many sons did Canaan have who were worthy to be ordained like Tabi, the slave of Argamaliel, but the guilt of their ancestor caused them to lose their chance. Whosoever causes a community to do good, no sin will come through him, and whosoever causes the community to sin, no opportunity will be granted him to become repentant. Whosoever causes a community to do good, no sin will come through him, while lest he be in Gehinnom and his disciples in Gan Eden paradise, as it is said, for thou wilt not abandon my soul to the nether world, neither wilt thou suffer thy godly. One to see the pit and whosoever causes the community to sin no opportunity will be granted him for repentance lest he be in Gan Eden and his disciples in Gehinnom as it is said a man that is laden with the blood of any person shall hasten his steps unto the pit none will help him if one says I shall sin and repent sin and repent why is it necessary to state I shall sin and I shall repent twice that is in accord with what Arhuna said in the name of Rab for Arhuna said in the name of Rab once a man has committed a transgression once or twice it becomes permitted to him permitted how could that come into your mind rather it appears to him like something permitted I shall sin and the day of atonement shall procure atonement then the day of atonement does not procure atonement shall we say that our mission is not in accord with Rabbi for Rabbi said it was taught for all transgressions of biblical commandments whether he repented or not whether positive or negative does the day of Atonement procure atonement you may even say it will be in agreement with Rabbi it is different when he relies on it for transgressions committed by man against the omnipresent
And it profited me not our Jose Bihanna said one who asks pardon of his neighbor need do so no more than three times as it is said forgive I pray thee now and now we pray thee and if he against whom he had sinned had died he should bring ten persons and make them stand by his grave and say I have sinned against the Lord the God of Israel and against this one whom I have our Abba had a complaint against our Jeremiah here Jeremiah went and sat down at the door of our Abba and as a maid poured out water some drops fell upon his head and he said they have made a dung heap of me and he cited this passage about himself he raised up the poor out of the dust our Abba heard that and came out towards him saying now I must come forth to appease you as it is written go humble thyself and urge thy neighbor when our Zerah had any complaint against any man he would repeatedly pass by him showing himself to him so that he may come forth to pacify him Rab once had a complaint against a Certain butcher and when on the eve of the day of atonement he the butcher did not come to him he said El shall go to him to pacify him or who met him and asked whither are you going sir he said to pacify so and so he thought Abba is about to cause one's death he went there and remained standing before him the butcher who was sitting and chopping an animal's head he raised his eyes and saw him Rab and said you are Abba go away I will have nothing to do with you whilst he was chopping. The head of bone flew off struck his throat and killed him once Rab was expounding portions of the Bible before rabbis and there entered Talmud. Mas Yuma Bihar high whereupon Rab started again from the beginning as Barkabar entered he started again from the beginning as Arsimian the son of Rabbi entered he started again from the beginning but when Arhanna Bihama entered he said so often shall I go back and he did not go over it again Arhanna took that amidst Rab went to him on thirteen eves. Of the day of atonement, but he would not be pacified. But how could he do so? Did not our Jose be Hannah say one who asks pardon of his neighbor need not do so more than three times? It is different with Rab. But how could our Hannah act so unforgivingly? Had not Rabba said that if one passes over his rights, all his transgressions are passed over forgiven. Rather, our Hannah had seen in a dream that Rab was being hanged on a palm tree, and since the tradition is that one who in a dream is hanged on a palm tree will become head of an academy, he concluded that authority will be given to him, and so he would not be pacified to the end that he departed to teach Torah in Babylon. Our rabbis taught the obligation of confession of sins comes on the eve of the day of atonement as it grows dark. But the sages said, Let one confess before one has eaten and drunk, lest one become upset in the course of the meal. And although one has confessed before eating and drinking, he should confess again after having. Eaten and drunk because perchance some wrong has happened in the course of the meal, and although he has confessed during the evening prayer, he should confess again during the morning prayer, and although he has confessed during the morning prayer, he should do so again during the muse of additional prayer, and although he had confessed during the muse of he should do so again during the afternoon prayer, and although he had done so in the afternoon prayer, he should confess again in the any isla. Concluding prayer, and when shall he say the confession? The individual after his amateur prayer, the public reader in the middle thereof, what is it? The confession, Rab said, Thou knowest the secrets of eternity. Samuel said, From the depths of the heart, Levi said, And in thy Torah it is said, Are Yohanan said, Lord of the universe, etc. Rab Judah, our iniquities are too many to count, and our sins too numerous to be counted. Our Hamnana said, My God, before I was formed, I was of no worth, and now that I have been formed it is as if I had not been formed I am dust in my life how much more in my death behold I am before thee like a vessel full of shame and reproach may it be thy will that I sin no more and what I have sinned wipe away in thy mercy but not through suffering that was the confession of sins used by Rab all the year round and by our Hamnana the younger on the day of atonement Marzitra said all that is necessary only when he did not say truly we have sinned but if he had said truly we have sinned no more is necessary for Barhamjad I said once I stood before Samuel who was sitting and when the public reader came up and said truly we have sinned he rose hence he inferred that this was the main confession we learned elsewhere on three occasions of the year the priests raised their hands in benediction four times during the day at the morning prayer at Musaf at Minha afternoon prayer and at the closing of the temple gates was on fast days at the Mahomet and on the day of atonement what is the prayer at the closing of the temple gates rap said an extra prayer samuel said who are we what is our life etc the following objection was raised on the evening of the day of atonement one reads seven benedictions and then makes a confession in the morning prayer one reads seven benedictions and makes confession at music one reads the seven benedictions and makes confession at minha one reads the seven benedictions and makes confession and at any other one reads the seven benedictions and makes confession and further was it taught on the day of atonement as it becomes dark one reads the seven benedictions and makes confession and concludes with the confession that is the view of our mayor whereas the sages say he should read the seven benedictions and if he wishes to conclude with the confession he may do so that would be a refutation of samuel it is a refutation will be rap came down to the reader's desk before Robert commencing the any isle of prayer with thou hast chosen us and concluding with what are we what is our life and he praised him or who not be Nathan said the individual should say it after his prayer Rab said the concluding prayer exempts from evening prayer to follow Rab goes according to his idea that it is all extra prayer and since one has said it already at dusk it is not required anymore but did Rab say so did not Rab say the holochot is according to the view that the evening prayer is not obligatory he said this on the view that it is obligatory an objection was raised on the evening of the day of atonement he should read seven benedictions and make confession in the morning also seven and make confession at music also seven and make confession at mana also seven and make confession at any isle also seven and make confession at the evening prayer he read seven benedictions the seventh consisting of the substance of the eighteen benedictions are Hanabi Gamaliel said in the name of his Ancestors one must read the complete prayer of 18 benedictions Talmud, Mas Yuma, because one must make mention of Havdalah in the benediction commencing with Thou favorest that is a dispute of ten aim for it was taught in the very that all those obliged to immerse themselves may do so in their usual manner on the day of atonement the menstruating woman and the woman after childbirth immerse themselves in their usual manner on the evening of the day of atonement one who had a pollution may do so until the afternoon prayer our Jose said he may do so throughout the day but the following contradiction is to be pointed out a man or woman afflicted with gonorrhea or with leprosy one who had had intercourse with a menstruant or one rendered unclean by contact with a dead person may immerse themselves in their usual manner on the day of atonement a menstruating woman and a woman after childbirth may immerse themselves in their usual manner on the night before the day of atonement one who had experienced the pollution may immerse himself throughout the day our Jose said from the Minha onwards he may not immerse himself this is no difficulty the one refers to the case that he had read the any isle prayer the other that he had not read the any isle if he had prayed what is the reason for the view of the rabbis the rabbis hold it is obligatory to take the ritual bath at the proper times this implies that our Jose would not hold this not to be obligatory but surely it was taught if he has had the name of God inscribed on his body he must not bathe nor anoint himself nor stand in an unclean place if it happens that he is obliged to immerse himself he should tie some reed around go down and immerse himself our Jose said he may go down and immerse himself in the usual manner provided he does not rub it off and we know that they are disputing the principle as to whether it is obligatory to take the ritual bath at its definite time the ten of that former is our Jose B. Judah for it was taught our Jose B. Judah said the one immersion at the end suffices for her our rabbis taught one who experiences evolution on the day of atonement should go down and immerse himself and in the evening he should rub himself off properly in the evening what is passed it is it not passed rather say he should rub himself off on the eve before he holds it is obligatory to rub oneself off a tan or recited before our nomin to one who experienced evolution on the day of atonement. All sins will be forgiven but it was taught all his sins will be arranged before him what does arranged mean arranged to be forgiven in the school of our Ishmael it was taught one who experienced a night dash pollution on the day of atonement let him be anxious throughout the year and if he survives the year he is assured of being a child of the world to come our nomin B. Isaac said you may know it from the fact that all the world is hungry and he is satisfied when our Dimi came he said he will live long thrive and beget many children.